This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, by Edward Gibbon. Preface of the Author. It is not my intention to detain the reader by expatiating on the variety or the importance of the subject, which I have undertaken to treat, since the merit of the choice would serve to render the weakness of the execution still more apparent and still less excusable. But as I have presumed to lay before the public a first volume only of the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, it will perhaps be expected that I should explain, in a few words, the nature and limits of my general plan. The memorable series of revolutions, which in the course of about thirteen centuries gradually undermined, and at length destroyed, the solid fabric of human greatness, may with some propriety be divided into the three following periods. The first of these periods may be traced from the age of Trajan and the Antonines, when the Roman monarchy, having attained its full strength and maturity, began to verge toward its decline and will extend to the subversion of the Western Empire by the barbarians of Germany and Scythia, the rude ancestors of the most polished nations of modern Europe. This extraordinary revolution, which subjected Rome to the power of a Gothic conqueror, was completed about the beginning of the sixth century. The second period of the decline and fall of Rome may be supposed to commence with the reign of Justinian, who by his laws as well as by his victories restored a transient splendor to the Eastern Empire. It will comprehend the invasion of Italy by the Lombards, the conquest of the Asiatic and African provinces by the Arabs, who embraced the religion of Mohammed, the revolt of the Roman people against the feeble princes of Constantinople, and the elevation of Charlemagne, who in the year 800 established the second, or German, empire of the West. The last and longest of these periods includes about six centuries and a half, from the revival of the Western Empire till the taking of Constantinople by the Turks, and the extinction of a degenerate race of princes, who continued to assume the titles of Caesar and Augustus after their dominions were contracted to the limits of a single city, in which the language as well as manners of the ancient Romans had been long since forgotten. The writer who should undertake to relate the events of this period would find himself obliged to enter into the general history of the Crusades, as far as they contributed to the ruin of the Greek Empire, and he would scarcely be able to restrain his curiosity from making some enquiry into the state of the city of Rome, during the darkness and confusion of the Middle Ages. As I have ventured, perhaps too hastily, to commit to the press a work which, in every sense of the word, deserves the epithet of imperfect. I consider myself as contracting an engagement to finish, most probably in a second volume, the first of these memorable periods, and to deliver to the public the complete history of the decline and fall of Rome, from the age of the Antonines to the subversion of the Western Empire. With regard to the subsequent periods, though I may entertain some hopes, I dare not presume to give any assurances. The execution of the extensive plan which I have described would connect the ancient and modern history of the world but it would require many years of health, of leisure, and of perseverance. Bentnick Street, February 1, 1776 Edition The entire history, which is now published, of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in the West, abundantly discharges my engagements with the public. Perhaps their favorable opinion may encourage me to prosecute a work which, however laborious it may seem, is the most agreeable occupation of my leisure hours. Bentnick Street, March 1st, 1781 Addition An author easily persuades himself that the public opinion is still favorable to his labors, and I have now embraced the serious resolution of proceeding to the last period of my original design, and of the Roman Empire, the taking of Constantinople by the Turks, in the year 1453. The most patient reader, who computes that three ponderous volumes have already been employed on the events of four centuries, may perhaps be alarmed at the long prospect of nine hundred years. But it is not my intention to expatiate with the same minuteness on the whole series of the Byzantine history. 
At our entrance into this period, the reign of Justinian, and the conquests of the Mohammedans will deserve and detain our attention, and the last age of Constantinople, the Crusades and Turks, is connected with the revolutions of modern Europe. From the seventh to the eleventh century, the obscure interval will be supplied by a concise narrative of such facts as may still appear either interesting or important. Betnick Street, March 1st, 1782 Preface to the First Volume Diligence and accuracy are the only merits to which an historical writer may ascribe to himself, if any merit indeed can be assumed from the performance of an indispensable duty. I may therefore be allowed to say that I have carefully examined all the original materials that could illustrate the subject which I had undertaken to treat. Should I ever complete the extensive design which has been sketched out in the preface, I might perhaps conclude it with a critical account of the authors consulted during the progress of the whole work, and however such an attempt might incur the censure of ostentation, I am persuaded that it would be susceptible of entertainment, as well as information. At present I shall content myself with a single observation. The biographers who, under the reigns of Diocletian and Constantine, composed, or rather compiled, the lives of the emperors, from Hadrian to the sons of Carus, are usually mentioned under the names of Aelius Spartianus, Julius Capitolinus, Aelius Lampridius, Volcatius Gallicanus, Trebilius Polio, and Flavius Vopiscus. But there is so much perplexity in the titles of the manuscripts, and so many disputes that have arisen among the critics concerning their number, their names, and their respective property, that for the most part I have quoted them without distinction, under the general and well-known title of the Augustan History. Preface to the fourth volume of the original quarto edition. I now discharge my promise, and complete my design, of writing the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, both in the West and in the East. The whole period extends from the age of Trajan and the Antonines to the taking of Constantinople by Mohammed the Second, and includes a review of the Crusades and the state of Rome during the Middle Ages. Since the publication of my first volume, twelve years have elapsed, twelve years, according to my wish, of health, of leisure, and of perseverance. I may now congratulate my deliverance from a long and laborious service, and my satisfaction will be pure and perfect if the public favour should be extended to the conclusion of my work. It was my first intention to have collected, under one view, the numerous authors of every age and language from whom I have derived the materials of this history, and I am still convinced that the apparent ostentation would be more than compensated by real use. If I have renounced this idea, if I have declined an undertaking which had obtained the approbation of a master artist, my excuse may be found in the extreme difficulty of assigning a proper measure to such a catalogue. A naked list of names and editions would not be satisfactory either to myself or my readers. The characters of the principal authors of the Roman and Byzantine history have been occasionally connected with the events which they describe. A more copious and critical enquiry might indeed deserve, but it would demand, an elaborate volume which might swell by degrees into a general library of historical writers. For the present, I shall content myself with renewing my serious protestation that I have always endeavoured to draw from my fountain-head, that my curiosity, as well as a sense of duty, has always urged me to study the originals, and that if they have sometimes eluded my search, I have carefully marked the secondary evidence, on whose faith a passage or fact were reduced to depend. I shall soon revisit the banks of the Lake of Lausanne, a country which I have known and loved from my early youth, under a mild government, amidst a beauteous landscape, in a life of leisure and independence, and among a people of easy and elegant manners, I have enjoyed, and may again hope to enjoy, the varied pleasures of retirement and society. But I shall ever glory in the name and character of an Englishman. I am proud of my birth in a free and enlightened country and the approbation of that country is the best and most honourable reward of my labours. Were I ambitious of any other patron than the public, I would inscribe this work to a statesman, who in a long, a stormy, and at length an unfortunate administration, had many political opponents, almost without a personal enemy, who has retained in his fall from power many faithful and disinterested friends, and who under the pressure of severe infirmity enjoys the lively vigour of his mind, and the felicity of his incomparable temper. 
Lord North will permit me to express the feelings of friendship in the language of truth, but even truth and friendship should be silent if he is still dispensed the favours of the crown. In a remote solitude— Vanity may still whisper in my ear that my readers, perhaps, may inquire whether, in the conclusion of the present work, I am now taking an everlasting farewell. They shall hear all that I know myself, and all that I could reveal to the most intimate friend. The motives of action or silence are now equally balanced, nor can I pronounce in my most secret thoughts on which side the scale will preponderate. I cannot dissemble that six quartos must have tried, and may have exhausted, the indulgence of the public, that in the repetition of similar attempts a successful author has much more to lose than he can hope to gain, that I am now descending into the vale of years, and that the most respectable of my countrymen, the men whom I aspire to imitate, have resigned the pen of history about the same period of their lives. Yet I consider that the annals of ancient and modern times may afford many rich and interesting subjects that I am still possessed of health and leisure, that by the practice of writing some skill and facility must be acquired, and that in the ardent pursuit of truth and knowledge I am not conscious of decay. To an active mind, indolence is more painful than labour, and the first months of my liberty will be occupied and amused in the excursions of curiosity and taste. By such temptations I have been sometimes seduced from the rigid duty even of a pleasing and voluntary task, but my time will now be my own, and in the use or abuse of independence I shall no longer fear my own reproaches or those of my friends. I am fairly entitled to a year of jubilee. Next summer and the following winter will rapidly pass away, and experience only can determine whether I shall still prefer the freedom and variety of study to the design and composition of a regular work, which animates while it confines the daily application of the author. Caprice and accident may influence my choice, but the dexterity of self-love will contrive to applaud either active industry or philosophic repose. Downing Street, May 1st, 1788 Addition I shall embrace this opportunity of introducing two verbal remarks, which have not conveniently offered themselves to my notice. 1. As often as I use the definitions of beyond the Alps, the Rhine, the Danube, etc., and generally suppose myself at Rome, and afterwards at Constantinople, without observing whether this relative geography may agree with the local, but variable, situation of the reader or the historian. 2. In proper names of foreign, and especially of oriental origin, it should always be our aim to express in our English version a faithful copy of the original. But this rule, which is founded on a just regard to uniformity and truth, must often be relaxed, and the exceptions will be limited or enlarged by the custom of the language and the taste of the interpreter. Our alphabets may often be defective. A harsh sound, an uncouth spelling, might offend the ear or eye of our countrymen. And some words, notoriously corrupt, are fixed, as it were, naturalized in the vulgar tongue. The Prophet Mohammed can no longer be stripped of the famous, though improper, appellation of Mahomet. The well-known cities of Aleppo, Damascus, and Cairo would be almost lost in the strange descriptions of Haleb, Damashk, and Al-Kahira. The titles and offices of the Ottoman Empire are fashioned by the practice of three hundred years, and we are pleased to blend the three Chinese monosyllables, Confuci, in the respectable name of Confucius, or even to adopt the Persian corruption of Mandarin. But I would vary the use of Zoroaster and Sertusht, as I drew my information from Greece or Persia, since our connection with India, the genuine Timur, is restored to the throne of Tamerlane. Our most correct writers have retrenched the Al, the superfluous article from the Koran, and we escape an ambiguous termination by adopting Moslem instead of Musulman, in the plural number. In these, and in a thousand examples, the shades of distinction are often minute, and I can feel where I cannot explain— the motives of my choice. End of the prefaces. Chapter One, Part One of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Chapman The History of the Decline and Fall 
of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 1. The Extent of the Empire in the Age of the Antonines. Part 1. Introduction. The Extent and Military Force of the Empire in the Age of the Antonines. In the second century of the Christian era, the empire of Rome comprehended the fairest part of the earth and the most civilized portion of mankind. The frontiers of that extensive monarchy were guarded by ancient renown and disciplined valor. The gentle but powerful influence of laws and manners had gradually cemented the union of the provinces. Their peaceful inhabitants enjoyed and abused the advantages of wealth and luxury. The image of a free constitution was preserved with decent reverence. The Roman Senate appeared to possess the sovereign authority and devolved on the emperors all the executive powers of government. During a happy period of more than fourscore years, the public administration was conducted by the virtue and abilities of Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and the two Antonines. It is the design of this, and of the two succeeding chapters, to describe the prosperous condition of their empire, and afterwards from the death of Marcus Antoninus to deduce the most important circumstances of its decline and fall, a revolution which will ever be remembered and is still felt by the nations of the earth. The principal conquests of the Romans were achieved under the Republic, and the emperors, for the most part, were satisfied with preserving those dominions which had been acquired by the policy of the Senate, the active emulations of the consuls, and the martial enthusiasm of the people. The seven first centuries were filled with a rapid succession of triumphs, but it was reserved for Augustus to relinquish the ambitious design of subduing the whole earth, and to introduce a spirit of moderation into the public councils. Inclined to peace by his temper and situation, it was easy for him to discover that Rome, in her present exalted situation, had much less to hope than to fear from the chance of arms, and that in the prosecution of remote wars, the undertaking became every day more difficult, the event more doubtful, and the possession more precarious and less beneficial. The experience of Augustus added weight to these salutary reflections, and eventually convinced him that by the prudent vigour of his counsels, it would be easy to secure every concession which the safety or the dignity of Rome might require from the most formidable barbarians. Instead of exposing his person and his legions to the arrows of the Parthians, he obtained, by an honourable treaty, the restitution of the standards and prisoners which had been taken in the defeat of Crassus. His generals, in the early part of his reign, attempted the reduction of Ethiopia and Arabia Felix. They marched near a thousand miles to the south of the tropic, but the heat of the climate soon repelled the invaders and protected the unwarlike natives of those sequestered regions. The northern countries of Europe scarcely deserved the expense and labor of conquest. The forests and morasses of Germany were filled with a hardy race of barbarians who despised life when it was separated from freedom, and though on the first attack they seemed to yield to the weight of the Roman power, they soon, by a signal act of despair, regained their independence, and reminded Augustus of the vicissitude of fortune. On the death of that emperor, his testament was publicly read in the Senate. He bequeathed, as a valuable legacy to his successors, the advice of confining the empire within those limits which nature seemed to have placed as its permanent bulwarks and boundaries. On the west, the Atlantic Ocean, the Rhine and Danube on the north, 
the Euphrates on the east, and towards the south, the sandy deserts of Arabia and Africa. Happily for the repose of mankind, the moderate system recommended by the wisdom of Augustus was adopted by the fears and vices of his immediate successors. Engaged in the pursuit of pleasure, or in the exercise of tyranny, the first Caesars seldom showed themselves to the armies or to the provinces, nor were they disposed to suffer that those triumphs which their indolence neglected should be usurped by the conduct and valour of their lieutenants. The military fame of a subject was considered as an insolent invasion of the imperial prerogative, and it became the duty, as well as interest, of every Roman general to guard the frontiers entrusted to his care without aspiring to conquests which might have proved no less fatal to himself than to the vanquished barbarians. The only accession which the Roman Empire received during the first century of the Christian era was the province of Britain. In this single instance, the successors of Caesar and Augustus were persuaded to follow the example of the former rather than the precept of the latter. The proximity of its situation to the coast of Gaul seemed to invite their arms. The pleasing though doubtful intelligence of a pearl fishery attracted their avarice, and as Britain was viewed in the light of a distinct and insulated world, the conquest scarcely formed any exception to the general system of continental measures. After a war of about forty years, undertaken by the most stupid, maintained by the most dissolute, and terminated by the most timid of all the emperors, the far greater part of the island submitted to the Roman yoke. The various tribes of Britain possessed valour without conduct, and the love of freedom without the spirit of union. They took up arms with savage fierceness. They laid them down, or turned them against each other, with wild inconsistency, and while they fought singly, they were successively subdued. Neither the fortitude of Caractacus, nor the despair of Boadicea, nor the fanaticism of the Druids, could avert the slavery of their country, or resist the steady progress of the imperial generals who maintained the national glory when the throne was disgraced by the weakest or the most vicious of mankind. At the very time when Domitian, confined to his palace, felt the terrors which he inspired, his legions under the command of the virtuous Agricola defeated the collected force of the Caledonians at the foot of the Grampian hills, and his fleets, venturing to explore an unknown and dangerous navigation, displayed the Roman arms round every part of the island. The conquest of Britain was considered as already achieved, and it was the design of Agricola to complete and ensure his success by the easy reduction of Ireland, for which, in his opinion, one legion and a few auxiliaries were sufficient the western isle might be improved into a valuable possession, and the Britons would wear their chains with the less reluctance, if the prospect and example of freedom were, on every side, removed from before their eyes. But the superior merit of Agricola soon occasioned his removal from the government of Britain, and forever disappointed this rational, though extensive, scheme of conquest. Before his departure, the prudent general had provided for security as well as for dominion. He had observed that the island is almost divided into two unequal parts by the opposite gulfs, or, as they are now called, the Firths of Scotland. Across the narrow interval of about forty miles, he had drawn a line of military stations, which was afterwards fortified in the reign of Antoninus Pius, by a turf rampart erected on foundations of stone. This wall of Antoninus, 
at a small distance beyond the modern cities of Edinburgh and Glasgow, was fixed as the limit of the Roman province. The native Caledonians preserved, in the northern extremity of the island, their wild independence, for which they were not less indebted to their poverty than to their valour. Their incursions were frequently repelled and chastised, but their country was never subdued. The masters of the fairest and most wealthy climates of the globe turned with contempt from gloomy hills assailed by the winter tempest, from lakes concealed in a blue mist, and from cold and lonely heaths, over which the deer of the forest were chased by a troop of naked barbarians. Such was the state of the Roman frontiers, and such the maxims of imperial policy, from the death of Augustus to the accession of Trajan. That virtuous and active prince had received the education of a soldier, and possessed the talents of a general. The peaceful system of his predecessors was interrupted by scenes of war and conquest, and the legions, after a long interval, beheld a military emperor at their head. The first exploits of Trajan were against the Dacians, the most warlike of men, who dwelt beyond the Danube, and who, during the reign of Domitian, had insulted with impunity the majesty of Rome. To the strength and fierceness of barbarians they added a contempt for life, which was derived from a warm persuasion of the immortality and transmigration of the soul. Decebalus, the Dacian king, approved himself a rival not unworthy of Trajan, nor did he despair of his own and the public fortune, till, by the confession of his enemies, he had exhausted every resource both of valour and policy. This memorable war, with a very short suspension of hostilities, lasted five years, and as the emperor could exert without control the whole force of the state, it was terminated by an absolute submission of the barbarians. The new province of Dacia, which formed a second exception to the precept of Augustus, was about thirteen hundred miles in circumference. Its natural boundaries were the Niester, the Tais or Tabiscus, the Lower Danube, and the Euxine Sea. The vestiges of a military road may still be traced from the banks of the Danube to the neighbourhood of Bender, a place famous in modern history, and the actual frontier of the Turkish and Russian empires. Trajan was ambitious of fame, and as long as mankind shall continue to bestow more liberal applause on their destroyers than on their benefactors, the thirst of military glory will ever be the vice of the most exalted characters. The praises of Alexander, transmitted by a succession of poets and historians, had kindled a dangerous emulation in the mind of Trajan. Like him, the Roman emperor undertook an expedition against the nations of the East, but he lamented with a sigh that his advanced age scarcely left him any hopes of equalling the renown of the son of Philip. Yet the success of Trajan, however transient, was rapid and specious. The degenerate Parthians, broken by intestine discord, fled before his arms. He descended the river Tigris in triumph from the mountains of Armenia to the Persian Gulf. He enjoyed the honour of being the first, as he was the last, of the Roman generals who ever navigated that remote sea. His fleets ravaged the coast of Arabia, and Trajan vainly flattered himself that he was approaching towards the confines of India. Every day the astonished Senate received the intelligence of new names and new nations that acknowledged his sway. They were informed that the kings of Bosphorus, Colchos, Iberia, Albania, Osroene, and even the Parthian monarch himself 
had accepted their diadems from the hands of the emperor, that the independent tribes of the Median and Cardusian hills had implored his protection, and that the rich countries of Armenia, Mesopotamia, and Assyria were reduced into the state of provinces. But the death of Trajan soon clouded the splendid prospect, and it was justly to be dreaded that so many distant nations would throw off the unaccustomed yoke when they were no longer restrained by the powerful hand which had imposed it. End of chapter 1, part 1《The Extent of the Empire in the Age of the Antonines Part 2 It was an ancient tradition that when the capital was founded by one of the Roman kings, the god Terminus, who presided over boundaries and was represented according to the fashion of that age by a large stone, alone among all the inferior deities, refused to yield his place to Jupiter himself. A favourable inference was drawn from his obstinacy, which was interpreted by the augurs as a sure presage that the boundaries of the Roman power would never recede. During many ages, the prediction, as it is usual, contributed to its own accomplishment. But though Terminus had resisted the majesty of Jupiter, he submitted to the authority of the Emperor Hadrian. The resignation of all the eastern conquests of Trajan was the first measure of his reign. He restored to the Parthians the election of an independent sovereign, withdrew the Roman garrisons from the provinces of Armenia, Mesopotamia, and Assyria, and, in compliance with the precept of Augustus, once more established the Euphrates as the frontier of the empire. Sensia, which arraigns the public actions and the private motives of princes, has ascribed to envy a conduct which might be attributed to the prudence and moderation of Hadrian. The various character of that emperor, capable by turns of the meanest and the most generous sentiments, may afford some colour to the suspicion. It was, however, scarcely in his power to place the superiority of his predecessor in a more conspicuous light than by thus confessing himself unequal to the task of defending the conquests of Trajan. The martial and ambitious of spirit Trajan formed a very singular contrast with the moderation of his successor. The restless activity of Hadrian was not less remarkable when compared with the gentle repose of Antoninus Pius. The life of the former was almost a perpetual journey, and as he possessed the various talents of the soldier, the statesman, and the scholar, he gratified his curiosity in the discharge of his duty. Careless of the difference of seasons and of climates, he marched on foot and bareheaded over the snows of Caledonia and the sultry plains of the upper Egypt. Nor was there a province of the empire which, in the course of his reign, was not honoured with the presence of the monarch. But the tranquil life of Antoninus Pius was spent in the bosom of Italy, and during the twenty-three years that he directed the public administration, the longest journeys of that amiable prince extended no farther than from his palace in Rome to the retirement of his Lanuvian villa. Notwithstanding this difference in their personal conduct, the general system of Augustus was equally adopted and uniformly pursued by Hadrian and by the two Antonines. 
they persisted in the design of maintaining the dignity of the empire without attempting to enlarge its limits. By every honorable expedient, they invited the friendship of the barbarians, and endeavored to convince mankind that the Roman power, raised above the temptation of conquest, was actuated only by the love of order and justice. During a long period of forty-three years, their virtuous labors were crowned with success, and if we accept a few slight hostilities that served to exercise the legions of the frontier, the reigns of Hadrian and Antoninus Pius offer the fair prospect of universal peace. The Roman name was revered among the most remote nations of the earth. The fiercest barbarians frequently submitted their differences to the arbitration of the emperor, and we are informed by a contemporary historian that he had seen ambassadors who were refused the honor which they came to solicit of being admitted into the rank of subjects. The terror of the Roman arms added weight and dignity to the moderation of the emperors. They preserved peace by a constant preparation for war, and while justice regulated their conduct, they announced to the nations on their confines that they were as little disposed to endure as to offer an injury. The military strength, which it had been sufficient for Hadrian and the elder Antoninus to display, was exerted against the Parthians and the Germans by the Emperor Marcus. The hostilities of the barbarians provoked the resentment of that philosophic monarch, and in the prosecution of a just defence, Marcus and his generals obtained many signal victories, both on the Euphrates and on the Danube. The military establishment of the Roman Empire, which thus assured either its tranquillity or success, will now become the proper and important object of our attention. In the purer ages of the Commonwealth, the use of arms was reserved for those ranks of citizens who had a country to love, a property to defend, and some share in enacting those laws which it was their interest as well as duty to maintain. But in proportion, as the public freedom was lost in extent of conquest, war was gradually improved into an art, and degraded into a trade. The legions themselves, even at the time when they were recruited in the most distant provinces, were supposed to consist of Roman citizens. That distinction was generally considered either as a legal qualification or as a proper recompense for the soldier, but a more serious regard was paid to the essential merit of age, strength, and military stature. In all levies, a just preference was given to the climates of the north over those of the south. The race of men born to the exercise of arms was sought for in the country rather than in cities, and it was very reasonably presumed that the hardy occupations of smiths, carpenters, and huntsmen would supply more vigor and resolution than the sedentary trades which were employed in the service of luxury. After every qualification of property had been laid aside, the armies of the Roman emperors were still commanded, for the most part, by officers of liberal birth and education. But the common soldiers, like the mercenary troops of modern Europe, were drawn from the meanest, and very frequently from the most profligate, of mankind. That public virtue, which among the ancients was denominated patriotism, is derived from a strong sense of our own interest in the preservation and prosperity of the free government of which we are members. Such a sentiment, which had rendered the legions of the Republic almost invincible, could make but a very feeble impression on the mercenary servants of a despotic prince, and it became necessary to supply that defect by other motives, of a different but not less forcible nature, honour, and religion. The peasant, or mechanic, 
imbibed the useful prejudice that he was advanced to the more dignified profession of arms, in which his rank and reputation would depend on his own valour, and that, although the prowess of a private soldier must often escape the notice of fame, his own behaviour might sometimes confer glory or disgrace on the company, the legion, or even the army, to whose honours he was associated. On his first entrance into the service, an oath was administered to him with every circumstance of solemnity. He promised never to desert his standard, to submit his own will to the commands of his leaders, and to sacrifice his life for the safety of the emperor and the empire. The attachment of the Roman troops to their standards was inspired by the united influence of religion and of honour. The golden eagle, which glittered in the front of the legion, was the object of their fondest devotion. Nor was it esteemed less impious than it was ignominious to abandon that sacred ensign in the hour of danger. These motives, which derived their strength from the imagination, were enforced by fears and hopes of a more substantial kind. Regular pay, occasional donatives, and a stated recompense after the appointed time of service, alleviated the hardships of the military life, whilst, on the other hand, it was impossible for cowardice or disobedience to escape the severest punishment. The centurions were authorized to chastise with blows, the generals had a right to punish with death, and it was an inflexible maxim of Roman discipline that a good soldier should dread his officers far more than the enemy. From such laudable arts did the valour of the imperial troops receive a degree of firmness and docility unattainable by the impetuous and irregular passions of barbarians. And yet, so sensible were the Romans of the imperfection of valour without skill and practice, that in their language the name of an army was borrowed from the word which signified exercise. Military exercises were the important and unremitted object of their discipline. The recruits and young soldiers were constantly trained, both in the morning and in the evening, nor was age or knowledge allowed to excuse the veterans from the daily repetition of what they had completely learnt. Large sheds were erected in the winter quarters of the troops, that their useful labours might not receive any interruption from the most tempestuous weather, and it was carefully observed that the arms destined to this imitation of war should be of double the weight which was required in real action. It is not the purpose of this work to enter into any minute description of the Roman exercises. We shall only remark that they comprehended whatever could add strength to the body, activity to the limbs, or grace to the motions. The soldiers were diligently instructed to march, to run, to leap, to swim, to carry heavy burdens, to handle every species of arms that was used either for offence or for defence, either in distant engagement or in a closer onset, to form a variety of evolutions, and to move to the sound of flutes in the pyrrhic or martial dance. In the midst of peace, the Roman troops familiarized themselves with the practice of war, and it is prettily remarked by an ancient historian who had fought against them, that the effusion of blood was the only circumstance which distinguished a field of battle from a field of exercise. It was the policy of the ablest generals, and even of the emperors themselves, to encourage these military studies by their presence and example, and we are informed that Hadrian, as well as Trajan, frequently condescended to instruct the unexperienced soldiers, to reward the diligent, and sometimes to dispute with them the prize of superior strength or dexterity. Under the reigns of those princes, 
the science of tactics was cultivated with success, and as long as the empire retained any vigor, their military instructions were respected as the most perfect model of Roman discipline. Nine centuries of war had gradually introduced into the service many alterations and improvements. The legions, as they are described by Polybius in the time of the Punic Wars, differed very materially from those which achieved the victories of Caesar, or defended the monarchy of Hadrian and the Antonines. The constitution of the imperial legion may be described in a few words. The heavily armed infantry, which composed its principal strength, was divided into ten cohorts and fifty-five companies, under the orders of a correspondent number of tribunes and centurions. The first cohort, which always claimed the post of honor and the custody of the eagle, was formed of eleven hundred and five soldiers, the most approved for valor and fidelity. The remaining nine cohorts consisted each of five hundred and fifty-five, and the whole body of legionary infantry amounted to six thousand one hundred men. Their arms were uniform, and admirably adapted to the nature of their service. An open helmet with a lofty crest, a breastplate or coat of mail, greaves on their legs, and an ample buckler on their left arm. The buckler was of an oblong and concave figure, four feet in length and two and a half in breadth, framed of a light wood, covered with a bull's hide, and strongly guarded with plates of brass. Besides a lighter spear, the legionary soldier grasped in his right hand the formidable pilum, a ponderous javelin, whose utmost length was about six feet, and which was terminated by a massy triangular point of steel of eighteen inches. This instrument was indeed much inferior to our modern firearms, since it was exhausted by a single discharge at the distance of only ten or twelve paces. Yet, when it was launched by a firm and skilful hand, there was not any cavalry that durst venture within its reach, nor any shield or corslet that could sustain the impetuosity of its weight. As soon as the Roman had darted his pilum, he drew his sword and rushed forwards to close with the enemy. His sword was a short, well-tempered Spanish blade that carried a double edge, and was alike suited to the purpose of striking or of pushing. But the soldier was always instructed to prefer the latter use of his weapon, as his own body remained less exposed, while he inflicted a more dangerous wound on his adversary. The legion was usually drawn up eight deep, and the regular distance of three feet was left between the files as well as ranks. A body of troops, habituated to preserve this open order in a long front and a rapid charge, found themselves prepared to execute every disposition which the circumstances of war or the skill of their leader might suggest. The soldier possessed a free space for his arms and motions, and sufficient intervals were allowed, through which seasonable reinforcements might be introduced, to the relief of the exhausted combatants. The tactics of the Greeks and Macedonians were formed on very different principles. The strength of the phalanx depended on sixteen ranks of long pikes, wedged together in the closest array, but it was soon discovered by reflection, as well as by the event, that the strength of the phalanx was unable to contend with the activity of the legion. The cavalry, without which the force of the legion would have remained imperfect, was divided into ten troops or squadrons. The first, as the companion of the first cohort, consisted of a hundred and thirty-two men, whilst each of the other nine amounted only to sixty-six. The entire establishment formed a regiment, if we may use the modern expression, of seven hundred and twenty-six horse. 
naturally connected with its respective legion, but occasionally separated to act in the line and to compose a part of the wings of the army. The cavalry of the emperors was no longer composed, like that of the ancient republic, of the noblest youths of Rome and Italy, who, by performing their military service on horseback, prepared themselves for the offices of senator and consul, and solicited by deeds of valour the future suffrages of their countrymen. Since the alteration of manners and government, the most wealthy of the equestrian order were engaged in the administration of justice and of the revenue, and whenever they embraced the profession of arms, they were immediately entrusted with a troop of horse or a cohort of foot. Trajan and Hadrian formed their cavalry from the same provinces, and the same class of their subjects, which recruited the ranks of the legion. The horses were bred for the most part in Spain or Cappadocia. The Roman troopers despised the complete armour with which the cavalry of the east was encumbered. Their more useful arms consisted in a helmet, an oblong shield, light boots, and a coat of mail. A javelin and a long broadsword were their principal weapons of offence. The use of lances and of iron maces they seem to have borrowed from the barbarians. The safety and honour of the empire was principally entrusted to the legions, but the policy of Rome condescended to adopt every useful instrument of war. Considerable levies were regularly made among the provincials, who had not yet deserved the honourable distinction of Romans. Many dependent princes and communities, dispersed round the frontiers, were permitted for a while to hold their freedom and security by the tenure of military service. Even select troops of hostile barbarians were frequently compelled or persuaded to consume their dangerous valour in remote climates and for the benefit of the state. All these were included under the general name of auxiliaries, and howsoever they might vary according to the difference of times and circumstances, their numbers were seldom much inferior to those of the legions themselves. Among the auxiliaries, the bravest and most faithful bands were placed under the command of prefects and centurions, and severely trained in the arts of Roman discipline. But the far greater part retained those arms to which the nature of their country, or their early habits of life, more peculiarly adapted them. By this institution, each legion, to whom a certain proportion of auxiliaries was allotted, contained within itself every species of lighter troops and of missile weapons, and was capable of encountering every nation with the advantages of its respective arms and discipline. Nor was the legion destitute of what, in modern language, would be styled a train of artillery. It consisted in ten military engines of the largest, and fifty-five of a smaller size, but all of which, either in an oblique or horizontal manner, discharged stones and darts with irresistible violence. End of chapter 1, part 2「Chapter One, Part Three of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Chapman. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon, Volume One, Chapter One. The Extent of the Empire in the Age of the Antonines Part Three. The camp of a Roman legion presented the appearance of a fortified city. As soon as the space was marked out, the pioneers carefully levelled the ground and removed every impediment that might interrupt its perfect regularity. 
Its form was an exact quadrangle, and we may calculate that a square of about seven hundred yards was sufficient for the encampment of twenty thousand Romans, though a similar number of our own troops would expose to the enemy a front of more than treble that extent. In the midst of the camp, the Praetorium, or General's Quarters, rose above the others. The cavalry, the infantry, and the auxiliaries occupied their respective stations. The streets were broad and perfectly straight, and a vacant space of two hundred feet was left on all sides between the tents and the rampart. The rampart itself was usually twelve feet high, armed with a line of strong and intricate palisades, and defended by a ditch of twelve feet in depth as well as in breadth. This important labour was performed by the hands of the legionaries themselves, to whom the use of the spade and the pickaxe was no less familiar than that of the sword or pilum. Active valour may often be the present of nature, but such patient diligence can be the fruit only of habit and discipline. Whenever the trumpet gave the signal of departure, the camp was almost instantly broke up, and the troops fell into their ranks without delay or confusion. Besides their arms, which the legendaries scarcely considered as an encumbrance, they were laden with their kitchen furniture, the instruments of fortification, and the provision of many days. Under this weight, which would oppress the delicacy of a modern soldier, they were trained by a regular step to advance in about six hours near twenty miles on the appearance of an enemy they threw aside their baggage and by easy and rapid evolutions converted the column of march into an order of battle the slingers and archers skirmished in the front the auxiliaries formed the first line and were seconded or sustained by the strength of the legions. The cavalry covered the flanks, and the military engines were placed in the rear. Such were the arts of war by which the Roman emperors defended their extensive conquests, and preserved a military spirit at a time when every other virtue was oppressed by luxury and despotism. If, in the consideration of their armies, we pass from their discipline to their numbers, we shall not find it easy to define them with any tolerable accuracy. We may compute, however, that the legion, which was itself a body of 6,831 Romans, might, with its attendant auxiliaries, amount to about 12,500 men. The peace establishment of Hadrian and his successors was composed of no less than thirty of these formidable brigades, and most probably formed a standing force of 375,000 men. Instead of being confined within the walls of fortified cities, which the Romans considered as the refuge of weakness or pusillanimity, the legions were encamped on the banks of the great rivers and along the frontiers of the barbarians. As their stations for the most part remained fixed and permanent, we may venture to describe the distribution of the troops. Three legions were sufficient for Britain. The principal strength lay upon the Rhine and Danube, and consisted of sixteen legions in the following proportions. Two in the lower and three in the upper Germany, one in Rhaetia, one in Noricum, four in Pannonia, three in Mesia, and two in Dacia. The defence of the Euphrates was entrusted to eight legions, six of whom were planted in Syria, and the other two in Cappadocia. With regard to Egypt, Africa, and Spain, as they were far removed from any important scene of war, a single legion maintained the domestic tranquillity of each of these great provinces. Even Italy was not left destitute of a military force. Above twenty thousand chosen soldiers, distinguished by the titles of city cohorts and praetorian guards, 
watched over the safety of the monarch and the capital. As the authors of almost every revolution that distracted the empire, the Praetorians will, very soon, and very loudly, demand our attention. But in their arms and institutions, we cannot find any circumstance which discriminated them from the legions, unless it were a more splendid appearance and a less rigid discipline. The navy maintained by the emperors might seem inadequate to their greatness, but it was fully sufficient for every useful purpose of government. The ambition of the Romans was confined to the land, nor was that warlike people ever actuated by the enterprising spirit which had prompted the navigators of Tyre, of Carthage, and even of Marseilles to enlarge the bounds of the world and to explore the most remote coasts of the ocean. To the Romans, the ocean remained an object of terror rather than of curiosity. The whole extent of the Mediterranean, after the destruction of Carthage and the extirpation of the pirates, was included within their provinces. The policy of the emperors was directed only to preserve the peaceful dominion of that sea, and to protect the commerce of their subjects. With these moderate views, Augustus stationed two permanent fleets in the most convenient ports of Italy, the one at Ravenna on the Adriatic, the other at Misenum in the Bay of Naples. Experience seems at length to have convinced the ancients that as soon as their galleys exceeded two, or at the most three ranks of oars, they were suited rather for vain pomp than for real service. Augustus himself, in the victory of Actium, had seen the superiority of his own light frigates, they were called Liburnians, over the lofty but unwieldy castles of his rival. Of these Liburnians he composed the two fleets of Ravenna and Misenum, destined to command the one the eastern, and the other the western division of the Mediterranean, and to each of the squadrons he attached a body of several thousand marines. Besides these two ports, which may be considered as the principal seats of the Roman navy, a very considerable force was stationed at Frejus, on the coast of Provence, and the Euxine was guarded by forty ships and three thousand soldiers. To all these we add the fleet which preserved the communication between Gaul and Britain, and a great number of vessels constantly maintained on the Rhine and Danube to harass the country, or to intercept the passage of the barbarians. If we review this general state of the imperial forces, of the cavalry as well as infantry, of the legions, the auxiliaries, the guards, and the navy, the most liberal computation will not allow us to fix the entire establishment by sea and by land at more than 450,000 men, a military power which, however formidable it may seem, was equalled by a monarch of the last century, whose kingdom was confined within a single province of the Roman Empire. We have attempted to explain the spirit which moderated and the strength which supported the power of Hadrian and the Antonines. We shall now endeavour, with clearness and precision, to describe the provinces once united under their sway, but at present divided into so many independent and hostile states. Spain, the western extremity of the empire, of Europe, and of the ancient world, has in every age invariably preserved the same natural limits, the Pyrenean Mountains, the Mediterranean, and the Atlantic Ocean. That great peninsula, at present so unequally divided between two sovereigns, was distributed by Augustus into three provinces, Lusitania, Baetica, and Tarraconensis. The kingdom of Portugal now fills the place of the warlike country of the Lusitanians, and the loss sustained by the former on the side of the east is compensated by an accession of territory towards the north. 
the confines of Grenada and Andalusia, correspond with those of ancient Baetica. The remainder of Spain, Galicia, and the Asturias, Biscay, and Navarre, Leon, and the two Castiles, Murcia, Valencia, Catalonia, and Aragon, all contributed to form the third and most considerable of the Roman governments, which, from the name of its capital, was styled the province of Tarragona. Of the native barbarians, the Celtiberians were the most powerful, as the Cantabrians and Asturians proved the most obstinate. Confident in the strength of their mountains, they were the last who submitted to the arms of Rome, and the first who threw off the yoke of the Arabs. Ancient Gaul, as it contained the whole country between the Pyrenees, the Alps, the Rhine, and the Ocean, was of greater extent than modern France. To the dominions of that powerful monarchy, with its recent acquisitions of Alsace and Lorraine, we must add the Duchy of Savoy, the cantons of Switzerland, the four electorates of the Rhine, and the territories of Liege, Luxembourg, Hainaut, Flanders, and Brabant. When Augustus gave laws to the conquests of his father, he introduced a division of Gaul, equally adapted to the progress of the legions, to the course of the rivers, and to the principal national distinctions, which had comprehended above a hundred independent states. The sea coast of the Mediterranean, Languedoc, Provence, and Dauphiné, received their provincial appellation from the colony of Narbonne. The government of Aquitaine was extended from the Pyrenees to the Loire. The country between the Loire and the Seine was styled the Celtic Gaul, and soon borrowed a new denomination from the celebrated colony of Lugdunum, or Leon. The Belgic lay beyond the Seine, and in more ancient times had been bounded only by the Rhine, but a little before the age of Caesar, the Germans, abusing their superiority of valour, had occupied a considerable portion of the Belgic territory. The Roman conquerors very eagerly embraced so flattering a circumstance, and the Gallic frontier of the Rhine, from Basel to Leyden, received the pompous names of the Upper and the Lower Germany. Such, under the reign of the Antonines, were the six provinces of Gaul, the Narbonnese, Aquitaine, the Celtic, or Leonese, the Belgic, and the two Germanies. We have already had occasion to mention the conquest of Britain, and to fix the boundary of the Roman province in this island. It comprehended all England, Wales, and the lowlands of Scotland, as far as the friths of Dumbarton and Edinburgh. Before Britain lost her freedom, the country was irregularly divided between thirty tribes of barbarians, of whom the most considerable were the Belgi in the west, the Brigantes in the north, the Silures in South Wales, and the Iceni in Norfolk and Suffolk. As far as we can either trace or credit the resemblance of manners and language, Spain, Gaul, and Britain were peopled by the same hardy race of savages. Before they yielded to the Roman arms, they often disputed the field, and often renewed the contest. After their submission, they constituted the western division of the European provinces, which extended from the columns of Hercules to the wall of Antoninus, and from the mouth of the Tagus to the sources of the Rhine and Danube. Before the Roman conquest, the country which is now called Lombardy was not considered as a part of Italy. It had been occupied by a powerful colony of Gauls, who, settling themselves along the banks of the Po, from Piedmont to Romagna, carried their arms and diffused their name from the Alps to the Apennine. The Ligurians dwelt on the rocky coast which now forms the Republic of Genoa. Venice was yet unborn, 
but the territories of that state, which lie to the east of the Ardige, were inhabited by the Venetians. The middle part of the peninsula, that now composes the Duchy of Tuscany and the ecclesiastical state, was the ancient seat of the Etruscans and Umbrians, to the former of whom Italy was indebted for the first rudiments of civilized life. The Tiber rolled at the foot of the seven hills of Rome, and the country of the Sabines, the Latins, and the Volsci, from that river to the frontiers of Naples, was the theatre of her infant victories. On that celebrated ground the first consuls deserved triumphs, their successors adorned villas, and their posterity have erected convents. Capua and Campania possessed the immediate territory of Naples. The rest of the kingdom was inhabited by many warlike nations, the Marci, the Samnites, the Apulians, and the Lucanians, and the sea coasts had been covered by the flourishing colonies of the Greeks. We may remark that when Augustus divided Italy into eleven regions, the little province of Istria was annexed to that seat of Roman sovereignty. The European provinces of Rome were protected by the course of the Rhine and the Danube, the latter of those mighty streams, which rises at the distance of only thirty miles from the former, flows above thirteen hundred miles, for the most part to the south-east, collects the tribute of sixty navigable rivers, and is at length, through six mouths, received into the Euxine, which appears scarcely equal to such an accession of waters. The provinces of the Danube soon acquired the general appellation of Illyricum, or the Illyrian frontier, and were esteemed the most warlike of the empire. But they deserve to be more particularly considered under the names of Rhetia, Noricum, Pannonia, Dalmatia, Dacia, Mesia, Thrace, Macedonia, and Greece. The province of Rhetia, which soon extinguished the name of the Vindelicians, extended from the summit of the Alps to the banks of the Danube, from its source as far as its conflux with the Inn. The greatest part of the flat country is subject to the Elector of Bavaria. The city of Augsburg is protected by the constitution of the German Empire. The Grisons are safe in their mountains and the country of Tyrol is ranked among the numerous provinces of the House of Austria. The wide extent of territory which is included between the Inn, the Danube, and the Sarve, Austria, Styria, Carinthia, Carniola, the Lower Hungary, and Sclavonia, was known to the ancients under the names of Noricum and Pannonia. In their original state of independence, their fierce inhabitants were intimately connected. Under the Roman government they were frequently united, and they still remain the patrimony of a single family. They now contain the residence of a German prince, who styles himself Emperor of the Romans, and form the centre, as well as strength, of the Austrian power. It may not be improper to observe that if we accept Bohemia, Moravia, the northern skirts of Austria, and a part of Hungary between the Tace and the Danube, all the other dominions of the House of Austria were comprised within the limits of the Roman Empire. Dalmatia, to which the name of Illyricum more properly belonged, was a long but narrow tract between the Sarve and the Adriatic. The best part of the sea coast, which still retains its ancient appellation, is a province of the Venetian state, and the seat of the little republic of Ragusa. The inland parts have assumed the Sclavonian names of Croatia and Bosnia. The former obeys an Austrian governor, the latter a Turkish pasha, but the whole country is still infested by tribes of barbarians, 
whose savage independence irregularly marks the doubtful limit of the Christian and Mahometan power. After the Danube had received the waters of the Tace and the Sarve, it acquired, at least among the Greeks, the name of Ista. It formerly divided Mysia and Dacia, the latter of which, as we have already seen, was a conquest of Trajan, and the only province beyond the river. If we inquire into the present state of those countries, we shall find that, on the left hand of the Danube, Temesvar and Transylvania have been annexed, after many revolutions, to the crown of Hungary, whilst the principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia acknowledge the supremacy of the Ottoman port. On the right hand of the Danube, Mysia, which during the Middle Ages was broken into the barbarian kingdoms of Servia and Bulgaria, is again united in Turkish slavery. The appellation of Rumelia, which is still bestowed by the Turks on the extensive countries of Thrace, Macedonia, and Greece, preserves the memory of their ancient state under the Roman Empire. In the time of the Antonines, the martial regions of Thrace, from the mountains of Hemus and Rhodope, to the Bosphorus and the Hellespont, had assumed the form of a province. Notwithstanding the change of masters and of religion, the new city of Rome, founded by Constantine on the banks of the Bosphorus, has ever since remained the capital of a great monarchy. The kingdom of Macedonia, which under the reign of Alexander gave laws to Asia, derived more solid advantages from the policy of the two Philips, and with its dependencies of Epirus and Thessaly, extended from the Aegean to the Ionian Sea. When we reflect on the fame of Thebes and Argos, of Sparta and Athens, we can scarcely persuade ourselves that so many immortal republics of ancient Greece were lost in a single province of the Roman Empire, which, from the superior influence of the Achaean League, was usually denominated the province of Achaea. Such was the state of Europe under the Roman emperors. The provinces of Asia, without accepting the transient conquests of Trajan, are all comprehended within the limits of the Turkish power. But instead of following the arbitrary divisions of despotism and ignorance, it will be safer for us, as well as more agreeable, to observe the indelible characters of nature. The name of Asia Minor is attributed with some propriety to the peninsula, which, confined betwixt the Euxine and the Mediterranean, advances from the Euphrates towards Europe. The most extensive and flourishing district, westward of Mount Taurus and the River Halys, was dignified by the Romans with the exclusive title of Asia. The jurisdiction of that province extended over the ancient monarchies of Troy, Lydia, and Phrygia, the maritime countries of the Pamphylians, Lycians, and Carians, and the Grecian colonies of Ionia, which equalled in arts, though not in arms, the glory of their parent. The kingdoms of Bithynia and Pontus possessed the northern side of the peninsula, from Constantinople to Trebizond. On the opposite side, the province of Cilicia was terminated by the mountains of Syria, the inland country, separated from the Roman Asia by the river Halys, and from Armenia by the Euphrates, had once formed the independent kingdom of Cappadocia. In this place we may observe that the northern shores of the Euxine, beyond Trebizond in Asia, and beyond the Danube in Europe, acknowledged the sovereignty of the emperors, and received at their hands either tributary princes or Roman garrisons. Budzak, Crim Tartary, Circassia, and Mingrelia are the modern appellations of those savage countries. Under the successors of Alexander, Syria was the seat of the Seleucidae, 
who reigned over Upper Asia till the successful revolt of the Parthians confined their dominions between the Euphrates and the Mediterranean. When Syria became subject to the Romans, it formed the eastern frontier of their empire, nor did that province, in its utmost latitude, know any other bounds than the mountains of Cappadocia to the north, and towards the south, the confines of Egypt and the Red Sea. Phoenicia and Palestine were sometimes annexed to, and sometimes separated from, the jurisdiction of Syria. The former of these was a narrow and rocky coast, the latter was a territory scarcely superior to Wales, either in fertility or extent. Yet Phoenicia and Palestine will forever live in the memory of mankind, since America, as well as Europe, has received letters from the one, and religion from the other. A sandy desert, alike destitute of wood and water, skirts along the doubtful confine of Syria, from the Euphrates to the Red Sea. The wandering life of the Arabs was inseparably connected with their independence, and wherever, on some spots less barren than the rest, they ventured to for many settled habitations, they soon became subjects to the Roman Empire. The geographers of antiquity have frequently hesitated to what portion of the globe they should ascribe Egypt. By its situation that celebrated kingdom is included within the immense peninsula of Africa, but it is accessible only on the side of Asia, whose revolutions in almost every period of history, Egypt has humbly obeyed. A Roman prefect was seated on the splendid throne of the Ptolemies, and the iron sceptre of the Mamelukes is now in the hands of a Turkish pasha. The Nile flows down the country. Above five hundred miles from the Tropic of Cancer to the Mediterranean, and marks on either side of the extent of fertility by the measure of its inundations. Cyrene, situated towards the west and along the sea coast, was first a Greek colony, afterwards a province of Egypt, and is now lost in the desert of Barca. From Cyrene to the ocean, the coast of Africa extends above fifteen hundred miles yet so closely is it pressed between the Mediterranean and the Sahara, or sandy desert, that its breadth seldom exceeds fourscore or a hundred miles. The eastern division was considered by the Romans as the more peculiar and proper province of Africa. Till the arrival of the Phoenician colonies, that fertile country was inhabited by the Libyans, the most savage of mankind. Under the immediate jurisdiction of Carthage, it became the centre of commerce and empire, but the Republic of Carthage is now degenerated into the feeble and disorderly states of Tripoli and Tunis. The military government of Algiers oppresses the wide extent of Numidia, as it was once united under Massinissa and Jugurtha, but in the time of Augustus, the limits of Numidia were contracted, and at least two-thirds of the country acquiesced in the name of Mauritania, with the epithet of Caesariensis. The genuine Mauritania, or country of the Moors, which from the ancient city of Tingi, or Tangier, was distinguished by the appellation of Tingitana, is represented by the modern kingdom of Fez. Sal, on the ocean, so infamous at present for its piratical depredations, was noticed by the Romans as the extreme object of their power and almost of their geography. The city of their foundation may still be discovered near Meknes, the residence of the barbarian whom we condescend to style the emperor of Morocco. But it does not appear that his more southern dominions, Morocco itself, and Sigilmessa, were ever comprehended within the Roman province. The western parts of Africa 
are intersected by the branches of Mount Atlas, a name so idly celebrated by the fancy of poets, but which is now diffused over the immense ocean that rolls between the ancient and the new continent. Having now finished the circuit of the Roman Empire, we may observe that Africa is divided from Spain by a narrow strait of about twelve miles, through which the Atlantic flows into the Mediterranean. The columns of Hercules, so famous among the ancients, were two mountains which seem to have been torn asunder by some convulsion of the elements, and at the foot of the European mountain the fortress of Gibraltar is now seated. The whole extent of the Mediterranean Sea, its coasts and its islands, were comprised within the Roman dominion. Of the larger islands, the two Baleares, which derive their name of Majorca and Minorca from their respective size, are subject at present the former to Spain, the latter to Great Britain. It is easier to deplore the fate than to describe the actual condition of Corsica. Two Italian sovereigns assume a regal title from Sardinia and Sicily. Crete or Candia, with Cyprus, and most of the smaller islands of Greece and Asia, have been subdued by the Turkish arms, whilst the little rock of Malta defies their power, and has emerged under the government of its military order into fame and opulence. This long enumeration of provinces, whose broken fragments have formed so many powerful kingdoms, might almost induce us to forgive the vanity or ignorance of the ancients. Dazzled with the extensive sway, the irresistible strength, and the real or affected moderation of the emperors, they permitted themselves to despise, and sometimes to forget, the outlying countries which had been left in the enjoyment of a barbarous independence and they gradually usurped the license of confounding the Roman monarchy with the globe of the earth. But the temper, as well as knowledge, of a modern historian require a more sober and accurate language. He may impress a juster image of the greatness of Rome by observing that the empire was above two thousand miles in breadth from the wall of Antoninus and the northern limits of Dacia, to Mount Atlas and the Tropic of Cancer, that it extended in length more than three thousand miles from the western ocean to the Euphrates, that it was situated in the finest part of the temperate zone between the twenty-fourth and fifty-sixth degrees of northern latitude, and that it was supposed to contain above sixteen hundred thousand square miles, for the most part of fertile and well cultivated land end of chapter 1 part 3「chapter 2 part 1 of the decline and fall of the roman empire volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon Chapter 2. The Internal Prosperity in the Age of the Antonines Part 1. Of the Union and Internal Prosperity of the Roman Empire in the Age of the Antonines it is not alone by the rapidity or extent of conquest that we should estimate the greatness of Rome. The sovereign of the Russian deserts commands a larger portion of the globe. In the seventh summer after his passage of the Hellespont, Alexander erected the Macedonian trophies on the banks of the Hephaestus. Within less than a century, the irresistible Genghis and the Mogul princes of his race spread their cruel devastations and transient empire from the sea of china to the confines of egypt and germany but the firm edifice of roman power was raised and preserved by the wisdom of ages the obedient provinces of trajan and the antonines were united by laws 
and adorned by arts. They might occasionally suffer from the partial abuse of delegated authority, but the general principle of government was wise, simple, and beneficent. They enjoyed the religion of their ancestors, whilst in civil honors and advantages they were exalted, by just degrees, to an equality with their conquerors. The policy of the emperors and the senate, as far as it concerned religion, was happily seconded by the reflections of the enlightened, and by the habits of the superstitious part of their subjects. The various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were all considered by the people as equally true, by the philosopher as equally false, and by the magistrate as equally useful. And thus toleration produced not only mutual indulgence, but even religious concord. The superstition of the people was not embittered by any mixture of theological rancor, nor was it confined by the chains of any speculative system. The devout polytheist, though fondly attached to his national rights, admitted with implicit faith the different religions of the earth. Fear, gratitude, and curiosity, a dream or an omen, a singular disorder, or a distant journey, perpetually disposed him to multiply the articles of his belief, and to enlarge the list of his protectors. The thin texture of the pagan mythology was interwoven with various but not discordant materials. As soon as it was allowed that sages and heroes who had lived or who had died for the benefit of their country were exalted to a state of power and immortality, it was universally confessed that they deserved, if not the adoration, at least the reverence of all mankind. The deities of a thousand groves and a thousand streams possessed in peace their local and respective influence, nor could the Romans who deprecated the wrath of the Tiber deride the Egyptian who presented his offering to the beneficent genius of the Nile. The visible powers of nature, the planets, and the elements were the same throughout the universe. The invisible governors of the moral world were inevitably cast in a similar mould of fiction and allegory. Every virtue, and even vice, acquired its divine representative, every art and profession its patron, whose attributes in the most distant ages and countries were uniformly derived from the character of their peculiar votaries. A republic of gods of such opposite tempers and interests required, in every system, the moderating hand of a supreme magistrate, who, by the progress of knowledge and flattery, was gradually invested with the sublime perfections of an eternal parent and an omnipotent monarch. Such was the mild spirit of antiquity that the nations were less attentive to the differences than to the resemblance of their religious worship the greek the roman and the barbarian as they met before their respective altars easily persuaded themselves that under various names and with various ceremonies they adored the same deities the elegant mythology of homer gave a beautiful and almost regular form to the polytheism of the ancient world the philosophers of greece deduced their morals from the nature of man rather than from that of god they meditated, however, on the divine nature as a very curious and important speculation, and in the profound inquiry they displayed the strength and weakness of the human understanding. Of the four most celebrated schools, the Stoics and the Platonists endeavored to reconcile the jarring interests of reason and piety. They have left us the most sublime proofs of the existence and perfections of the first cause, but, as it was impossible for them to conceive the creation of matter, the workman in the Stoic philosophy was not sufficiently distinguished from the work, whilst, on the contrary, the spiritual god of Plato and his disciples resembled an idea rather than a substance. The opinions of the academics and Epicureans were of a less religious cast, but whilst the modest science of the former induced them to doubt, the positive ignorance of the latter urged them to deny the providence of a supreme ruler the spirit of inquiry prompted by emulation and supported by freedom had divided the public teachers of philosophy into a variety of contending sects but the ingenious youth who from every part resorted to athens and the other seats of learning in the roman empire were alike instructed in every school to reject and despise the religion of the multitude how indeed was it possible that a philosopher should accept as divine truths the idle tales of the poets and the incoherent traditions of antiquity, or that he should adore as gods those imperfect beings whom he must have despised as men? Against such unworthy adversaries Cicero condescended to employ the arms of reason and eloquence, but the satire of Lucian was a much more adequate as well as more efficacious weapon. 
we may be well assured that a writer conversant with the world would never have ventured to expose the gods of his country to public ridicule had they not already been the objects of secret contempt among the polished and enlightened orders of society notwithstanding the fashionable irreligion which prevailed in the age of the antonines both the interests of the priests and the credulity of the people were sufficiently respected in their writings and conversation the philosophers of antiquity asserted the independent dignity of reason but they resigned their actions to the commands of law and custom viewing with a smile of pity and indulgence the various errors of the vulgar they diligently practised the ceremonies of their fathers devoutly frequented the temples of the gods and sometimes condescending to act a part on the theatre of superstition they concealed the sentiments of an atheist under the sacerdotal robes reasoners of such a temper were scarcely inclined to wrangle about their respective modes of faith or of worship it was indifferent to them what shape the folly of the multitude might choose to assume and they approached with the same inward contempt and the same external reverence the altars of the libyan the olympian or the capitoline jupiter it is not easy to conceive from what motives a spirit of persecution could introduce itself into the roman councils the magistrates could not be actuated by a blind though honest bigotry since the magistrates were themselves philosophers and the schools of athens had given laws to the senate they could not be impelled by ambition or avarice as the temporal and ecclesiastical powers were united in the same hands the pontiffs were chosen among the most illustrious of the senators and the office of supreme pontiff was constantly exercised by the emperors themselves they knew and valued the advantages of religion as it is connected with civil government they encouraged the public festivals which humanized the manners of the people they managed the arts of divination as a convenient instrument of policy and they respected as the firmest bond of society the useful persuasion that either in this or in a future life the crime of perjury is most assuredly punished by the avenging gods but whilst they acknowledged the general advantages of religion they were convinced that the various modes of worship contributed alike to the same salutary purposes and that in every country the form of superstition which had received the sanction of time and experience was the best adapted to the climate and to its inhabitants avarice and taste very frequently despoiled the vanquished nations of the elegant statues of their gods and the rich ornaments of their temples but in the exercise of the religion which they derived from their ancestors they uniformly experienced the indulgence and even protection of the roman conquerors the province of gaul seems and indeed only seems an exception to this universal toleration under the specious pretext of abolishing human sacrifices the emperors tiberius and claudius suppressed the dangerous power of the druids but the priests themselves their gods and their altars subsisted in peaceful obscurity till the final destruction of paganism rome the capital of a great monarchy was incessantly filled with subjects and strangers from every part of the world who all introduced and enjoyed the favoured superstitions of their native country every city in the empire was justified in maintaining the purity of its ancient ceremonies and the roman senate using the common privilege sometimes interposed to check this inundation of foreign rights the egyptian superstition of all the most contemptible and abject was frequently prohibited the temples of serapis and isis demolished and their worshippers banished from rome and italy but the zeal of fanaticism prevailed over the cold and feeble efforts of policy the exiles returned the proselytes multiplied the temples were restored with increasing splendour and isis and serapis at length assumed their place among the roman deities nor was this indulgence a departure from the old maxims of government in the purest ages of the commonwealth sibyl and Asclepius had been invited by solemn embassies and it was customary to tempt the protectors of besieged cities by the promise of more distinguished honours than they possessed in their native country rome gradually became the common temple of her subjects and freedom of the city was bestowed on all the gods of mankind the narrow policy of preserving without any foreign mixture the pure blood of the ancient citizens had checked the fortune and hastened the ruin of athens and sparta the aspiring genius of rome sacrificed vanity to ambition and deemed it more prudent as well as honourable to adopt virtue and merit for her own wheresoever they were found among slaves or strangers enemies or barbarians 
During the most flourishing era of the Athenian commonwealth, the number of citizens gradually decreased from about thirty to twenty-one thousand. If, on the contrary, we study the growth of the Roman Republic, we may discover that, notwithstanding the incessant demands of wars and colonies, the citizens who, in the first census of Servius Tullius, amounted to no more than eighty-three thousand, were multiplied before the commencement of the social war to the number of four hundred and sixty-three thousand men able to bear arms in the service of their country. When the allies of Rome claimed an equal share of honors and privileges, the Senate indeed preferred the chance of arms to an ignominious concession. The Samnites and the Lucanians paid the severe penalty of their rashness, but the rest of the Italian states, as they successively returned to their duty, were admitted into the bosom of the Republic, and soon contributed to the ruin of public freedom. Under a democratical government, the citizens exercise the powers of sovereignty, and those powers will be first abused and afterwards lost if they are committed to an unwieldy multitude. But when the popular assemblies had been suppressed by the administration of the emperors, the conquerors were distinguished from the various nations only as the first and most honorable order of subjects, and their increase, however rapid, was no longer exposed to the same dangers. Yet the wisest princes who adopted the maxims of Augustus guarded with the strictest care the dignity of the Roman name, and diffused the freedom of the city with a prudent liberality. End of chapter 2, part 1《ハプナー》の2、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、第2部、Till the privileges of Romans had been progressively extended to all inhabitants of the empire, an important distinction was preserved between Italy and the provinces. The former was esteemed the center of public unity and the firm basis of the constitution. Italy claimed the birth, or at least the residence, of the emperors and the senate. The estates of the Italians were exempt from taxes, their persons from arbitrary jurisdiction of governors. Their municipal corporations, formed after the perfect model of the capital, were entrusted under the immediate eyes of the supreme power with the execution of the laws. From the foot of the Alps to the extremity of Calabria, all the natives of Italy were born citizens of Rome. Their partial distinctions were obliterated, and they insensibly coalesced into one great nation, united by language, manners, and civil institutions, and equal to the weight of a powerful empire. The Republic gloried in her generous policy, and was frequently rewarded by the merit and services of her adopted sons. Had she always confined the distinction of Romans to the ancient families within the walls of the city, that immortal name would have been deprived of some of its most noble ornaments. Virgil was a native of Mantua. Horace was inclined to doubt whether he should call himself an Apulian or a Lucanian. It was in Padua that an historian was found worthy to record the majestic series of Roman victories. The patriot family of the Catos emerged from Tusculum. The little town of Arpinum claimed the double honor of producing Marius and Cicero, the former of whom deserved, after Romulus and Camulus, to be styled the third founder of Rome, and the latter, after saving his country from the designs of Catiline, enabled her to contend with Athens for the palm of eloquence. The provinces of the empire, as they have been described in the preceding chapter, were destitute of any public force or constitutional freedom. And in Etruria, in Greece, and in Gaul, it was the first care of the Senate to dissolve those dangerous confederacies which taught mankind that, as the Roman arms prevailed by division, they might be resisted by union. Those princes whom the ostentation of gratitude or generosity permitted for a while to hold a precarious scepter were dismissed from their thrones as soon as they had performed their appointed task of fashioning to the yoke the vanquished nations. The free states and cities which had embraced the cause of Rome were rewarded with a nominal alliance, and insensibly sunk into real servitude. The public authority was everywhere exercised by the ministers of the Senate and the emperors, and that authority was absolute and without control. 
but the same salutary maxims of government which had secured the peace and obedience of Italy were extended to the most distant conquests. A nation of Romans was gradually formed in the provinces, by the double expedient of introducing colonies, and of admitting the most faithful and deserving of the provincials to the freedom of Rome. Wheresoever the Roman conquers, he inhabits, is a very just observation of Seneca, confirmed by history and experience. The natives of Italy, allured by pleasure or by interest, hasten to enjoy the advantages of victory, and we may remark that, about forty years after the reduction of Asia, eighty thousand Romans were massacred in one day by the cruel orders of Mithridates. These voluntary exiles were engaged, for the most part, in the occupations of commerce, agriculture, and the farm of the revenue. But after the legions were rendered permanent by the emperors, the provinces were peopled by a race of soldiers, and the veterans, whether they received the reward of their service in land or in money, usually settled with their families in the country where they had honorably spent their youth. Throughout the empire, but more particularly in the western parts, the most fertile districts, and the most convenient stations, were reserved for the establishment of colonies, some of which were of a civil, and others of a military nature. In their manners and internal policy, the colonies formed a perfect representation of their great parent, and they were soon endeared to the natives by the ties of friendship and alliance. They effectually diffused a reverence for the Roman name, and a desire, which was seldom disappointed, of sharing in due time its honors and advantages. The municipal cities insensibly equaled the rank and splendor of the colonies, and in the reign of Hadrian it was disputed which was the preferable condition of those societies which had issued from, or those which had been received into, the bosom of Rome. The right of Latium, as it was called, conferred on the cities to which it had been granted a more partial favor. The magistrates only, at the expiration of their office, assumed the quality of Roman citizens, but as these offices were annual, in a few years they circulated round the principal families. Those of the provincials who were permitted to bear arms in the legions, those who exercised any civil employment, all, in a word, who performed any public service, or displayed any personal talents, were rewarded with a present whose value was continually diminished by the increasing liberality of the emperors. Yet even in the age of the Antonines, when the freedom of the city had been bestowed on the greater number of their subjects, it was still accompanied with very solid advantages. The bulk of the people acquired, with that title, the benefit of the Roman laws, particularly in the interesting articles of marriage, testaments, and inheritance, and the road of fortune was open to those whose pretensions were seconded by favor or merit. The grandsons of the Gauls, who had besieged Julius Caesar in Alcia, commanded legions, governed provinces, and were admitted into the Senate of Rome. Their ambition, instead of disturbing the tranquillity of the state, was intimately connected with its safety and greatness. So sensible were the Romans of the influence of language over national manners that it was their most serious care to extend, with the progress of their arms, the use of the Latin tongue. The ancient dialects of Italy, the Sabine, the Etruscan, and the Venetian, sunk into oblivion, but in the provinces the East was less docile than the West to the voice of its victorious preceptors. This obvious difference marked the two portions of the empire with a distinction of colors which, though it was in some degree concealed during the meridian splendor of prosperity, became gradually more visible as the shades of night descended upon the Roman world. The western countries were civilized by the same hands which subdued them. As soon as the barbarians were reconciled to obedience, their minds were open to any new impressions of knowledge and politeness. The language of Virgil and Cicero, though with some inevitable mixture of corruption, was so universally adopted in Africa, Spain, Gaul, Britain, and Pannonia, that the faint traces of the Punic or Celtic idioms were preserved only in the mountains or among the peasants. Education and study insensibly inspired the natives of those countries with the sentiments of Rome, and Italy gave fashions as well as laws to her Latin provincials. They solicited with more ardor and obtained with more faculty the freedom and honors of the state, supported the national dignity in letters and in arms, and at length, in the person of Trajan, produced an emperor whom the Scipios would not have disowned for their countrymen. The situation of the Greeks was very different from that of the barbarians. The former had been long civilized and corrupted, 
they had too much taste to relinquish their language, and too much vanity to adopt any foreign institutions. Still preserving the prejudices after they had lost the virtues of their ancestors, they affected to despise the unpolished manners of the Roman conquerors, whilst they were compelled to respect their superior wisdom and power. Nor was the influence of the Grecian language and sentiments confined to the narrow limits of that once celebrated country. Their empire, by the progress of colonies and conquest, had been diffused from the Adriatic to the Euphrates and the Nile. Asia was covered with Greek cities, and the long reign of the Macedonian kings had introduced a silent revolution into Syria and Egypt. In their pompous courts, those princes united the elegance of Athens with the luxury of the East, and the example of the court was imitated, at an humble distance, by the higher ranks of their subjects. Such was the general division of the Roman Empire into the Latin and Greek languages. To these we may add a third distinction for the body of the natives in Syria, and especially in Egypt. The use of their ancient dialects, by secluding them from the commerce of mankind, checked the improvements of those barbarians. The slothful effeminacy of the former exposed them to the contempt, the sullen ferociousness of the latter excited the aversion of the conquerors. Those nations had submitted to the Roman power, but they seldom desired or deserved the freedom of the city, and it was remarked that more than two hundred and thirty years elapsed after the ruin of the Ptolemies before an Egyptian was admitted into the Senate of Rome. It is a just, though trite, observation that victorious Rome was herself subdued by the arts of Greece. Those immortal writers who still command the admiration of modern Europe soon became the favorite object of study and imitation in Italy and the western provinces. But the elegant amusements of the Romans were not suffered to intervene with their sound maxims of policy. Whilst they acknowledged the charms of the Greek, they asserted the dignity of the Latin tongue, and the exclusive use of the latter was inflexibly maintained in the administration of civil as well as military government. But two languages exercised at the same time their separate jurisdiction throughout the empire, the former as the natural idiom of science, the latter as the legal dialect of public transactions. Those who united letters with business were equally conversant with both, and it was almost impossible in any province to find a Roman subject of a liberal education who was at once a stranger to the Greek and to the Latin language. It was by such institutions that the nations of the empire insensibly melted away into the Roman name and people. But there still remained, in the center of every province and of every family, an unhappy condition of men who endured the weight without sharing the benefits of society. In the free states of antiquity the domestic slaves were exposed to the wanton rigor of despotism. The perfect settlement of the Roman Empire was preceded by ages of violence and rapine. The slaves consisted, for the most part, of barbarian captives, taken in thousands by the chance of war, purchased at a vile price, accustomed to a life of independence, and impatient to break and to revenge their fetters. Against such internal enemies, whose desperate insurrections had more than once reduced the Republic to the brink of destruction, the most severe regulations and the most cruel treatment seemed almost justified by the great law of self-preservation. But when the principal nations of Europe, Asia, and Africa were united under the laws of one sovereign, the source of foreign supplies flowed with much less abundance, and the Romans were reduced to the milder but more tedious method of propagation. In their numerous families, and particularly in their country estates, they encouraged the marriage of their slaves. The sentiments of nature, the habits of education, and the possession of a dependent species of property contributed to alleviate the hardships of servitude. The existence of a slave became an object of greater value, and though his happiness still depended on the temper and circumstances of the master, the humanity of the latter, instead of being restrained by fear, was encouraged by the sense of his own interest. The progress of manners was accelerated by the virtue or policy of the emperors, and by the edicts of Hadrian and the Antonines, the protection of the laws was extended to the abject part of mankind. The jurisdiction of life and death over the slaves, a power long exercised and often abused, was taken out of private hands, and reserved to the magistrates alone. The subterraneous prisons were abolished, and upon a just complaint of intolerable treatment, the injured slave obtained either his deliverance or a less cruel master. Hope, the best comfort of our imperfect condition, was not denied to the Roman slave, and if he had any opportunity of rendering himself either useful or agreeable, 
he might very naturally expect that the diligence and fidelity of a few years would be rewarded with the inestimable gift of freedom. The benevolence of the master was so frequently prompted by the meaner suggestions of vanity and avarice, that the laws found it more necessary to restrain than encourage a profuse and undistinguishing liberty, which might degenerate into a very dangerous abuse. It was a maxim of ancient jurisprudence that a slave had not any country of his own. He acquired, with his liberty, an admission into the political society of which his patron was a member. The consequences of this maxim would have prostituted the privileges of the Roman city to a mean and promiscuous multitude. Some seasonable exceptions were therefore provided, and the honorable distinction was confined to such slaves only as, for just causes, and with the approbation of the magistrate, should receive a solemn and legal manumission. Even these chosen freedmen obtained no more than the private rights of citizens, and were rigorously excluded from civil or military honors. Whatever might be the merit or fortune of their sons, they likewise were esteemed unworthy of a seat in the Senate, nor were the traces of a servile origin allowed to be completely obliterated till the third or fourth generation. Without destroying the distinction of ranks, a distant prospect of freedom and honors was presented even to those whom pride and prejudice almost disdained to number among the human species it was once proposed to discriminate the slaves by a peculiar habit but it was justly apprehended that there might be some danger in acquainting them with their own numbers without interpreting in their utmost strictness the liberal appellations of legions and myriads we may venture to pronounce that the proportion of slaves who were valued as property was more considerable than that of servants, who can be computed only as an expense. The youths of a promising genius were instructed in the arts and sciences, and their price was ascertained by the degree of their skill and talents. Almost every profession, either liberal or mechanical, might be found in the household of an opulent senator. The ministers of pomp and sensuality were multiplied beyond the conception of modern luxury. It was more for the interest of the merchant or manufacturer to purchase than to hire his workmen, and in the country slaves were employed as the cheapest and most laborious instruments of agriculture. To confirm the general observation, and to display the multitude of slaves, we might allege a variety of peculiar instances. It was discovered, on a very melancholy occasion, that four hundred slaves were maintained in a single palace of Rome. The same number of four hundred belonged to an estate which an African widow of a very private condition resigned to her son, whilst she reserved for herself a much larger share of her property. A freedman under the name of Augustus, though his fortune had suffered great losses in the civil wars, left behind him three thousand six hundred yoke of oxen, two hundred and fifty thousand head of smaller cattle, and what was almost included in the description of cattle, four thousand one hundred and sixteen slaves. The number of subjects who acknowledge the laws of Rome, of citizens, of provincials, and slaves, cannot now be fixed with such a degree of accuracy as the importance of the object would deserve. We are informed that when the Emperor Claudius exercised the office of censor, he took an account of six millions nine hundred and forty-five thousand Roman citizens, who, with the proportion of women and children, must have amounted to about twenty millions of souls. The multitude of objects of an inferior rank was uncertain and fluctuating but after weighing with attention every circumstance which could influence the balance, it seems probable that there existed in the time of Claudius about twice as many provincials as there were citizens, of either sex and of every age, and that the slaves were at least equal in number to the free inhabitants of the Roman world. The total amount of this imperfect calculation would rise to about one hundred and twenty millions of persons, a degree of population which possibly exceeds that of modern Europe and forms the most numerous society that has ever been united under the same system of government. End of Part 2 Chapter 2, Part 3 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE DECLINE AND FALL OF THE ROMAN EMPIRE by Edward Gibbon CHAPTER Two: THE INTERNAL PROSPERITY IN THE AGE OF THE ANTONINES PART Three: DOMESTIC PEACE AND UNION WERE THE NATURAL CONSEQUENCES OF THE MODERN AND COMPREHENSIVE POLICY EMBRACED BY THE ROMANS. 
If we turn our eyes towards the monarchies of Asia, we shall behold despotism in the centre, and weakness in the extremities, the collection of the revenue or the administration of justice, enforced by the presence of an army, hostile barbarians established in the heart of the country, hereditary satraps usurping the domination of the provinces, and subjects inclined to rebellion, though incapable of freedom. But the obedience of the Roman world was uniform, voluntary, and permanent. The vanquished nations, blended into one great people, resigned the hope, nay, even the wish, of resuming their independence, and scarcely considered their own existence as distinct from the existence of Rome. The established authority of the emperors pervaded without an effort the wide extent of their dominions, and was exercised with the same faculty on the banks of the Thames or of the Nile as on those of the Tiber. The legions were destined to serve against the public enemy, and the civil magistrate seldom required the aid of a military force. In this state of general security, the leisure as well as opulence, both of prince and people, were devoted to improve and to adorn the Roman Empire. Among the innumerable monuments of architecture constructed by the Romans, how many have escaped the notice of history, how few have resisted the ravages of time and barbarism. And yet even the majestic ruins that are still scattered over Italy and the provinces would be sufficient to prove that these countries were once the seat of a polite and powerful empire. Their greatness alone, or their beauty, might deserve our attention, but they are rendered more interesting by two important circumstances which connect the agreeable history of the arts with the more useful history of human manners. Many of these works were erected at private expense, and almost all were intended for public benefit. It is natural to suppose that the greatest number, as well as the most considerable of the Roman edifices, were raised by the emperors who possessed so unbounded a command both of men and money. Augustus was accustomed to boast that he had found his capital of brick, and that he had left it of marble. The strict economy of Vespasian was the source of his magnificence. The works of Trajan bear the stamp of his genius. The public monuments with which Hadrian adorned every province of the empire were executed not only by his orders, but under his immediate inspection. He was himself an artist, and he loved the arts, as they conduced to the glory of the monarch. They were encouraged by the Antonines, as they contributed to the happiness of the people. But if the emperors were the first, they were not the only architects of their dominions. Their example was universally imitated by their principal subjects, who were not afraid of declaring to the world that they had spirit to conceive and wealth to accomplish the noblest undertakings. Scarcely had the proud structure of the Colosseum been dedicated at Rome before the edifices of a smaller scale indeed, but of the same design and materials, were erected for the use and at the expense of the cities of Capua and Verona. The inscription of the stupendous bridge of Alcantara attests that it was thrown over the Tagus by the contribution of a few Lusitanian communities. When Pliny was entrusted with the government of Bithynia and Pontus, provinces by no means the richest or most considerable of the empire, he found the cities within his jurisdiction striving with each other in every useful and ornamental work that might deserve the curiosity of strangers or the gratitude of their citizens. It was the duty of the proconsul to supply their deficiencies, to direct their taste, and sometimes to moderate their emulation. The opulent senators of Rome and the provinces esteemed it an honor, and almost an obligation, to adorn the splendor of their age and country, and the influence of fashion very frequently supplied the want of taste or generosity. Among a crowd of these private benefactors we may select Herodus Atticus, an Athenian citizen who lived in the age of the Antonines. Whatever might be the motive of his conduct, his magnificence would have been worthy of the greatest kings. The family of Herod, at least after it had been favored by fortune, was lineally descended from Simon and Miltiades, Theseus and Cecrops, Asus and Jupiter. But the posterity of so many gods and heroes was fallen into the most abject state. His grandfather had suffered by the hands of justice, and Julius Atticus, his father, must have ended his life in poverty and contempt had he not discovered an immense treasure buried under an old house, the last remains of his patrimony. According to the rigor of the law, the emperor might have asserted his claim, and the prudent Atticus prevented, by a frank confession, the officiousness of informers. But the equitable Nerva, who then filled the throne, refused to accept any part of it, and commanded him to use without scruple the present of fortune. The cautious Athenian still insisted that the treasure was too considerable for a subject, and that he knew not how to use it. 
"'Abuse it, then,' replied the monarch, with a good-natured peevishness, "'for it is your own. Many will be of the opinion that Atticus literally obeyed the emperor's last instructions, since he expended the great part of his fortune, which was much increased by an advantageous marriage, in the service of the public. He had obtained for his son Herod the prefecture of the free cities of Asia, and the young magistrate, observing that the town of Troas was indifferently supplied with water, obtained from the munificence of Hadrian three hundred myriads of drachmas, about a hundred thousand pounds, for the construction of a new aqueduct. But in the execution of the work, the charge amounted to more than double the estimate, and the officers of the revenue began to murmur till the generous Atticus silenced their complaints by requesting that he might be permitted to take upon himself the whole additional expense. The ablest preceptors of Greece and Asia had been invited by liberal rewards to direct the education of young Herod. Their pupil soon became a celebrated orator, according to the useless rhetoric of that age, which, confining itself to the schools, disdained to visit either the Forum or the Senate. He was honored with the consulship at Rome, but the greatest part of his life was spent in a philosophic retirement at Athens, and his adjacent villas, perpetually surrounded by sophists, who acknowledged without reluctance the superiority of a rich and generous rival. The monuments of his genius have perished, some considerable ruins still preserve the fame of his taste and munificence, Modern travellers have measured the remains of the stadium which he constructed at Athens. It was six hundred feet in length, built entirely of white marble, capable of admitting the whole body of the people, and finished in four years, whilst Herod was president of the Athenian Games. To the memory of his wife Regula he dedicated a theatre, scarcely to be paralleled in the empire. No wood except cedar, very curiously carved, was employed in any part of the building. The odium, designed by Pericles for musical performances, and the rehearsal of new tragedies, have been a trophy of the victory of the arts over barbaric greatness, as the timbers employed in the construction consisted chiefly of the masts of the Persian vessels. Notwithstanding the repairs bestowed on that ancient edifice by a king of Cappadocia, it was again fallen to decay. Herod restored its ancient beauty and magnificence nor was the liberality of that illustrious citizen confined to the walls of Athens. The most splendid ornaments bestowed on the temple of Neptune in Isthmus, at a theatre in Corinth, a stadium at Delphi, a bath at Thermopylae, and an aqueduct at Canusium in Italy, were insufficient to exhaust his treasures. The people of Epirus, Thessaly, Eboa, Boeotia, and Peloponnesus experienced his favours, and many inscriptions of the cities of Greece and Asia gratefully style Herodus Atticus their patron and benefactor. In the commonwealths of Athens and Rome, the modest simplicity of private houses announced the equal condition of freedom, whilst the sovereignty of the people was represented in the majestic edifices designed to the public use. Nor was this republican spirit totally extinguished by the introduction of wealth and monarchy. It was in the works of national honor and benefit that the most virtuous of the emperors affected to display their magnificence. The golden palace of Nero excited a just indignation, but the vast extent of ground which had been usurped by his selfish luxury was more nobly filled under the succeeding reigns by the Colosseum, the Baths of Titus, the Claudian Portico, and the temples dedicated to the goddess of peace and to the genius of Rome. These monuments of architecture, the property of the Roman people, were adorned with the most beautiful productions of Grecian painting and sculpture, and in the temple of peace a very curious library was opened to the curiosity of the learned. At a small distance from thence was situated the Forum of Trajan. It was surrounded by a lofty portico in the form of a quadrangle into which four triumphal arches opened a noble and spacious entrance. In the centre arose a column of marble, whose height of one hundred and ten feet denoted the elevation of the hill that had been cut away. This column, which still subsists in its ancient beauty, exhibited an exact representation of the Dacian victories of its founder. The veteran soldier contemplated the story of his own campaigns, and by an easy illustration of national victory the peaceful citizen associated himself to the honours of the triumph. All the other quarters of the capital, and all the provinces of the empire, were embellished by the same liberal spirit of public magnificence, and were filled with amphitheatres, theatres, temples, porticos, triumphal arches, baths, and aqueducts, all variously conducive to the health, the devotion, and the pleasures of the meanest citizen. 
the last mentioned of those edifices deserve our peculiar attention. The boldness of the enterprise, the solidity of the execution, and the uses to which they were subservient rank the aqueducts among the noblest monuments of Roman genius and power. The aqueducts of the capital claim a just preeminence, but the curious traveller who, without the light of history, should examine those of Spoleto, of Metz, or of Segovia, would very naturally conclude that those provincial towns had formerly been the residence of some potent monarch. The solitudes of Asia and Africa were once covered with flourishing cities, whose populousness and even whose existence was derived from such artificial supplies of a perennial stream of fresh water. We have computed the inhabitants and contemplated the public works of the Roman Empire. The observation of the number and greatness of its cities will serve to confirm the former, and to multiply the latter. It may not be unpleasing to collect a few scattered instances relative to that subject, without forgetting, however, that from the vanity of nations and the poverty of language the vague appellation of city has been indifferently bestowed on Rome and upon Laurentium. 1. Ancient Italy is said to have contained 1,197 cities, and for whatsoever era of antiquity that expression might be intended, there is not any reason to believe the country less populous in the age of the Antonines than in that of Romulus. The petty states of Latium were contained within the metropolis of the empire, by whose superior influence they had been attracted. Those parts of Italy which have so long languished under the lazy tyranny of priests and viceroys had been afflicted only by the more tolerable calamities of war, and the first symptoms of decay which they experienced were amply compensated by the rapid movements of the Cisalpine Gaul. The splendor of Verona may be traced in its remains, yet Verona was less celebrated than Aquileia or Padua, Milan or Ravenna. 2. The spirit of improvement had passed the Alps, and had been felt even in the woods of Britain, which were gradually cleared away to open a free space for convenient and elegant habitations. York was the seat of government. London was already enriched by commerce, and Bath was celebrated for the salutary effects of its medicinal waters. Gaul could boast of her twelve hundred cities, and though in the northern parts many of them, without excepting Paris itself, were little more than the rude and imperfect townships of a rising people, the southern provinces imitated the wealth and elegance of Italy. Many were the cities of Gaul, Marseille, Arles, Narbonne, Toulouse, Bordeaux, Autun, Vienna, Lyon, Langres, and Treves whose ancient condition might sustain an equal and perhaps advantageous comparison with their present state. With regard to Spain, that country flourishes a province, and has declined as a kingdom. Exhausted by the abuse of her strength, by America, and by superstition, her pride might possibly be confounded, if we require such a list of three hundred and sixty cities, as Pliny has exhibited under the reign of Vespasian. 3. Three hundred African cities, had once acknowledged the authority of Carthage. Nor is it likely that their numbers diminished under the administration of the emperors. Carthage itself rose with new splendor from its ashes, and that capital, as well as Capua and Corinth, soon recovered all the advantages which can be separated from independent sovereignty. 4. The provinces of the East present the contrast of Roman magnificence with Turkish barbarism. The ruins of antiquity scattered over uncultivated fields and ascribed by ignorance to the power of magic scarcely afford a shelter to the oppressed peasant or wandering Arab. Under the reign of the Caesars the proper Asia alone contained five hundred populous cities, enriched with all the gifts of nature and adorned with all the refinements of art. Eleven cities of Asia had once disputed the honor of dedicating a temple of Tiberius, and their respective merits were examined by the Senate. Four of them were immediately rejected as unequal to the burden, and among these was Laodicea, whose splendor is still displayed in its ruins. Laodicea collected a very considerable revenue from its flocks of sheep, celebrated for the fineness of their wool, and had received, a little before the contest, a legacy of above four hundred thousand pounds by the testament of a generous citizen. If such was the poverty of Laodicea, what must have been the wealth of those cities whose claim appeared preferable, and particularly of Pergamus, of Smyrna, and of Ephesus, who so long disputed with each other the titular primacy of Asia? The capitals of Syria and Egypt held a still superior rank in the empire, 
Antioch and Alexandria looked down with disdain on a crowd of dependent cities, and yielded with reluctance to the majesty of Rome itself. End of Part 3「Chapter Two, Part Four of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Two, The Internal Prosperity in the Age of the Antonines. Part Four. All these cities were connected with each other and with the capital by the public highways, which, issuing from the Forum of Rome, traversed Italy, pervaded the provinces, and were terminated only by the frontiers of the empire. If we carefully trace the distance from the wall of Antoninus to Rome, and from thence to Jerusalem, it will be found that the great chain of communication from the northwest to the southeast point of the empire was drawn out to the length of four thousand and eighty Roman miles. The public roads were accurately divided by milestones, and ran in a direct line from one city to another, with very little respect for the obstacles either of nature or private property. Mountains were perforated, and bold arches thrown over the broadest and most rapid streams. The middle part of the road was raised into a terrace which commanded the adjacent country, consisted of several strata of sand, gravel, and cement, and was paved with large stones, or in some places, near the capital, with granite. Such was the solid construction of the Roman highways, whose firmness has not entirely yielded to the effort of fifteen centuries. They united the subjects of the most distant provinces by an easy and familiar intercourse. Out their primary object had been to facilitate the marches of their legions, nor was any country considered as completely subdued till it had been rendered in all its parts pervious to the arms and authority of the conqueror. The advantage of receiving the earliest intelligence and of conveying their orders with celerity, induced the emperors to establish, throughout their extensive dominions, the regular institution of posts. Houses were everywhere erected at the distance of only five or six miles. Each of them was constantly provided with forty horses, and by the help of these relays, it was easy to travel a hundred miles in a day along the Roman roads. The use of post was allowed to those who claimed it by an imperial mandate, but though originally intended for the public service, it was sometimes indulged to the business or conveniency of private citizens. Nor was the communication of the Roman Empire less free and open by sea than it was by land. The provinces surrounded and enclosed the Mediterranean, and Italy, in the shape of an immense promontory, advanced into the midst of that grey lake. The coasts of Italy are, in general, destitute of safe harbors, but human industry had corrected the deficiencies of nature, and the artificial port of Ostia, in particular, situated at the mouth of the Tiber, and formed by the Emperor Claudius, was a useful monument of Roman greatness. From this port, which was only sixteen miles from the capital, a favorable breeze carried vessels in seven days to the columns of Hercules, and in nine or ten to Alexandria in Egypt. Whatever evils either reason or declamation have imputed to extensive empire, the power of Rome was attended with some beneficial consequences to mankind, and the same freedom of intercourse which extended the vices diffused likewise the improvements of social life. In the more remote ages of antiquity the world was unequally divided. The East was in the immemorable possession of arts and luxury, whilst the West was inhabited by rude and warlike barbarians, who either disdained agriculture or to whom it was totally unknown. Under the protection of an established government, the productions of happier climates and the industry of more civilized nations were gradually induced into the western countries of Europe, and the natives were encouraged by an open and profitable commerce to multiply the former, as well as to improve the latter. It would be almost impossible to enumerate all the articles, either of the animal or the vegetable reign, which were successively imported into Europe from Asia and Egypt. But it will not be unworthy of the dignity, and much less of the utility, of an historical work slightly to touch on a few of the principal heads. 1. Almost all the flowers, the herbs, and the fruits that grow in our European gardens are of foreign extraction, which, in many cases, is betrayed even by their names. 
The apple was a native of Italy, and when the Romans had tasted the richer flavor of the apricot, the peach, the pomegranate, the citron, and the orange, they contented themselves with applying to all these new fruits the common denomination of apple, discriminating them from each other by the additional epithet of their country. In the time of Homer, the vine grew wild in the island of Sicily, and most probably in the adjacent continent but it was not improved by the skill, nor did it afford a liquor grateful to the taste of the savage inhabitants. A thousand years afterwards Italy could boast that of the fourscore most generous and celebrated wines, more than two-thirds were produced from her soil. The blessing was soon communicated to the Narbonese province of Gaul, but so intense was the cold to the north of the Sivanese, that in the time of Strabo it was thought impossible to ripen the grapes in those parts of Gaul. This difficulty, however, was gradually vanquished, and there is some reason to believe that the vineyards of Burgundy are as old as the age of the Antonines. 3. The olive in the western world followed the progress of peace, of which it was considered as the symbol. Two centuries after the foundation of Rome, both Italy and Africa were strangers to that useful plant. It was naturalized in those countries, and at length carried into the heart of Spain and Gaul the timid errors of the ancients, that it required a certain degree of heat, and could only flourish in the neighborhood of the sea, were insensibly exploded by industry and experience. 4. The cultivation of flax was transported from Egypt to Gaul, and enriched the whole country, however it might impoverish the particular lands on which it was sown. 5. The use of artificial grasses became familiar to the farmers both of Italy and the provinces, particularly the Lucerne, which derived its name and origin from Medea. The assured supply of wholesome and plentiful food for the cattle during winter multiplied the number of the docks and herds, which in their turn contributed to the fertility of the soil. To all these improvements may be added an assiduous attention to mines and fisheries, which, by employing a multitude of laborious hands, serve to increase the pleasures of the rich and the subsistence of the poor. The elegant treatise of Columella describes the advanced state of the Spanish husbandry under the reign of Tiberius, and it may be observed that those famines which so frequently afflicted the infant republic were seldom or never experienced by the extensive empire of Rome. The accidental scarcity in any single province was immediately relieved by the plenty of its more fortunate neighbors. Agriculture is the foundation of manufactures, since the productions of nature are the materials of art. Under the Roman Empire, the labor of an industrious and ingenious people was variously but incessantly employed in the service of the rich. In their dress, their table, their houses, and their furniture, the favors of fortune united every refinement of conveniency, of elegance, and of splendor, whatever could soothe their pride or gratify their sensuality. Such refinements, under the odious name of luxury, have been severely arraigned by the moralists of every age and it might perhaps be more conducive to the virtue as well as happiness of mankind if all possessed the necessities and none the superfluities of life but in the present imperfect condition of society luxury though it may proceed from vice or folly seems to be the only means that can correct the unequal distribution of poverty the diligent mechanic and the skilful artist who have obtained no share in the division of the earth receive a voluntary tax from the possessors of land and the latter are prompted by a sense of interest to improve these estates with whose produce they may purchase additional pleasures. This operation, the particular effects of which are felt in every society, acted with much more diffusive energy in the Roman world. The provinces would soon have been exhausted of their wealth if the manufactures and commerce of luxury had not insensibly restored to the industrious subjects the sums which were extracted from them by the arms and authority of Rome. As long as the circulation was confined within the bounds of the empire, it impressed the political machine with a new degree of activity, and its consequences, sometimes beneficial, could never become pernicious. But it is no easy task to confine luxury within the limits of an empire. The most remote countries of the ancient world were ransacked to supply the pomp and delicacy of Rome. The forests of Scythia afforded some valuable furs amber was brought over land from the shores of the baltic to the danube and the barbarians were astonished at the price which they received in exchange for so useless a commodity there was a considerable demand for babylonian carpets and other manufactures of the east but the most important and unpopular branch of foreign trade was carried on with arabia and india 
every year about the time of the summer solstice a fleet of a hundred and twenty vessels sailed from mios hormos a port of egypt on the red sea by the periodical assistance of the monsoons they traversed the ocean in about forty days the coast of malabar or the island of ceylon was the usual term of their navigation and it was in those markets that the merchants from the more remote countries of asia expected their arrival the return of the fleet of egypt was fixed to the months of december or january and as soon as their rich cargo had been transported on the backs of camels from the red sea to the nile and had descended that river as far as alexandria it was poured without delay into the capital of the empire the objects of oriental traffic were splendid and trifling silk a pound of which was esteemed not inferior in value to a pound of gold precious stones among which the pearl claimed the first rank after the diamond and a variety of aromatics that were consumed in religious worship and the pomp of funerals the labor and risk of the voyage was rewarded with almost incredible profit but the profit was made upon roman subjects and a few individuals were enriched at the expense of the public as the natives of arabia and india were contented with the productions and manufacture of their own country silver on the side of the romans was the principal if not the only instrument of commerce it was a complaint worthy of the gravity of the senate that in the purchase of female ornaments the wealth of the state was irrevocably given away to foreign and hostile nations the annual loss is computed by a writer of an inquisitive but censorious temper at upwards of eight hundred thousand pounds sterling such was the style of discontent brooding over the dark prospect of approaching poverty and yet if we compare the proportion between gold and silver as it stood in the time of pliny and as it was fixed in the reign of constantine we shall discover within that period a very considerable increase there is not the least reason to suppose that gold was become more scarce it is therefore evident that silver was grown more common that whatever might be the amount of the indian and arabian exports they were far from exhausting the wealth of the roman world and that the produce of the mines abundantly supplied the demands of commerce notwithstanding the propensity of mankind to exalt the past and to depreciate the present the tranquil and prosperous state of the empire was warmly felt and honestly confessed by the provincials as well as rome they acknowledged that the true principles of social life laws agriculture and science which had been first invented by the wisdom of athens were now firmly established by the power of rome under whose auspicious influence the fiercest barbarians were united by an equal government and common language they affirmed that with the improvement of arts the human species were visibly multiplied they celebrate the increasing splendor of the cities the beautiful face of the country cultivated and adorned like an immense garden and the long festival of peace which was enjoyed by so many nations forgetful of the ancient animosities and delivered from the apprehension of future danger whatever suspicions may be suggested by the air of rhetoric and declamation which seems to prevail in these passages the substance of them is perfectly agreeable to historical truth it was scarcely possible that the eyes of contemporaries should discover in the public felicity the latent causes of decay and corruption this long peace and the uniform government of the romans introduced a slow and secret poison into the vitals of the empire the minds of men were gradually reduced to the same level the fire of genius was extinguished and even the military spirit evaporated the natives of europe were brave and robust spain gaul britain and illyricum supplied the legions with excellent soldiers and constituted the real strength of the monarchy their personal valor remained but they no longer possessed that public courage which is nourished by the love of independence the sense of national honor the presence of danger and the habit of command they received laws and governors from the will of their sovereign and trusted for their defense to a mercenary army the posterity of their boldest leaders was contented with the rank of citizens and subjects the most aspiring spirits resorted to the court or standard of the emperors and the deserted provinces deprived of political strength or union insensibly sunk into the languid indifference of private life the love of letters almost inseparable from peace and refinement was fashionable among the subjects of hadrian and the antonines who were themselves men of learning and curiosity it was diffused over the whole extent of their empire the most northern tribes of britons had acquired a taste for rhetoric 
Homer as well as Virgil were transcribed and studied on the banks of the Rhine and Danube, and the most liberal rewards sought out the faintest glimmerings of literary merit. The sciences of physic and astronomy were successfully cultivated by the Greeks. The observations of Ptolemy and the writings of Galen are studied by those who have improved their discoveries and corrected their errors. But if we accept the inimitable Lucian, this age of indolence passed away without having produced a single writer of original genius, or who excelled in the arts of elegant composition. The authority of Plato and Aristotle, of Zeno and Epicurus, still reigned in the schools and their systems, transmitted with blind deference from one generation of disciples to another, precluded every generous attempt to exercise the powers or enlarge the limits of the human mind. The beauties of the poets and orators, instead of kindling a fire like their own, inspired only cold and servile mitations, or if any ventured to deviate from these models, they deviated at the same time from good sense and propriety. On the revival of letters, the youthful vigor of the imagination, after a long repose, national emulation, a new religion, new languages, and a new world, called forth the genius of Europe. But the provincials of Rome, trained by a uniform artificial foreign education, were engaged in a very unequal competition with those bold ancients who, by expressing their genuine feelings in their native tongue, had already occupied every place of honor. The name of poet was almost forgotten that of orator was usurped by the sophists. A cloud of critics, of compilers, of commentators, darkened the face of learning, and the decline of genius was soon followed by the corruption of taste. The sublime Longinus, who, in somewhat a later period, and in the court of a Syrian queen, preserved the spirit of ancient Athens, observes and laments this degeneracy of his contemporaries, which debased their sentiments, enervated their courage, and depressed their talents. In the same manner, says he, as some children always remain pygmies, whose infant limbs have been too closely confined, thus our tender minds, fettered by the prejudices and habits of a just servitude, are unable to expand themselves, or to attain that well-proportioned greatness which we admire in the ancients, who, living under a populous government, wrote with the same freedom as they acted. This diminutive stature of mankind, if we pursue the metaphor, was daily sinking below the old standard, and the Roman world was indeed peopled by a race of pygmies, when the fierce giants of the north broke in and mended the puny breed. They restored a manly spirit of freedom, and after the revolution of ten centuries freedom became the happy parent of taste and science. End of Part 4《ハプニングの歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の The obvious definition of a monarchy seems to be that of a state in which a single person, by whatsoever name he may be distinguished, is entrusted with the execution of the laws, the management of the revenue, and the command of the army. But, unless public liberty is protected by intrepid and vigilant guardians, the authority of so formidable a magistrate will soon degenerate into despotism. The influence of the clergy, in an age of superstition, might be usefully employed to assert the rights of mankind, but so intimate is the connection between the throne and the altar that the banner of the church has very seldom been seen on the side of the people. A martial nobility and stubborn commons, possessed of arms, tenacious of property, and collected into constitutional assemblies, form the only balance capable of preserving a free constitution against enterprises of an aspiring prince. Every barrier of the Roman constitution had been leveled by the vast ambition of the dictator. Every fence had been extirpated by the cruel hand of the triumvir. After the victory of Actium, the fate of the Roman world depended on the will of Octavianus, surnamed Caesar by his uncle's adoption, and afterwards Augustus, by the flattery of the Senate. 
the conqueror was at the head of forty-four veteran legions conscious of their own strength and of the weakness of the constitution habituated during twenty years civil war to every act of blood and violence and passionately devoted to the house of caesar from whence alone they had received and expected the most lavish rewards the provinces long oppressed by the ministers of the republic sighed for the government of a single person who would be the master not the accomplice of those petty tyrants the people of rome viewing with a secret pleasure the humiliation of the aristocracy demanded only bread and public shows and were supplied with both by the liberal hand of augustus the rich and polite italians who had almost universally embraced the philosophy of epicurus enjoyed the present blessings of ease and tranquillity and suffered not the pleasing dream to be interrupted by the memory of their old tumultuous freedom with its power the senate had lost its dignity many of the most noble families were extinct the republicans of spirit and ability had perished in the field of battle or in the proscription the door of the assembly had been designedly left open for a mixed multitude of more than a thousand persons who reflected disgrace upon their rank instead of deriving honor from it the reformation of the senate was one of the first steps in which augustus laid aside the tyrant and professed himself the father of his country he was elected censor and in concert with his faithful agrippa he examined a list of the senators expelled a few members whose vices or whose obstinacy required a public example persuaded near two hundred to prevent the shame of an expulsion by a voluntary retreat raised the qualification of a senator to about ten thousand pounds created a sufficient number of patrician families and accepted for himself the honorable title of prince of the senate which had always been bestowed by the censors on the citizen most eminent for his honors and services but whilst he thus restored the dignity he destroyed the independence of the senate the principles of a free constitution are irrevocably lost when the legislative power is nominated by the executive before an assembly thus modelled and prepared augustus pronounced a studied oration which displayed his patriotism and disguised his ambition Quote, he lamented yet excused his past conduct filial piety had required at his hands the revenge of his father's murder the humanity of his own nature had sometimes given way to the stern laws of necessity and to a forced connection with two unworthy colleagues as long as antony lived the republic forbade him to abandon her to a degenerate roman and a barbarian queen he was now at liberty to satisfy his duty and his inclination he solemnly restored the senate and people to all their ancient rights and wished only to mingle with the crowd of his fellow-citizens and to share the blessings which he had obtained for his country it would require the pen of tacitus if tacitus had assisted at this assembly to describe the various emotions of the senate those that were suppressed and those that were affected it was dangerous to trust the sincerity of augustus to seem to distrust it was still more dangerous the respective advantages of monarchy and a republic have often divided speculative inquirers the present greatness of the roman state the corruption of manners and the license of the soldiers supplied new arguments to the advocates of monarchy and these general views of government were again warped by the hopes and fears of each individual amidst this confusion of sentiments the answer of the senate was unanimous and decisive they refused to accept the resignation of augustus they conjured him not to desert the republic which he had saved after a decent resistance the crafty tyrant submitted to the orders of the senate and consented to receive the government of the provinces and the general command of the roman armies under the well-known names of proconsul and imperator but he would receive them only for ten years even before the expiration of that period he hoped that the wounds of civil discord would be completely healed and that the republic restored to its pristine health and vigor would no longer require the dangerous interposition of so extraordinary a magistrate the memory of this comedy repeated several times during the life of augustus was preserved to the last ages of the empire by the peculiar pomp by which the perpetual monarchs of rome always solemnized the ten years of their reign without any violation of the principles of the constitution the general of the roman armies might receive and exercise an authority almost despotic over the soldiers the enemies and the subjects of the republic with regard to the soldiers the jealousy of freedom had even from the earliest ages of rome given way to the hopes of conquest and a just sense of military discipline 
The dictator, or consul, had a right to command the services of the Roman youth, and to punish an obstinate or cowardly disobedience by the most severe and ignominious penalties, by striking the offender out of the list of citizens, by confiscating his property, and by selling his person into slavery. The most sacred rights of freedom, confirmed by the Portian and Sempronian laws, were suspended by military engagement. In his camp the general exercised an absolute power of life and death, his jurisdiction was not confined by any forms of trial or rules of proceeding, and the execution of the sentence was immediate and without appeal. The choice of the enemies of Rome was regularly decided by the legislative authority. The most important resolutions of peace and war were seriously debated in the Senate, and solemnly ratified by the people. But, when the arms of the legions were carried to a great distance from Italy— the general assumed the liberty of directing them against whatever people and in whatever manner they judged most advantageous for the public service it was from the success not from the justice of their enterprises that they expected the honours of a triumph in the use of victory especially after they were no longer controlled by the commissioners of the senate they exercised the most unbounded despotism when pompey commanded in the east he rewarded his soldiers and allies dethroned princes divided kingdoms, founded colonies, and distributed the treasures of the Mithridates. On his return to Rome he obtained, by a single act of the Senate and people, the universal ratification of all his proceedings. Such was the power over the soldiers and over the enemies of Rome, which was either granted to or assumed by the generals of the Republic. They were, at the same time, the governors, or rather monarchs, of the conquered provinces, united the civil with the military character, administered justice as well as the finances, and exercised both the executive and legislative power of the state. From what has already been observed in the first chapter of this work, some notion may be formed of the armies and provinces thus entrusted to the ruling hand of Augustus. But, as it was impossible that he could personally command the regions of so many distant frontiers, he was indulged by the Senate, as Pompey had already been, in the permission of devolving the execution of his great office on a sufficient number of lieutenants. In rank and authority these officers seemed not inferior to the ancient proconsuls, but their station was dependent and precarious. They received and held their commissions at the will of a superior, to whose auspicious influence the merit of their action was legally attributed they were the representatives of the emperor the emperor alone was the general of the republic and his jurisdiction civil as well as military extended over all the conquests of rome it was some satisfaction however to the senate that he always delegated his power to the members of their body the imperial lieutenants were of consular or praetorian dignity the legions were commanded by senators and the prefecture of egypt was the only important trust committed to a roman knight Within six days after Augustus had been compelled to accept so very liberal a grant, he resolved to gratify the pride of the Senate by an easy sacrifice. He represented to them that they had enlarged his powers even beyond that degree which might be required by the melancholy condition of their times. They had not permitted him to refuse the laborious command of the armies and the frontiers, but he must insist on being allowed to restore the more peaceful and secure provinces to the mild administration of the civil magistrate. In the division of the provinces, Augustus provided for his own power and for the dignity of the Republic. The proconsuls of the Senate, particularly those of Asia, Greece, and Africa, enjoyed a more honorable character than the lieutenants of the emperor, who commanded in Gaul or Syria. The former were attended by lictors, the latter by soldiers. A law was passed that wherever the emperor was present, his extraordinary commission should supersede the ordinary jurisdiction of the governor, a custom was introduced that the new conquests belonged to the imperial portion, and it was soon discovered that the authority of the prince, the favorite epithet of Augustus, was the same in every part of the empire. In return for this imaginary concession, Augustus obtained an important privilege, which rendered him master of Rome and Italy. By a dangerous exception to the ancient maxims, he was authorized to preserve his military command, supported by a numerous body of guards, even in a time of peace, and in the heart of the capital. His command, indeed, was confined to those citizens who were engaged in the service by the military oath, but such was the propensity of the Romans to servitude that the oath was voluntarily taken by the magistrates, the senators, and the equestrian order, till the homage of flattery was insensibly converted into an annual and solemn protestation of fidelity. 
Although Augustus considered a military force as the firmest foundation, he wisely rejected it as a very odious instrument of government. It was more agreeable to his temper, as well as to his policy, to reign under the venerable names of ancient magistracy, and artfully to collect in his own person all the scattered rays of civil jurisdiction. With this in view, he permitted the Senate to confer upon him, for his life, the powers of the consular and tribunitian offices, which were, in the same manner, continued to all his successors. The consuls had succeeded to the kings of Rome, and represented the dignity of the state. They superintended the ceremonies of religion, levied and commanded the legions, gave audience to foreign ambassadors, and presided in the assemblies both of the Senate and people. The general control of the finances was entrusted to their care, and though they seldom had leisure to administer justice in person, they were considered as the supreme guardians of law, equity, and the public peace. Such was their ordinary jurisdiction. But whenever the Senate empowered the first magistrate to consult the safety of the commonwealth, he was raised by that decree above the laws, and exercised, in the defense of liberty, a temporary despotism. The character of the tribunes was, in every respect, different from that of the consuls. The appearance of the former was modest and humble, but their persons were sacred and inviolable. Their force was suited rather for opposition than for action. They were instituted to defend the oppressed, to pardon offenses, to arraign the enemies of the people, and, when they judged it necessary, to stop, by a single word, the whole machine of government. As long as the Republic subsisted, the dangerous influence which either the council or the tribune might derive from their respective jurisdiction was diminished by several important restrictions. Their authority expired with the year in which they were elected. The former office was divided between two, the latter among ten persons, and, as both in their private and public interest they were averse to each other, their mutual conflicts contributed, for the most part, to strengthen rather than to destroy the balance of the Constitution. But, when the consular and tribunitian powers were united, when they were vested for life in a single person, when the general of the army was, at the same time, the minister of the Senate and the representative of the Roman people, it was impossible to resist the exercise, nor was it easy to define the limits, of his imperial prerogative. To these accumulated honors, the policy of Augustus soon added the splendid as well as important dignities of supreme pontiff and of censor. By the former he acquired the management of the religion, and by the latter a legal inspection over the manners and fortunes of the Roman people. If so many distinct and independent powers did not exactly unite with each other, the complacence of the Senate was prepared to supply every deficiency by the most ample and extraordinary concessions. The emperors, as the first ministers of the Republic, were exempted from the obligation and penalty of many inconvenient laws. They were authorized to convoke the Senate, to make several motions in the same day, to recommend candidates for the honors of the state, to enlarge the bounds of the city, to employ the revenue at their discretion, to declare peace and war, to ratify treaties, and, by a most comprehensive clause, they were empowered to execute whatsoever they should judge advantageous to the empire and agreeable to the majesty of things private or public, human or divine. When all the various powers of executive government were committed to the imperial magistrate, the ordinary magistrates of the commonwealth languished in obscurity, without vigor, and almost without business. The names and forms of the ancient administration were preserved by Augustus with the most anxious care. The usual number of consuls, praetors, and tribunes were annually invested with their respective ensigns of office, and continued to discharge some of their least important functions. Those honors still attracted the vain ambition of the Romans, and the emperors themselves, though invested for life with the powers of the consulship, frequently aspired to the title of that annual dignity which they condescended to share with the most illustrious of their fellow citizens. In the election of these magistrates, the people, during the reign of Augustus, were permitted to expose all the inconveniences of a wild democracy. That artful prince, instead of discovering the least symptom of impatience, humbly solicited their suffrages for himself or his friends, and scrupulously practised all the duties of an ordinary candidate. But we may venture to ascribe to his counsels the first measure of the succeeding reign, by which the elections were transferred to the Senate. The assemblies of the people were forever abolished, and the emperors were delivered from a dangerous multitude who, without restoring liberty, might have disturbed and perhaps endangered the established government. By declaring themselves the protectors of the people, Marius and Caesar had subverted the constitution of their country. 
But as soon as the Senate had been humbled and disarmed, such an assembly, consisting of five or six hundred persons, was found a much more tractable and useful instrument of dominion. It was on the dignity of the Senate that Augustus and his successors founded their new empire, and they affected, on every occasion, to adopt the language and principles of patricians. In the administration of their own powers, they frequently consulted the great national council, and seemed to refer to its decisions the most important concerns of peace and war. Rome, Italy, and the internal provinces were subject to the immediate jurisdiction of the Senate. With regard to civil objects, it was the supreme court of appeal. With regard to criminal matters, a tribunal, constituted for the trial of all offenses that were committed by men in any public station, or that affected the peace and majesty of the Roman people. The exercise of the judicial power became the most frequent and serious occupation of the Senate, and the important causes that were pleaded before them afforded a last refuge to the spirit of ancient eloquence. As a council of state, and as a court of justice, the Senate possessed very considerable prerogatives. But, in its legislative capacity, in which it was supposed virtually to represent the people, the rights of sovereignty were acknowledged to reside in that assembly. Every power was derived from their authority every law was ratified by their sanction their regular meetings were held on three stated days in every month the calends the nones and the ides the debates were conducted with decent freedom and the emperors themselves who gloried in the name of senators sat voted and divided with their equals to resume in a few words the system of imperial government as it was instituted by Augustus, and maintained by those princes who understood their own interest and that of the people, it may be defined an absolute monarchy disguised by the forms of a commonwealth. The masters of the Roman world surrounded their throne with darkness, concealed their irresistible strength, and humbly professed themselves the accountable ministers of the Senate, whose supreme decrees they dictated and obeyed. The face of the court corresponded with the forms of the administration. The emperors, if we accept those tyrants whose capricious folly violated every law of nature and decency, disdained the pomp and ceremony which might offend their countrymen but could add nothing to their real power. In all the offices of life they affected to confound themselves with their subjects, and maintained with them an equal intercourse of visit and entertainments. Their habit, their palace, their table, were suited only to the rank of an opulent senator. Their family, however numerous or splendid, was composed entirely of their domestic slaves and freedmen. Augustus or Trajan would have blushed at employing the meanest of Romans in those menial offices which, in the household and bedchamber of a limited monarch, are so eagerly solicited by the proudest nobles of Britain. The deification of the emperors is the only instance in which they departed from their accustomed prudence and modesty. The Asiatic Greeks were the first inventors and successors of Alexander the first objects of this servile and impious mode of adulation. It was easily transferred from the kings to the governors of Asia, and the Roman magistrates very frequently were adored as provincial deities with the pomp of altars and temples, of festivals and sacrifices. It was natural that the emperors should not refuse what the proconsuls had accepted, and the divine honors which both the one and the other received from the provinces attested rather the despotism than the servitude of Rome. But the conquerors soon imitated the vanquished nations in the arts of flattery, and the imperious spirit of the first Caesar too easily consented to assume, during his lifetime, a place among the tutelar deities of Rome. The milder temper of his successor declined so dangerous an ambition which was never afterwards revived, except by the madness of Caligula and Domitian. Augustus permitted, indeed, some of the provincial cities to erect temples to his honor, on condition that they should associate the worship of Rome with that of the sovereign. He tolerated private superstition, of which he might be the object, but he contented himself with being revered by the Senate and the people in his human character, and wisely left to his successor the care of his public deification. A regular custom was introduced that on the decease of every emperor who had neither lived nor died like a tyrant, the senate, by a solemn decree, would place him in the number of the gods, and the ceremonies of his apotheosis were blended with those of his funeral. This legal, and, it would seem, injudicious profanation, so abhorrent to their stricter principles, was received with a very faint murmur by the easy nature of polytheism. But it was received as an institution not of religion, but of policy. We should disgrace the virtues of the Antonines by comparing them with the vices of Hercules or Jupiter. 
Even the characters of Caesar or Augustus were far superior to those of the popular deities. But it was the misfortune of the former to live in the enlightened age, and their actions were too faithfully recorded to admit of such a mixture of fable and mystery as the devotion of the vulgar requires. As soon as their divinity was established by law, it sunk into oblivion, without contributing either to their own fame or to the dignity of succeeding princes. In the consideration of the imperial government, we have frequently mentioned the artful founder, under his well-known title of Augustus, which was not, however, conferred upon him till the edifice was almost completed. The obscure name of Octavianus he derived from a mean family in the little town of Aricia. It was stained with the blood of the proscription, and he was desirous, had it been possible, to erase all memory of his former life. The illustrious surname of Caesar he had assumed, as the adopted son of the dictator, but he had too much good sense either to hope to be confounded or to wish to be compared with that extraordinary man it was proposed in the senate to dignify their minister with a new appellation and after a serious discussion that of augustus was chosen among several others as being the most expressive of the character of peace and sanctity which he uniformly affected augustus was therefore a personal caesar a family distinction the former should naturally have expired with the prince on whom it was bestowed and however the latter was diffused by adoption and female alliance, Nero was the last prince who could allege any hereditary claim to the honors of the Julian line. But, at the time of his death, the practice of a century had inseparably connected those appellations with the imperial dignity, and they have been preserved by a long succession of emperors, Romans, Greeks, Franks, and Germans, from the fall of the Republic to the present time. A distinction was, however, soon introduced. The sacred title of Augustus was always reserved for the monarch, whilst the name of Caesar was more freely communicated to his relations, and, from the reign of Hadrian at least, was appropriated to the second person in the state, who was considered as the presumptive heir of the empire. End of chapter 3, part 1《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》《ハッチャー2》The tender respect of Augustus for a free constitution which he had destroyed can only be explained by an attentive consideration of the character of that subtle tyrant. A cool head, an unfeeling heart, and a cowardly disposition prompted him at the age of nineteen to assume the mask of hypocrisy which he never afterwards laid aside. With the same hand, and probably with the same temper, he signed the proscription of Cicero and the pardon of Cinna. His virtues, and even his vices, were artificial, and according to the various dictates of his interest, he was at first the enemy, and at last the father of the Roman world. When he framed the artful system of the imperial authority, his moderation was inspired by his fears. He wished to deceive the people by an image of civil liberty, and the armies by an image of civil government. 1. The death of Caesar was ever before his eyes. He had lavished wealth and honors on his adherents, but the most favored friends of his uncle were in the number of the conspirators. The fidelity of the legions might defend his authority against open rebellion, but their vigilance could not secure his person from the dagger of a determined republican, and the Romans, who revered the memory of Brutus, would applaud the imitation of his virtue. Caesar had provoked his fate, as much as by the ostentation of his power as by his power itself. The consul or the tribune might have reigned in peace. The title of king had armed the Romans against his life. Augustus was sensible that mankind is governed by names, nor was he deceived in his expectation that the senate and people would submit to slavery, provided they were respectfully assured that they still enjoyed their ancient freedom. A feeble senate and an enervated people cheerfully acquiesced in the pleasing illusion, as long as it was supported by the virtue or even by the prudence of the successors of Augustus. It was a motive of self-preservation, not a principle of liberty, that animated the conspirators against Caligula, Nero, and Domitian. They attacked the person of the tyrant, without aiming their blow at the authority of the emperor. 
There appears indeed one memorable occasion in which the Senate, after seventy years of patience, made an ineffectual attempt to reassume its long-forgotten rights. When the throne was vacant by the murder of Caligula, the consuls convoked that assembly in the capital, condemned the memory of the Caesars, gave the watchword liberty to the few cohorts who faintly adhered to their standard, and, during the eight and forty hours, acted as the independent chiefs of a free commonwealth. But, while they deliberated, the Praetorian guards had resolved. The stupid Claudius, brother of Germanicus, was already in their camp, invested with the imperial purple, and prepared to support his election by arms. The dream of liberty was at an end, and the Senate awoke to all the horrors of inevitable servitude. Deserted by the people, and threatened by a military force, that feeble assembly was compelled to ratify the choice of the Praetorians, and to embrace the benefit of amnesty, which Claudius had the prudence to offer, and the generosity to observe. Note. See the capital. When the throne was vacant by the murder of Caligula, the consuls convoked that assembly in the capital. End note. 2. The insolence of the armies inspired Augustus with fears of a still more alarming nature. The despair of the citizens could only attempt what the power of the soldiers was at any time able to execute. How precarious was his own authority over men whom he had taught to violate every social duty! He had heard their seditious clamors. He dreaded their calmer moments of reflection. One revolution had been purchased by immense rewards, but a second revolution might double those rewards." The troops professed the fondest attachment to the house of Caesar, but the attachments of the multitude are capricious and inconstant. Augustus summoned to his aid whatever remained in those fierce minds of the Roman prejudices, enforced the rigor of discipline by the sanction of law, and, interposing the majesty of the Senate between the emperor and the army, boldly claimed their allegiance as the first magistrate of the Republic." During a long period of two hundred and twenty years from the establishment of this artful system to the death of Commodus, the dangers inherent to a military government were, in a great measure, suspended. The soldiers were seldom roused to that fatal sense of their own strength, and of the weakness of the civil authority, which was, before and afterwards, productive of such dreadful calamities. Caligula and Domitian were assassinated in their palace by their own domestics. The convulsions which agitated Rome on the death of the former were confined to the walls of the city. But Nero involved the whole empire in his ruin. In the space of eighteen months, four princes perished by the sword, and the Roman world was shaken by the fury of the contending armies. Excepting only this short, though violent eruption of military license, the two centuries from Augustus to Commodus passed away unstained with civil blood and undisturbed by revolutions. The emperor was elected by the authority of the senate and the consent of the soldiers. The legions respected their oath of fidelity, and it requires a minute inspection of the Roman annals to discover three inconsiderable rebellions, which were all suppressed in a few months, and without even the hazard of a battle. In elective monarchies, the vacancy of the throne is a moment big with danger and mischief. The Roman emperors, desirous to spare the legions that interval of suspense and the temptation of an irregular choice, invested their designed successor with so large a share of present power as should enable him, after their decease, to assume the remainder without suffering the empire to perceive the change of masters. Thus Augustus, after all his fairer prospects had been snatched from him by untimely deaths, rested his last hopes on Tiberius, obtained for his adopted son the censorial and tribunician powers, and dictated a law by which the future prince was invested with an authority equal to his own over the provinces and the armies. Thus Vespasian subdued the generous mind of his eldest son. Titus was adored by the eastern legions, which, under his command, had recently achieved the conquest of Judea. His power was dreaded, and, as his virtues were clouded by the intemperance of youth, his designs were suspected. Instead of listening to such unworthy suspicion, the prudent monarch associated Titus to the full powers of the imperial dignity, and the grateful son ever approved himself the humble and faithful minister of so indulgent a father. The good sense of Vespasian engaged him indeed to embrace every measure that might confirm his recent and precarious elevation. 
the military oath and the fidelity of the troops had been consecrated by the habits of a hundred years to the name and family of the caesars and although that family had been continued only by the fictitious right of adoption the romans still revered in the person of nero the grandson of germanicus and the lineal successor of augustus it was not without reluctance and remorse that the praetorian guards had been persuaded to abandon the cause of the tyrant the rapid downfall of galba otho and vitellius taught the armies to consider the emperors as the creatures of their will and the instruments of their license the birth of vespasian was mean his grandfather had been a private soldier his father a petty officer of the revenue his own merit had raised him in an advanced age to the empire but his merit was rather useful than shining and his virtues were disgraced by a strict and even sordid parsimony such a prince consulted his true interest by the association of a son whose more splendid and amiable character might turn the public attention from the obscure origin to the future glories of the flavian house under the mild administration of titus the roman world enjoyed a transient felicity and his beloved memory served to protect above fifteen years the vices of his brother domitian nerva had scarcely accepted the purple from the assassins of domitian before he discovered that his feeble age was unable to stem the torrent of public disorders which had multiplied under the long tyranny of his predecessor his mild disposition was respected by the good but the degenerate romans required a more vigorous character whose justice should strike terror into the guilty though he had several relations he fixed his choice on a stranger he adopted trajan then about forty years of age who commanded a powerful army in the lower germany and immediately by decree of the senate declared him his colleague and successor in the empire it is sincerely to be lamented that whilst we are fatigued with the disgustful relation of nero's crimes and follies we are reduced to collect the actions of trajan from the glimmerings of an abridgment or the doubtful light of a panegyric there remains however one panegyric far removed beyond the suspicion of flattery above two hundred and fifty years after the death of trajan the senate in pouring out the customary acclamations on the accession of a new emperor wished that he might surpass the felicity of augustus and the virtue of trajan we may readily believe that the father of his country hesitated whether he ought to entrust the various and doubtful character of his kinsman hadrian with sovereign power in his last moments the arts of the empress plotina either fixed the irresolution of trajan or boldly supposed a fictitious adoption the truth of which could not be safely disputed and hadrian was peaceably acknowledged as his lawful successor under his reign as had been already mentioned the empire flourished in peace and prosperity he encouraged the arts reformed the laws asserted military discipline and visited all his provinces in person his vast and active genius was equally suited to the most enlarged views and the minute details of civil policy but the ruling passions of his soul were curiosity and vanity as they prevailed and as they were attracted by different objects hadrian was by turns an excellent prince a ridiculous sophist and a jealous tyrant the general tenor of his conduct deserved praise for its equity and moderation yet in the first days of his reign he put to death four councillor senators his personal enemies and men who had been judged worthy of empire and the tediousness of a painful illness rendered him at last peevish and cruel the senate doubted whether they should pronounce him a god or a tyrant and the honors decreed to his memory were granted to the prayers of the pious antoninus the caprice of hadrian influenced his choice of a successor after revolving in his mind several men of distinguished merit whom he esteemed and hated he adopted aelius verus a gay and voluptuous nobleman recommended by uncommon beauty to the lover of antoninus but whilst hadrian was delighting himself with his own applause and the acclamations of the soldiers whose consent had been secured by an immense donative the new caesar was ravished from his embraces by an untimely death he left only one son hadrian commended the boy to the gratitude of the antonines he was adopted by pius and on the accession of marcus was invested with an equal share of sovereign power among the many vices of this younger verus he possessed one virtue a dutiful reverence to his wiser colleague to whom he willingly abandoned the ruder cares of empire the philosophic emperor dissembled his follies lamented his early death and cast a decent veil over his memory as soon as hadrian's passion was either gratified or disappointed he resolved to deserve the thanks of posterity by placing the most exalted merit on the roman throne 
his discerning eye easily discovered a senator about fifty years of age, blameless in all the offices of life, and a youth of about seventeen, whose riper years opened a fair prospect of every virtue. The elder of these was declared the son and successor of Hadrian, on condition, however, that he himself should immediately adopt the younger. The two Antonines, for it is of them we are now speaking, governed the Roman world forty-two years with the same invariable spirit of wisdom and virtue. Although Pius had two sons, he preferred the welfare of Rome to the interest of his family, gave his daughter Faustina in marriage to young Marcus, obtained from the Senate the tribunician and proconsular powers, and, with a noble disdain, or rather ignorance of jealousy, associated him to all the labors of government. Marcus, on the other hand, revered the character of his benefactor, loved him as a parent, obeyed him as his sovereign, and, after he was no more, regulated his own administration by the example and maxims of his predecessor. Their united reigns are possibly the only period of history in which the happiness of a great people was the sole object of government. Titus Antoninus Pius has been justly denominated a second Numa. The same love of religion, justice, and peace was the distinguishing characteristic of both princes, but the situation of the latter opened a much larger field for the exercise of those virtues. Numa could only prevent a few neighboring villages from plundering each other's harvests. Antoninus diffused order and tranquillity over the greatest part of the earth. His reign is marked by the rare advantage of furnishing very few materials for history, which is indeed little more than the register of crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind. In private life, he was an amiable as well as a good man. The native simplicity of his virtue was a stranger to vanity or affectation. He enjoyed with moderation the conveniences of his fortune and the innocent pleasures of society, and the benevolence of his soul displayed itself in a cheerful serenity of temper. The virtue of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus was of a severer and more laborious kind. It was the well-earned harvest of many a learned conference, of many a patient lecture, and many a midnight lucubration. At the age of twelve years he embraced the rigid system of the Stoics, which taught him to submit his body to his mind, his passions to his reason, to consider virtue as the only good, vice as the only evil, all things external as things indifferent. His meditations, composed in the tumult of camp, are still extant, and he even condescended to give lessons of philosophy in a more public manner than was perhaps consistent with the modesty of a sage or the dignity of an emperor. But his life was the noblest commentary on the precepts of Zeno. He was severe to himself, indulgent to the imperfection of others, just and beneficent to all mankind. He regretted that Avidius Cassius, who excited a rebellion in Syria, had disappointed him by a voluntary death of the pleasure of converting an enemy to a friend, and he justified the sincerity of that sentiment by moderating the zeal of the Senate against the adherence of the traitor. War he detested, as the disgrace and calamity of human nature, but when the necessity of a just defense called upon him to take up arms, he readily exposed his person to eight winter campaigns on the frozen banks of the Danube, the severity of which was at last fatal to the weakness of his constitution. His memory was revered by a grateful posterity, and above a century after his death many persons preserved the image of Marcus Antoninus among those of their household gods. If a man were called to fix the period in the history of the world during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous, he would, without hesitation, name that which elapsed from the death of Domitian to the accession of Commodus. The vast extent of the Roman Empire was governed by absolute power, under the guidance of virtue and wisdom. The armies were restrained by the firm but gentle hand of four successive emperors whose characters and authority commanded involuntary respect. The forms of the civil administration were carefully preserved by Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and the Antonines, who delighted in the image of liberty and were pleased with considering themselves as the accountable ministers of the laws. Such princes deserved the honor of restoring the Republic, had the Romans of their days been capable of enjoying a rational freedom. The labors of these monarchs were overpaid by the immense reward that inseparably waited on their success, by the honest pride of virtue, and by the exquisite delight of beholding the general happiness of which they were the authors. A just but melancholy reflection embittered, however, the noblest of human enjoyments. They must often have recollected the instability of a happiness which depended on the character of a single man. 
The fatal moment was perhaps approaching when some licentious youth or some jealous tyrant would abuse to the destruction that absolute power which they had exerted for the benefit of their people. The ideal restraints of the Senate and the laws might serve to display the virtues, but could never correct the vices of the emperor. The military force was a blind and irresistible instrument of oppression, and the corruption of Roman manners would always supply flatterers eager to applaud, and ministers prepared to serve, the fear or the avarice, the lust or the cruelty of their masters. These gloomy apprehensions had been already justified by the experience of the Romans. The annals of the emperors exhibit a strong and various picture of human nature, which we should vainly seek among the mixed and doubtful characters of modern history. In the conduct of those monarchs we may trace the utmost lines of vice and virtue, the most exalted perfection, and the meanest degeneracy of our own species. The golden age of Trajan and the Antonines had been preceded by an age of iron. It is almost superfluous to enumerate the unworthy successors of Augustus. Their unparalleled vices and the splendid theater on which they were acted have saved them from oblivion. The dark, unrelenting Tiberius, the furious Caligula, the feeble Claudius, the profligate and cruel Nero, the beastly Vitellius, and the timid, inhuman Domitian are condemned to everlasting infamy. During fourscore years, excepting only the short and doubtful respite of Vespasian's reign, Rome groaned beneath the unremitting tyranny which exterminated the ancient families of the Republic and was fatal to almost every virtue and every talent that arose in that unhappy period. Under the reign of these monsters, the slavery of the Romans was accompanied by two peculiar circumstances, the one occasioned by their former liberty, the other by their extensive conquests, which rendered their condition more completely wretched than that of the victims of tyranny in any other age or country. From these causes were derived, one, the exquisite sensibility of the sufferers, and two, the impossibility of escaping from the hand of the oppressor. One. When Persia was governed by the descendants of Sephi, the race of princes whose wanton cruelty often stained their divan, their table, and their bed with the blood of their favorites, there is a saying recorded of a young nobleman that he never departed from the sultan's presence without satisfying himself whether his head was still on his shoulders. The experience of every day might almost justify the skepticism of Rustan, yet the fatal sword, suspended above him by a single thread, seems not to have disturbed the slumbers or interrupted the tranquillity of the Persian. The monarch's frown, he well knew, could level him with the dust, but the stroke of lightning or apoplexy might be equally fatal, and it was the part of a wise man to forget the inevitable calamities of human life in the enjoyment of the fleeting hour. He was dignified with the appellation of the king's slave, had perhaps been purchased from obscure parents in a country which he had never known, and was trained up from his infancy in the severe discipline of the seraglio. His name, his wealth, his honors were the gift of a master who might, without injustice, resume what he had bestowed. Rustan's knowledge, if he possessed any, could only serve to confirm his habits by prejudices. His language afforded not words for any form of government except absolute monarchy. The history of the East informed him that such had ever been the condition of humankind. The Koran and the interpreters of that divine book inculcated to him that the Sultan was the descendant of the Prophet and the vicegerent of heaven, that patience was the first virtue of a Muslim and unlimited obedience the great duty of a subject. The minds of the Romans were very differently prepared for slavery. Oppressed beneath the weight of their own corruption and of military violence, they, for a long while, preserved the sentiments, or at least the ideas, of their free-born ancestors. The education of Helvidius and Thracia, of Tacitus and Pliny, was the same as that of Cato and Cicero. From Grecian philosophy they had imbibed the justest and most liberal notions of the dignity of human nature and the origin of civil society. The history of their own country had taught them to revere a free, a virtuous, and a victorious commonwealth, to adhor the successful crimes of Caesar and Augustus, and inwardly to despise those tyrants whom they adored with the same abject flattery. As magistrates and senators, they were admitted into the great council, which had once dictated laws to the earth, whose authority was so often prostituted to the vilest purposes of tyranny. Tiberius, and those emperors who adopted his maxims, attempted to disguise their murders by the formalities of justice, and perhaps enjoyed a secret pleasure in rendering the Senate their accomplice as well as their victim. 
By this assembly, the last of the Romans were condemned for imaginary crimes and real virtues. Their infamous accusers assumed the language of independent patriots, who arraigned a dangerous citizen before the tribunal of his country, and the public service was rewarded by riches and honors. The servile judges professed to assert the majesty of the commonwealth, violated the person of its first magistrate, whose clemency they most applauded when they trembled the most at his inexorable and impending cruelty. The tyrant beheld their baseness with just contempt, and encountered their secret sentiments of detestation with sincere and avowed hatred for the whole body of the Senate. 2. The division of Europe into a number of independent states, connected, however, with each other by the general resemblance of religion, language, and manners, is productive of the most beneficial consequences to the liberty of mankind. A modern tyrant, who should find no resistance either in his own breast or in his people, would soon experience a gentle restraint from the example of his equals, the dread of present censure, the advice of his allies, and the apprehension of his enemies. The object of his displeasure, escaping from the narrow limits of his dominions, would easily obtain, in a happier climate, a secret refuge, a new fortune adequate to his merit, the freedom of complaint, and perhaps the means of revenge. But the empire of the Romans filled the world, and when the empire fell into the hands of a single person, the world became a safe and dreary prison for his enemies. The slave of imperial despotism, whether he was condemned to drag his gilded chain in Rome in the Senate, or were to live out a life of exile on the barren rock of Seraphis, or the frozen bank of the Danube, expected his fate in silent despair. To resist was fatal, and it was impossible to fly. On every side he was encompassed with a vast extent of sea and land, which he could never hope to traverse without being discovered, seized, and restored to his irritated master. Beyond the frontiers, his anxious view could discover nothing, except the ocean, inhospitable deserts, hostile tribes of barbarians, of fierce manners and unknown language, or dependent kings who would gladly purchase the emperor's protection by the sacrifice of an obnoxious fugitive. "'Wherever you are,' said Cicero to the exiled Marcellus, "'remember that you are equally within the power of the conqueror.'" End of Chapter 3, Part 2 Chapter 4, Part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire Volume 1 by Edward Gibbon Chapter 4 the Cruelty, Follies, and Murder of Commodus Part 1 Contents The Cruelty, Follies, and Murder of Commodus Election of Pertinax His Attempts to Reform the State His Assassination by the Praetorian Guards The mildness of Marcus, which the rigid discipline of the Stoics was unable to eradicate, formed at the same time the most amiable and the only defective part of his character. His excellent understanding was often deceived by the unsuspecting goodness of his heart. Artful men who study the passions of princes and conceal their own approached his person in the disguise of philosophic sanctity and acquired riches and honours by affecting to despise them. His excessive indulgence to his brother his wife and his son, exceeded the bounds of private virtue and became a public injury by the example and consequences of their vices. Faustina, the daughter of Pius and wife of Marcus, has been as much celebrated for her gallantries as for her beauty. The grave simplicity of the philosopher was ill-calculated to engage her wanton levity or to fix that unbounded passion for variety, which often discovered personal merit in the meanest of mankind. The Cupid of the ancients was, in general, a very sensual deity, and the armours of an empress, as they exact on her side the plainest advances, are seldom susceptible of much sentimental delicacy. Marcus was the only man in the empire who seemed ignorant or insensible, of the irregularities of Faustina, 
which, according to the prejudices of every age, reflected some disgrace on the injured husband. He promoted several of her lovers to posts of honour and profit, and during a connection of thirty years invariably gave her proofs of the most tender confidence, and of a respect which ended not with her life. In his meditations he thanks the gods, who had bestowed on him a wife so faithful, so gentle, and of such a wonderful simplicity of manners. The obsequious senate, at his earnest request, declared her a goddess. She was represented in her temples with the attributes of Juno, Venus, and Ceres, and it was decreed that, on the day of their nuptials, the youth of either sex should pay their vows before the altar of their chaste patroness. The monstrous vices of the son have cast a shade on the purity of the father's virtues. It has been objected to Marcus that he sacrificed the happiness of millions to a fond partiality for a worthless boy, and that he chose a successor in his own family rather than in the Republic. Nothing, however, was neglected by the anxious father and by the men of virtue and learning whom he summoned to his assistance, to expand the narrow mind of young Commodus, to correct his growing vices, and to render him worthy of the throne for which he was designed. But the power of instruction is seldom of much efficacy, except in those happy dispositions where it is almost superfluous. The distasteful lesson of a grave philosopher was in a moment obliterated by the whisper of a profligate favourite, and Marcus himself blasted the fruits of his laboured education by admitting his son, at the age of fourteen or fifteen, to a full participation of the imperial power. He lived but four years afterwards, but he lived long enough to repent a rash measure, which raised the impetuous youth above the restraint of reason and authority. Most of the crimes which disturb the internal peace of society are produced by the restraints which the necessary but unequal laws of property have imposed on the appetites of mankind, by confining to a few the possession of those objects that are coveted by many. Of all our passions and appetites, the love of power is the most imperious and unsociable nature, since the pride of one man requires the submission of the multitude. In the tumult of civil discord, the laws of society lose their force, and their place is seldom supplied by those of humanity. The ardour of contention, the pride of victory, the despair of success, the memory of past injuries, and the fear of future dangers, all contribute to inflame the mind and to silence the voice of pity. From such motives, almost every page of history has been stained with civil blood, but these motives will not account for the unprovoked cruelties of Commodus, who had nothing to wish and everything to enjoy. The beloved son of Marcus succeeded to his father amidst the acclamations of the senate and armies, and when he ascended the throne, the happy youth saw round him neither competitor to remove nor enemies to punish. In this calm, elevated station, it was surely natural that he should prefer the love of mankind to their detestation, the mild glories of his five predecessors, to the ignominious fate of Nero and Domitian. Yet Commodus was not, as he had been represented, a tiger born with an insatiate thirst of human blood, and capable, from his infancy, of the most inhuman actions. Nature had formed him of a weak rather than a wicked disposition. His simplicity and timidity rendered him the slave of his attendants, who gradually corrupted his mind. His cruelty, which at first obeyed the dictates of others, degenerated into habit, and at length became the ruling passion of his soul. Upon the death of his father, Commodus found himself embarrassed with the command of a great army, and the conduct of a difficult war against the Quadi and the Marcomanni. The servile and profligate youths, 
whom Marcus had banished, soon regained their station and influence about the new emperor. They exaggerated the hardships and dangers of a campaign in the wild countries beyond the Danube, and they assured the indolent prince that the terror of his name and the arms of his lieutenants would be sufficient to complete the conquest of the dismayed barbarians, or to impose such conditions as were more advantageous than any conquest. By a dexterous application to his sensual appetites, they compared the tranquillity, the splendour, the refined pleasures of Rome, with the tumult of a Pannonian camp, which afforded neither leisure nor materials for luxury. Commodus listened to the pleasing advice, but whilst he hesitated between his own inclination and the awe which he still retained for his father's counsellors, the summer insensibly collapsed, and his triumphal entry into the capital was deferred till the autumn. His graceful person, popular address, and imagined virtues attracted the public favour. The honourable peace which he had recently granted to the barbarians diffused a universal joy. His impatience to revisit Rome was fondly ascribed to the love of his country, and his dissolute course of amusements was faintly condemned in a prince of nineteen years of age. During the three first years of his reign, the forms and even the spirit of the old administration were maintained by those faithful counsellors to whom Marcus had recommended his son, and for whose wisdom and integrity Commodus still entertained a reluctant esteem. The young prince and his profligate favourites revelled in all the licence of sovereign power, but his hands were yet unstained with blood, and he had even displayed a generosity of sentiment, which might perhaps have ripened into solid virtue. A fatal incident decided his fluctuating character. One evening, as the emperor was returning to the palace, through a dark and narrow portico in the amphitheatre, an assassin, who waited his passage, rushed upon him with a drawn sword, loudly exclaiming, "'The Senate sends you this!' The menace prevented the deed. The assassin was seized by the guards, and immediately revealed the authors of the conspiracy. It had been formed not in the state, but within the walls of the palace. Lucilla, the emperor's sister and widow of Lucius Verus, impatient of the second rank and jealous of the reigning empress, had armed the murderer against her brother's life. She had not ventured to communicate the black design to her second husband, Claudius Pompeius, a senator of distinguished merit and unshaken loyalty, but among the crowd of her lovers, for she imitated the manners of Faustina, she found men of desperate fortunes and wild ambition, who were prepared to serve her more violent as well as her tender passions. The conspirators experienced the rigour of justice, and the abandoned princess was punished first with exile and afterwards with death. But the words of the assassin sunk deep into the mind of Commodus, and left an indelible impression of fear and hatred against the whole body of the Senate. Those whom he had dreaded as importunate ministers, he now suspected as secret enemies. The delators, a race of men discouraged and almost extinguished under the former reigns, again became formidable, as soon as they discovered that the emperor was desirous of finding disaffection and treason in the senate. That assembly, whom Marcus had ever considered as the great council of the nation, was composed of the most distinguished of the Romans, and distinction of every kind soon became criminal. The possession of wealth stimulated the diligence of the informers. Rigid virtue implied a tacit censure, of the irregularities of Commodus, important services implied a dangerous superiority of merit, and the friendship of the father always ensured the aversion of the son. Suspicion was equivalent to proof, trial to condemnation. The execution of a considerable senator was attended with the death of all who might lament or revenge his fate. And when Commodus had once tasted human blood, he became incapable of pity or remorse. 
In those innocent victims of tyranny, none died more lamented than the two brothers of the Quintilian family, Maximus and Condianus, whose fraternal love had saved their names from oblivion and endeared their memory to posterity. Their studies and their occupations, their pursuits and their pleasures were still the same. In the enjoyment of a great estate they never admitted the idea of a separate interest. Some fragments are now extant of a treatise which they composed in common, and in every action of life it was observed that their two bodies were animated by one soul. The Antonines, who valued their virtues and delighted in their union, raised them in the same year to the consulship and Marcus afterwards entrusted to their joint care the civil administration of Greece and a great military command, in which they obtained a signal victory over the Germans. The kind cruelty of Commodus united them in death. The tyrant's rage, after having shed the noblest blood of the Senate, at length recoiled on the principal instrument of his cruelty. Whilst Commodus was immersed in blood and luxury, he devolved the detail of the public business on Perennis, a servile and ambitious minister, who had obtained his post by the murder of his predecessor, but who possessed a considerable share of vigour and ability. By acts of extortion, and the forfeited estates of the nobles, sacrificed to his avarice, he had accumulated an immense treasure. The Praetorian guards were under his immediate command, and his son, who already discovered a military genius, was at the head of the Illyrian legions. Perennis aspired to the empire, or what in the eyes of Commodus amounted to the same crime, he was capable of aspiring to it, had he not been prevented, surprised, and put to death. The fall of a minister is a very trifling incident in the general history of the empire, but it was hastened by an extraordinary circumstance which proved how much the nerves of discipline were already relaxed. The legions of Britain, contented with the administration of Perennis, formed a deputation of fifteen hundred select men, with instructions to march to Rome and lay their complaints before the emperor. These military petitioners, by their own determined behaviour, by inflaming the divisions of the guards, by exaggerating the strength of the British army, and by alarming the fears of Commodius, exacted and obtained the minister's death, as the only redress of their grievances. This presumption of a distant army, and their discovery of the weakness of government, was a sure presage of the most dreadful convulsions. The negligence of the public administration was betrayed, soon afterwards, by a new disorder, which arose from the smallest beginning. A spirit of desertion began to prevail among the troops, and the deserters, instead of seeking their safety in flight or concealment, infested the highways. Maternus, a private soldier of a daring boldness above his station, collected these bands of robbers into a little army, set open the prisons, invited the slaves to assert their freedom, and plundered with impunity the rich and defenceless cities of Gaul and Spain. The governors of the provinces, who had long been the spectators, and perhaps the partners, of his depredations, were at length roused from their supine indolence by the threatening commands of the emperor. Maternus found that he was encompassed and foresaw that he must be overpowered. A great effort of despair was his last resource. He ordered his followers to disperse, to pass the Alps in small parties and various disguises, and to assemble at Rome during the licentious tumult of the festival of Sibylle. To murder Commodus and to ascend the vacant throne was the ambition of no vulgar robber. His measures were so ably concerted that his concealed troops already filled the streets of Rome. The envy of an accomplice discovered and ruined this singular enterprise in a moment when it was ripe for execution. Suspicious princes often promote the last of mankind from a vain persuasion that those who have no dependence, except on their favour, will have no attachment except to the person of their benefactor. Cleander, the successor of Perennis, was a Phrygian by birth. 
of a nation over whose stubborn but servile temper blows only could prevail. He had been sent from his native country to Rome in the capacity of a slave. As a slave he entered the imperial palace, rendered himself useful to his master's passions, and rapidly ascended to the most exalted station which a subject could enjoy. His influence over the mind of Commodus was much greater than that of his predecessor, for Cleander was devoid of any ability or virtue which could inspire the emperor with envy or distrust. Avarice was the reigning passion of his soul, and the great principle of his administration. The rank of consul, of patrician, of senator, was exposed to public sale, and it would have been considered as disaffection if any one had refused to purchase these empty and disgraceful honours with the greatest part of his fortune. In the lucrative provincial employments, the minister shared with the government the spoils of the people. The execution of the laws was penal and arbitrary. A wealthy criminal might obtain not only the reversal of the sentence by which he was justly condemned, but might likewise inflict whatever punishment he pleased on the accuser, the witnesses, and the judge. By these means Cleander, in the space of three years, had accumulated more wealth than had ever yet been possessed by any freedman. Commodus was perfectly satisfied with the magnificent presence which the artful courtier laid at his feet in the most seasonable moments. To divert the public envy, Cleander, under the emperor's name, erected baths, porticos, and places of exercise for the use of the people. He flattered himself that the Romans, dazzled and amused by his apparent liberality, would be less affected by the bloody scenes which were daily exhibited, that they would forget the deaths of Pyrrhus, a senator to whose superior merit the late emperor had granted one of his daughters and that they would forgive the execution of Arius Antoninus, the last representative of the name and virtues of the Antonines. The former, with more integrity than prudence, had attempted to disclose to his brother-in-law the true character of Cleander. An equitable sentence pronounced by the latter, when proconsul of Asia, against a worthless creature of the favourite, proved fatal to him. After the fall of Perennis, the traitors of Commodus had, for a short time, assumed the appearance of a return to virtue. He repealed the most odious of his acts, loaded his memory with the public execration, and ascribed to the pernicious counsels of that wicked minister all the errors of his inexperienced youth. But his repentance lasted only thirty days, and under Cleander's tyranny, the administration of Perennis was often regretted. End of chapter four, part one. Recorded by Gazina in January two thousand and seven. Chapter four, part two of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pestilence and famine contributed to fill up the measure of the calamities of Rome. The first could only be imputed to the just indignation of the gods, but a monopoly of corn, supported by the riches and power of the minister, was considered as the immediate cause of the second. The popular discontent, after it had long circulated in whispers, broke out in the assembled circus. The people quitted their favorite amusements for the more delicious pleasure of revenge, rushed in crowds towards a palace in the suburbs, one of the emperor's retirements, and demanded, with angry clamors, the head of the public enemy. Cleander, who had commanded the Praetorian guards, ordered a body of cavalry to sally forth and disperse the seditious multitude. The multitude fled with precipitation towards the city. Several were slain, and many more were trampled to death. But when the cavalry entered the streets, their pursuit was checked by a shower of stones and darts from the roofs and windows of the houses. The foot guards, who had been long jealous of the prerogatives and insolence of the Praetorian cavalry, embraced the party of the people. 
the tumult became a regular engagement and threatened a general massacre. The Praetorians at length gave way, oppressed with numbers, and the tide of popular fury returned with redoubled violence against the gates of the palace, where Commodus lay dissolved in luxury and alone unconscious of the civil war. It was death to approach his person with unwelcome news. He would have perished in this supine security had not two women, his eldest sister, Fidilla, and Marcia, the most favorite of his concubines, ventured to break into his presence. Bathed in tears, and with disheveled hair, they threw themselves at his feet, and, with all the pressing eloquence of fear, discovered to the affrighted emperor the crimes of the minister, the rage of the people, and the impending ruin which in a few minutes would burst over his palace and person. Commodus started from his dream of pleasure, and commanded that the head of Cleander should be thrown out to the people. The desired spectacle instantly appeased the tumult, and the son of Marcus might even yet have regained the affection and confidence of his subjects. But every sentiment of virtue and humanity was extinct in the mind of Commodus. Whilst he thus abandoned the reins of empire to these unworthy favorites, he valued nothing in sovereign power except the unbounded license of indulging his sensual appetites. His hours were spent in a seraglio, with three hundred beautiful women and as many boys, of every rank and of every province, and wherever the arts of seduction proved ineffectual, the brutal lover had recourse to violence. The ancient historians have expiated on these abandoned scenes of prostitution, which scorned every restraint of nature or modesty, but it would not be easy to translate their too faithful descriptions into the decency of modern language. The intervals of lust were filled up with the basest amusements. The influence of a polite age and the labor of an attentive education had never been able to infuse into his rude and brutish mind the least tincture of learning, and he was the first of the Roman emperors totally devoid of taste for the pleasures of the understanding. Nero himself excelled, or affected to excel, in the elegant arts of music and poetry. Nor should we despise his pursuits, had he not converted the pleasing relaxation of a leisure hour into the serious business and ambition of his life. But Commodus, from his earliest infancy, discovered an aversion to whatever was rational or liberal, and a fond attachment to the amusements of the populace, the sports of the circus and amphitheater, the combat of gladiators, and the hunting of wild beasts. The masters in every branch of learning, whom Marcus provided for his son, were heard with inattention and disgust, whilst the Moors and Parthians, who taught him to dart the javelin and shoot with the bow, found a disciple who delighted in his application, and soon equaled the most skillful of his instructors in the steadiness of the eye and dexterity of the hand. The servile crowd, whose fortune depended on their master's vices, applauded these ignoble pursuits. The perfidious voice of flattery reminded him that, by exploits of the same nature, by the defeat of the Nemean lion and the slaughter of the wild boar of Arimanthus, the Grecian Hercules had acquired a place among the gods and an immortal memory among men. They only forgot to observe that, in the first ages of society, when the fiercer animals often dispute with man the possession of an unsettled country, a successful war against these savages is one of the most innocent and beneficial labors of heroism. In the civilized state of the Roman Empire, the wild beasts had long since retired from the face of man in the neighborhood of populous cities. To surprise them in their solitary haunts, and to transport them to Rome, that they might be slain in pomp by the hand of an emperor, was an enterprise equally ridiculous for the prince and oppressive for the people. Ignorant of these distinctions, Commodus eagerly embraced the glorious resemblance, and styled himself, as we still read on his medals, the Roman Hercules. The club and the lion's hide were placed by the sign of the throne amongst the ensigns of sovereignty, and statues were erected, in which Commodus were rep was represented in the character and with the attributes of the god, whose valor and dexterity he endeavored to emulate in the daily course of his ferocious amusements. Elated with these praises, which gradually extinguished the innate sense of shame, Commodus resolved to exhibit, before the eyes of the Roman people, those exercises which till then he had decently confined within the walls of his palace, in the presence of a very few favorites. On the appointed day, the various motives of flattery, fear, and curiosity attracted to the amphitheater an innumerable multitude of spectators, and some degree of applause was deservedly bestowed on the uncommon skill of the imperial performer. Whether he aimed at the heart or head of the animal, 
the wound was alike certain and mortal. With arrows whose point was shaped into the form of a crescent, Commodus often intercepted the rapid career and cut asunder the long, bony neck of the ostrich. A panther was let loose, and the archer waited till he had leapt upon a trembling malefactor. In the same instant, the shaft flew, and the beast dropped dead, and the man remained unhurt. The dens of the amphitheater disgorged at once a hundred lions. A hundred darts from the unerring hand of Commodus laid them dead as they ran, raging around the arena. Neither the huge bulk of the elephant nor the scaly hide of the rhinoceros could defend them from his stroke. Ethiopia and India yielded their most extraordinary productions, and several animals were slain in the amphitheater, which had only been seen in the representations of art, or perhaps of fancy. In all these exhibitions, the sheerest precautions were used to protect the person of the Roman Hercules from the desperate spring of any savage who might possibly disregard the dignity of the emperor and sanctity of the god. But the meanest of the populace were affected with shame and indignation when they beheld their sovereign enter the lists as a gladiator and professed glory in a profession which the laws and manners of the Romans had branded with the justest note of infamy. He chose the habit and arms of the Secutor, whose combat with the Retiarius formed one of the most lively scenes in the bloody sports of the amphitheater. The Secutor was armed with a helmet, sword, and buckler. His naked antagonist had only a large net and trident. With the one he endeavored to entangle, with the other to dispatch his enemy. If he missed the first throw, he was obliged to fly from the pursuit of the Secutor, till he had prepared his net for a second cast. The emperor fought in this character seven hundred and thirty-five several times. These glorious achievements were carefully recorded in the public acts of the empire, and that he might emit no circumstance of infamy, he received from the common fund of gladiators a stipend so exorbitant that it became a new and most ignominious tax upon the Roman people. It may be easily supposed that in these entanglements the master of the world was always successful, in the amphitheater his victories were not often sanguinary, but when he exercised his skill in the school of gladiators, or in his own palace, his wretched antagonists were frequently honored with a mortal wound from the hand of Commodus, and obliged to seal their flattery with their blood. He now disdained the appellation of Hercules. The name of Paulus, a celebrated secutor, was the only one which delighted his ear. It was inscribed on his colossus statues, and repeated in the redoubled acclamations of the mournful and applauding senate. Claudius Pompeianus, the virtuous husband of Lucilla, was the only senator who asserted the honor of his rank. As a father, he permitted his sons to consult their safety by attending the amphitheater. As a Roman, he declared that his own life was in the emperor's hands, but that he would never behold the son of Marcus prostituting his person and dignity. Notwithstanding his manly resolution, Pompeianus escaped the resentment of the tyrant, and with his honor had the good fortune to preserve his life. Commodus had now attained the summit of vice and infamy. Amidst the acclamations of a flattering court, he was unable to disguise from himself that he deserved the contempt and hatred of every man of sense and virtue in his empire. His ferocious spirit was irritated by the consciousness of that hatred, by the envy of every kind of merit, by the just apprehension of danger, and by the habit of slaughter which he contracted in his daily amusements. History has preserved a long list of consular senators sacrificed to his wanton suspicion, which sought out, with peculiar anxiety, those unfortunate persons connected, however remotely, with the family of the Antonines, without sparing even the ministers of his crimes or pleasures. His cruelty proved at last fatal to himself. He had shed with impunity the noblest blood of Rome. He perished as soon as he was dreaded by his own domestics. Marcia, his favorite concubine, Electus, his chamberlain, and Lytus, his praetorian prefect, alarmed by the fate of their companions and predecessors, resolved to prevent the destruction which every hour hung over their heads, either from the mad caprice of the tyrant or the sudden indignation of the people. Marcia seized the occasion by presenting a draught of wine to her lover after he had fatigued himself with hunting some wild beasts. Commodus retired to sleep, but whilst he was laboring with the effects of poison and drunkenness, a robust youth, by profession a wrestler, entered his chamber and strangled him without resistance. 
the body was secretly conveyed out of the palace, before the least suspicion was entertained in the city, or even in the court of the emperor's death. Such was the fate of the son of Marcus, and so easy was it to destroy a hated tyrant, who, by the artificial powers of government, had oppressed, during thirteen years, so many millions of subjects, every one of whom was equal to their master in personal strength and personal abilities. The measures of the conspirators were conducted with the deliberate coolness and celerity which the greatness of the occasion required. They resolved instantly to fill the vacant throne with an emperor whose character would justify and maintain the action that had been committed. They fixed on Pertinax, prefect of the city, an ancient senator of consular rank, whose conspicuous merit had broke through the obscurity of his birth and raised him to the first honors of the state. He had successfully governed most of the provinces of the empire, and in all of his great employments, military as well as civil, he had uniformly distinguished himself by the firmness, the prudence, and the integrity of his conduct. He now remained almost alone of the friends and ministers of Marcus, and when, at the late hour of the night, he was awakened with the news that the chamberlain and prefect were at his door, he received them with intrepid resignation, and desired that they would execute their master's orders. Instead of death, they offered him the throne of the Roman world. During some moments he distrusted their intentions and assurances. Convinced at length of the death of Commodus, he accepted the purple with sincere reluctance, the natural effect of his knowledge both of the duties and of the dangers of the supreme rank. Lytus conducted without delay the new emperor to the camp of the Praetorians, diffusing at the same time through the city a seasonable report that Commodus died suddenly of an apoplexy, and that the virtuous Pertinax had already succeeded to the throne. The guards were rather surprised than pleased with the suspicious death of a prince whose indulgence and liberality they alone had experienced. But the emergency of the occasion, the authority of the prefect, the reputation of Pertinax, and the clamors of the people, obliged them to stifle their secret discontents, to accept the donative promised by the new emperor, to swear allegiance to him, and, with joyful acclamations and laurels in their hands, to conduct him to the Senate House, that the military consent might be ratified by the civil authority. This important night was now far spent. With the dawn of day and the commencement of the new year, the senators expected a summons to attend an ignominious ceremony. In spite of all remonstrances, even those of his creatures who had not yet preserved any regard for prudence or decency, Commodus had resolved to pass the night in the gladiator's school, and from thence to take possession of the consulship, in the habit and with the attendance of that infamous crew. On a sudden, before the break of day, the Senate was called together in the Temple of Concord, to meet the guards and to ratify the election of a new emperor. For a few minutes they sat in silent suspense, doubtful of their unexpected deliverance, and suspicious that the cruel artifices of Commodus. But, when at length they were assured that the tyrant was no more, they resigned themselves to all the transports of joy and indignation. Pertinax, who modestly represented the meanness of his extraction, pointed out several noble senators more deserving than himself of the empire, was constrained by their dutiful violence to ascend the throne, and receive all the titles of imperial power, confirmed by the most sincere vows of fidelity. The memory of Commodus was branded with internal infamy. The names of tyrant, of gladiator, of public enemy, resounded in every corner of the house. They decreed in tumultuous votes that his honor should be reversed, his titles erased from the public monuments, his statues thrown down, his body dragged with a hook into the stripping room of the gladiators, to satiate the public fury, and they even expressed some indignation about those officious servants who had already presumed to screen his remains from the justice of the Senate. But Pertinax could not refuse those last rites to the memory of Marcus, and the fears of his first protector, Claudius Pompeianus, who lamented the cruel fate of his brother-in-law, and lamented still more that he had deserved it. These effusions of impotent rage against the dead emperor, whom the Senate had flattered when alive with the most abject servility, betrayed a just but ungenerous spirit of revenge. The legality of these decrees was, however, supported by the principles of the imperial constitution. To censure, to depose, or to punish with death the first magistrate of the Republic who had abused his delegated trust was the ancient and undoubted prerogative of the Roman Senate. 
but that feeble assembly was obliged to content itself with inflicting on a fallen tyrant that public justice from which, during his life and reign, he had been shielded by the strong arm of military despotism. Pertinax found a nobler way of condemning his predecessor's memory, by the contrast of his own virtues with the vices of Commodus. On the day of his ascension, he resigned over to his wife and son his whole private fortune, that they might have no pretense to solicit favors at the expense of the state. He refused to flatter the vanity of the former with the title of Augusta, or to corrupt the inexperienced youth of the latter by the rank of Caesar. Accurately distinguishing between the duties of a parent and those of a sovereign, he educated his son with a severe simplicity, which, while it gave him no assured prospect of the throne, might in time have rendered him worthy of it. In public, the behavior of Pertinax was grave and affable. He lived with the virtuous part of the Senate, and, in a private station, he had been acquainted with the true character of each individual. Without either pride or jealousy, considered them as friends and companions, with whom he shared the dangers of the tyranny, and with whom he wished to enjoy the security of the present time. He very frequently invited them to familiar entertainments, the frugality of which was ridiculed by those who remembered and regretted the luxurious prodigality of Commodus. To heal, as far as it was possible, the wounds inflicted by the hands of tyranny was the pleasing but melancholy task of Pertinax. The innocent victims who yet survived were recalled from exile, released from prison, and restored to the full possession of their honors and fortunes. The unburied bodies of murdered senators, for the cruelty of Commodus endeavored to extend itself beyond death, were deposited in the sepulchres of their ancestors. The memories were justified, and every consolation was bestowed on their ruined and afflicted families. Among these consolations, one of the most grateful was the punishment of the delators, the common enemies of their master, of virtue, and of their country. Yet, in the inquisition of these legal assassins, Pertinex proceeded with a steady temper which gave everything to justice and nothing to popular prejudice and resentment. The finances of the state demanded the most vigilant care of the emperor, though every measure of injustice and extortion had been adopted which could collect the property of the subject into the coffers of the prince, the rapaciousness of Commodus had been so very inadequate to his extravagance that, upon his death, no more than eight thousand pounds were found in the exhausted treasury, to defray the current expenses of government, and to discharge the pressing demand of a liberal donative, which the new emperor had been obliged to promise to the Praetorian guards. Yet, under these distressed circumstances, Pertinax had the generous firmness to remit all the oppressive taxes invented by Commodus, and to cancel all the unjust claims of the treasury, declaring, in a decree of the Senate, that he was better satisfied to administer a poor republic with innocence than to acquire riches by the ways of tyranny and dishonor. Economy and industry he considered as the pure and genuine sources of wealth, and from them he soon derived a copious supply for the public necessities. The expense of the household was immediately reduced to one half. All the instruments of luxury, Pertinax exposed to public auction. Gold and silver plate, chariots of a singular construction, a superfluous wardrobe of silk and embroidery, and a great number of beautiful slaves of both sexes, excepting only, and with attentive humanity, those who were born in a state of freedom, and had been ravished from the arms of their weeping parents. At the same time that he obliged the worthless favorites of the tyrant to resign a part of their ill-gotten wealth, he satisfied the just creditors of the state, and unexpectedly discharged the long arrears of honest services. He removed the oppressive restrictions that had been laid upon commerce, and granted all the uncultivated lands in Italy and the provinces to those who would improve them, with an exemption from tribute during the term of ten years. Such an uniform conduct had already secured to Pertinax the noblest reward of a sovereign, the love and esteem of his people. Those who remembered the virtues of Marcus were happy to contemplate in their new emperor the features of that bright original, and flatter themselves that they should long enjoy the benign influence of his administration. A hasty zeal to reform the corrupted state, accompanied with less prudence than might have been expected from the years and experience of Pertinax, proved fatal to himself and to his country. His honest indiscretion united against him the servile crowd, who found their private benefit in the public disorders, and who preferred the favor of a tyrant to the inexorable equality of the laws. Amidst the general joy, the sullen and angry countenance of the Praetorian guards betrayed their inward dissatisfaction. They had reluctantly submitted to Pertinax, 
they dreaded the strictness of the ancient discipline, which he was preparing to restore, and they regretted the license of the former reign. Their discontents were secretly fomented by Lytus, their prefect, who found, when it was too late, that his new emperor would reward a servant, but would not be ruled by a favorite. On the third day of his reign, the soldiers seized on a noble senator, with a design to carry him to the camp and to invest him with the imperial purple. Instead of being dazzled by the dangerous honor, the affrighted victim escaped from the violence, and took refuge at the feet of Pertinax. A short time afterwards, Socius Falco, one of the consuls of the year, a rash youth, but of an ancient and opulent family, listened to the voice of ambition, and a conspiracy was formed during a short absence of Pertinax, which was crushed by a sudden return to Rome and his resolute behavior. Falco was on the point of being justly condemned to death as a public enemy, had he not been saved by the earnest and sincere entreaties of the injured emperor, who conjured the senate that the purity of his reign might not be stained by the blood even of a guilty senator. These disappointments served only to irritate the rage of the Praetorian guards. On the 28th of March, 86 days only after the death of Commodus, a general sedition broke out in camp, which the officers wanted either power or inclination to suppress. Two or three hundred of the most desperate soldiers marched at noonday, with arms in their hands and fury in their looks, towards the imperial palace. The gates were thrown open by their companions upon guard, and by the domestics of the old court, who had already formed a secret conspiracy against the life of the too virtuous emperor. On the news of their approach, Pertinax, disdaining either flight or concealment, advanced to meet his assassins, and recalled to their minds his own innocence and the sanctity of the recent oath. For a few moments they stood in silent suspense, ashamed of their atrocious design, and awed by the venerable aspect and majestic firmness of their sovereign, till at length, the despair of pardon reviving their fury, a barbarian of the country of Tongres leveled the first blow against Pertinax, who was instantly dispatched with a multitude of wounds. His head, separated from his body and placed on a lance, was carried in triumph to the Praetorian camp in the sight of a mournful and indignant people, who lamented the unworthy fate of that insolent prince, and the transient blessings of a reign, the memory of which can serve only to aggravate their approaching misfortunes. End of chapter 4, part 2「Of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, by Edward Gibbon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5. Sale of the Empire to Didius Julianus. Part 1. The power of the sword is more sensibly felt in an extensive monarchy than in a small community. It has been calculated by the ablest politicians that no state, without being soon exhausted, can maintain above the hundredth part of its members in arms and idleness. But, although this relative proportion may be uniform, the influence of the army over the rest of the society will vary according to the degree of its positive strength. The advantages of military science and discipline cannot be exerted unless a proper number of soldiers are united into one body and actuated by one soul. With a handful of men such union would be ineffectual. With an unwieldy host it would be impracticable, and the powers of the machine would be alike destroyed by the extreme minuteness or the excessive weight of its springs. To illustrate this observation, we need only reflect that there is no superiority of natural strength, artificial weapons, or acquired skill, which would enable one man to keep in constant subjection one hundred of his fellow creatures. The tyrant of a single town or a small district would soon discover that a hundred armed followers were a weak defence against ten thousand peasants or citizens but a hundred thousand well-disciplined soldiers will command, with despotic sway, ten millions of subjects, and a body of ten or fifteen thousand guards will strike terror into the most numerous populace that ever crowded the streets of an immense capital. 
The Praetorian bands, whose licentious fury was the first symptom and cause of the decline of the Roman Empire, scarcely amounted to the last mentioned number. They derived their institution from Augustus, that crafty tyrant, sensible that laws might colour, but that arms alone could maintain his usurped dominion, had gradually formed this powerful body of guards, in constant readiness to protect his person, to awe the senate, and either to prevent or to crush the first motions of rebellion. He distinguished these favoured troops by a double pay and superior privileges, but as their formidable aspect would at once have alarmed and irritated the Roman people, three cohorts only were stationed in the capital, whilst the remainder was dispersed in the adjacent towns of Italy. But after fifty years of peace and servitude, Tiberius ventured on a decisive measure which for ever riveted the fetters of his country. Under the fair pretences of relieving Italy from the heavy burden of military quarters, and of introducing a stricter discipline among the guards, he assembled them at Rome in a permanent camp, which was fortified with skilful care, and placed on a commanding situation. Such formidable servants are always necessary, but often fatal to the throne of despotism by thus introducing the praetorian guards as it were into the palace and the senate the emperors taught them to perceive their own strength and the weakness of the civil government to view the vices of their master with familiar contempt and to lay aside that reverential awe which distance only and mystery can preserve toward an imaginary power in the luxurious idleness of an opulent city their pride was nourished by the sense of their irresistible weight, nor was it possible to conceal from them that the person of the sovereign, the authority of the senate, the public treasure, and the seat of empire were all in their hands. To divert the praetorian bands from these dangerous reflections, the firmest and best established princes were obliged to mix blandishments with commands, rewards with punishments, to flatter their pride, indulge their pleasures, connive at their irregularities, and to purchase their precarious faith by a liberal donative, which, since the elevation of Claudius, was enacted as a legal claim on the accession of every new emperor. The advocate of the guards endeavoured to justify by arguments the power which they asserted by arms, and to maintain that, according to the purest principles of the constitution, their consent was essentially necessary in the appointment of an emperor. The election of consuls, of generals, and of magistrates, however it had been recently usurped by the senate, was the ancient and undoubted right of the Roman people. But where was the Roman people to be found? Not surely amongst the mixed multitude of slaves and strangers that filled the streets of Rome. A servile populace, as devoid of spirit, as destitute of property, the defenders of the state, selected from the flower of the Italian youth, and trained in the exercise of arms and virtue, were the genuine representatives of the people, and the best entitled to elect the military chief of the republic. These assertions, however defective in reason, became unanswerable when the fierce Praetorians increased their weight by throwing, like the barbarian conqueror of Rome, their swords into the scale. The Praetorians had violated the sanctity of the throne by the atrocious murder of Pertinax. They dishonoured the majesty of it by their subsequent conduct. The camp was without a leader, for even the perfect Cletius, who had excited the tempest, prudently declined the public indignation. Amidst the wild disorder, Sulpicianus, the emperor's father-in-law and governor of the city, who had been sent to the camp on the first alarm of mutiny, was endeavouring to calm the fury of the multitude when he was silenced by the clamorous return of the murderers, bearing on a lance the head of Pertinax. Though history has accustomed us to observe every principle and every passion, yielding to the imperious dictates of ambition, it is scarcely credible that in these moments of horror Sulpicianus should have aspired to ascend a throne polluted with the recent blood of so near a relation, and so excellent a prince. He had already begun to use the only effectual argument, 
and to treat from the imperial dignity. But the more prudent of the Praetorians, apprehensive that in this private contract they should not obtain a just price for so valuable a commodity, ran out upon the ramparts, and with a loud voice proclaimed that the Roman world was to be disposed of to the best bidder by public auction. This infamous offer, the most insolent excess of military license, diffused a universal grief, shame, and indignation throughout the city. It reached at length the ears of Didius Julianus, a wealthy senator, who, regardless of the public calamities, was indulging himself in the luxury of the table. His wife and his daughter, his freedman and his parasites, easily convinced him that he deserved the throne, and earnestly conjured him to embrace so fortunate an opportunity. The vain old man hastened to the Praetorian camp, where Sulpicianus was still in treaty with the guards, and began to bid against him from the foot of the rampart. The unworthy negotiation was transacted by faithful emissaries, who passed, alternately, from one candidate to the other, and acquainted each of them with the offers of his rival. Sulpicianus had already promised a donative of five thousand drachmas, above one hundred and six pounds, to each soldier, when Julian, eager for the prize, rose at once to the sum of six thousand two hundred and fifty drachmas, or upwards of two hundred pounds sterling. The gates of the camp were instantly thrown open to the purchaser. He was declared emperor, and received an oath of allegiance from the soldiers, who retained humanity enough to stipulate that he should pardon and forget the competition of Sulpicianus. It was now incumbent on the Praetorians to fulfil the conditions of the sale. They placed their new sovereign, whom they served and despised, in the centre of their ranks, surrounded him on every side with their shields, and conducted him in close order of battle through the deserted streets of the city. The Senate was commanded to assemble, and those who had been the distinguished friends of Pertinax, or the personal enemies of Julian, found it necessary to effect a more than common share of satisfaction at this happy revolution. After Julian had filled the Senate House with armed soldiers, he expatiated on the freedom of his election, his own eminent virtues, and his full assurance of the affections of the Senate. The obsequious assembly congratulated their own, and the public felicity engaged their allegiance and conferred on him all the several branches of the imperial power. From the Senate, Julian was conducted by the same military procession to take possession of the palace. The first objects that struck his eyes were the abandoned trunk of Pertinax and the frugal entertainment prepared for his supper. The one he viewed with indifference, the other with contempt. A magnificent feast was prepared by his order, and he amused himself till a very late hour with dice, and the performance of Pylades, a celebrated dancer. Yet it was observed that after the group of flatterers dispersed, and left him to darkness, solitude, and terrible reflection, he passed a sleepless night, revolving most probably in his own mind his own rash folly, the fate of his virtuous predecessor, and the doubtful and dangerous tenure of an empire which had not been acquired by merit, but purchased by money. He had reason to tremble. On the throne of the world he found himself, without a friend, and even without an adherent. The guards themselves were ashamed of the prince, whom their avarice had persuaded them to accept. Nor was there a citizen who did not consider his elevation with horror, as the last insult on the Roman name. The nobility, whose conspicuous station and ample possessions exacted the strictest caution, dissembled their sentiments, and met the affected civility of the emperor with smiles of complacency and professions of duty. But the people, secure in their numbers and obscurity, gave a free vent to their passions. The streets and public places of Rome resounded with clamours and imprecations. The enraged multitude affronted the person of Julian, rejected his liberality, and conscious of the impotence of their own resentment, 
they called aloud on the legions of the frontiers to assert the violated majesty of the Roman Empire. And the public discontent was soon diffused from the centre to the frontiers of the empire. The armies of Britain, of Syria, and of Illyricum lamented the death of Pertinax, in whose company or under whose command they had so often fought and conquered. They received with surprise, with indignation, and perhaps with envy, the extraordinary intelligence that the Praetorians had disposed of the empire by public auction, and they sternly refused to ratify the ignominious bargain. Their immediate and unanimous revolt was fatal to Julian, but it was fatal at the same time to the public peace. As the generals of the respective armies, Clodius, Albinus, Vicenius, Niger, and Septimius, Severus, were still more anxious to succeed than to revenge the murdered Pertinax. Their forces were exactly balanced. Each of them was at the head of three legions, with a numerous train of auxiliaries, and however different in their characters, they were all soldiers of experience and capacity. Clodius Albinus, governor of Britain, surpassed both his competitors in the nobility of his extraction, which he derived from some of the most illustrious names of the old empire. But the branch from which he claimed his descent was sunk into mean circumstances, and transplanted into a remote province. It is difficult to form a just idea of his true character. Under the philosophic cloak of austerity, he stands accused of concealing most of the vices which degrade human nature. But his accusers are those venal writers who adored the fortune of Severus, and trampled on the ashes of an unsuccessful rival. Virtue, or the appearances of virtue, recommended Albinus to the confidence and good opinion of Marcus, and his preserving with the son the same interest which he had acquired with the father, is a proof at least that he was possessed of a very flexible disposition. The favour of a tyrant does not always suppose a want of merit in the object of it. He may, without attending it, reward a man of worth and ability, or he may find such a man useful to his own service. It does not appear that Albinus served the son of Marcus either as the minister of his cruelties or even as the associate of his pleasures. He was employed in a distant honourable command. When he received a confidential letter from the emperor, acquainting him of the treasonable designs of some discontented generals, and authorising him to declare himself the guardian and successor of the throne, by assuming the title and ensigns of Caesar, the governor of Britain wisely declined the dangerous honour, which would have marked him for the jealousy, or involved him in the approaching ruin of Commodus. He courted power by nobler, or at least by more specious arts. On a premature report of the death of the emperor, he assembled his troops, and in an eloquent discourse deplored the inevitable mischiefs of despotism, described the happiness and glory which their ancestors had enjoyed under the consular government, and declared his firm resolution to reinstate the senate and people in their legal authority. This popular harangue was answered by the loud acclamations of the British legions, and received at Rome with a secret murmur of applause. Safe in the possession of his little world, and in the command of an army less distinguished indeed for discipline than for numbers and valour, Albinus braved the menaces of Commodus, maintained towards Pertinax a stately ambiguous reserve, and instantly declared against the usurpation of Julian. The convulsions of the capital added new weight to his sentiments, or rather to his professions of patriotism. A regard to decency induced him to decline the lofty titles of Augustus and Emperor, and he imitated perhaps the example of Galba, who on a similar occasion had styled himself the lieutenant of the senate and people. Personal merit alone had raised Persenius Niger from an obscure birth and station to the government of Syria a lucrative and important command, which in times of civil confusion gave him a near prospect of the throne. Yet his part seemed to have been better suited to the second than to the first rank. He was an unequal rival, though he might have proved himself an excellent lieutenant to Severus, 
who afterwards displayed the greatness of his mind by adopting several useful institutions from a vanquished enemy. In his government, Niger acquired the esteem of the soldiers and the love of the provincials. His rigid discipline fortified the valour and confirmed the obedience of the former, while the voluptuous Syrians were less delighted with the mild firmness of his administration than with the affability of his manners, and the apparent pleasure with which he attended their frequent and pompous festivals. As soon as the intelligence of the atrocious murder of Pertinax had reached Antioch, the wishes of Asia invited Niger to assume the imperial purple, and revenge his death. The legions of the eastern frontier embraced his cause. The opulent but unarmed provinces, from the frontiers of Ethiopia to the Hadriatic, cheerfully submitted to his power, and the kings beyond the Tigris and the Euphrates congratulated his election, and offered him their homage and services. The mind of Niger was not capable of receiving this sudden tide of fortune. He flattered himself that his accession would be undisturbed by competition, and unstained by civil blood, and whilst he enjoyed the vain pomp of triumph, he neglected to secure the means of victory. Instead of entering into an effectual negotiation with the powerful armies of the West, whose resolution might decide, or at least must balance, the mighty contest, instead of advancing without delay towards Rome and Italy, where his presence was impatiently expected, Niger trifled away in the luxury of Antioch those irretrievable moments, which were diligently improved by the decisive activity of Severus. The country of Pannonia and Dalmatia, which occupied the space between the Danube and the Hadriatic, was one of the last and most difficult conquests of the Romans. In the defence of national freedom, two hundred thousand of these barbarians had once appeared in the field, alarmed the declining age of Augustus, and exercised the vigilant prudence of Tiberius, at the head of the collected force of the empire. The Pannonians yielded at length to the arms and institutions of Rome. Their recent subjection, however, the neighbourhood and even the mixture of the unconquered tribes, and perhaps the climate, adapted, as it has been observed, to the production of great bodies and slow minds, all contributed to preserve some remains of their original ferocity, and under the tame and uniform countenance of Roman provincials, the hardy features of the natives were still to be discerned. Their warlike youth afforded an exhaustible supply of recruits to the legions stationed on the banks of the Danube, and which from a perpetual warfare against the Germans and Samazans were deservedly esteemed the best troops in the service. The Pannonian army was at this time commanded by Septimius Severus, a native of Africa, who in the gradual ascent of private honours had concealed his daring ambition, which was never diverted from its steady course by the allurements of pleasure, the apprehension of danger, or the feelings of humanity. On the first news of the murder of Pertinax, he assembled his troops, painted in the most lively colours the crime, the insolence, and the weakness of the Praetorian guards, and animated the legions to arms and to revenge. He concluded, and the peroration was thought extremely eloquent, with promising every soldier about four hundred pounds, an honourable donative, double in value to the infamous bribe with which Julian had purchased the empire. The acclamations of the army immediately saluted Severus with the names of Augustus, Pertinax, and Emperor, and he thus attained the lofty station to which he was invited, by conscious merit and a long train of dreams and omens, the fruitful offsprings, either of his superstition or policy. The new candidate for empire saw and improved the peculiar advantage of his situation. His province extended to the Julian Alps, which gave an easy access into Italy, and he remembered the saying of Augustus, that a Pannonian army might in ten days appear in sight of Rome. By a celerity, proportioned to the greatness of the occasion, he might reasonably hope to revenge Pertinax, punish Julian, and receive the homage of the Senate and people as their lawful emperor, before his competitors, separated from Italy by an immense tract of sea and land, were apprised of his success. 
or even of his election. During the whole expedition, he scarcely allowed himself any moments for sleep or food, marching on foot and in complete armour at the head of his columns, he insinuated himself into the confidence and affection of his troops, pressed their diligence, revived their spirits, animated their hopes, and was well satisfied to share the hardships of the meanest soldier, whilst he kept in view the infinite superiority of his reward. The wretched Julian had expected and thought himself prepared to dispute the empire with the governor of Syria, but in the invincible and rapid approach of the Pannonian legions he saw his inevitable ruin. The hasty arrival of every messenger increased his just apprehensions. He was successively informed that Severus had passed the Alps, that the Italian cities, unwilling or unable to oppose his progress, had received him with the warmest professions of joy and duty, that the important place of Ravenna had surrendered without resistance, and that the Hadriatic fleet was in the hands of the conqueror. The enemy was now within two hundred and fifty miles of Rome, and every moment diminished the narrow span of life and empire allotted to Julian. He attempted, however, to prevent, or at least to protract, his ruin. He implored the venal faith of the Praetorians, filled the city with unavailing preparations for war, drew lines round the suburbs, and even strengthened the fortifications of the palace, as if those last entrenchments could be defended, without hope of relief against the victorious invader. Fear and shame prevented the guards from deserting his standard, but they trembled at the name of the Pannonian legions, commanded by an experienced general, and accustomed to vanquish the barbarians on the frozen Danube. They quitted with a sigh the pleasures of the baths and theatres, to put on arms whose use they had almost forgotten, and beneath the weight of which they were oppressed. The unpractised elephants, whose uncouth appearance, it was hoped, would strike terror into the army of the north through their unskilful riders, and the awkward evolutions of the marines, drawn from the fleet of Mycenaeum, were an object of ridicule to the populace, whilst the senate enjoyed with secret pleasure the distress and weakness of the usurper. Every motion of Julian betrayed his trembling perplexity. He insisted that Severus should be declared a public enemy by the senate. He entreated that the Pannonian general might be associated to the empire. He sent public ambassadors of consular rank to negotiate with his rival. He dispatched private assassins to take away his life. He designed that the Vestal Virgins and all the colleges of priests, in their sacerdotal habits, and bearing before them the sacred pledges of the Roman religion, should advance in solemn procession to meet the Pannonian legions, and at the same time he vainly tried to interrogate or to appease the fates by magic ceremonies and unlawful sacrifices. End of chapter 5, part 1《Chapter Five, Part Two of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sale of the Empire to Didius Julianus, Part Two. Severus, who dreaded neither his arms nor his enchantments, guarded himself from the only danger of secret conspiracy by the faithful attendance of six hundred chosen men, who never quitted his person or their cuirasses, either by night or by day, during the whole march. Advancing with a steady and rapid course, he passed, without difficulty, the defiles of the Apennine, received into his party the troops and ambassadors sent to retard his progress, and made a short halt at Interamnia, about seventy miles from Rome, his victory was already secure, but the despair of the Praetorians might have rendered it bloody, and Severus had the laudable ambition of ascending the throne without drawing his sword. His emissaries, dispersed in the capital, assured the guards that, provided they would abandon their worthless prince, 
and the perpetrators of the murder of Pertinax to the justice of the conqueror, he would no longer consider that melancholy event as the act of the whole body, the faithless Praetorians, whose resistance was supported only by sullen obstinacy, gladly complied with the easy conditions, seized the greatest part of the assassins, and signified to the senate that they no longer defended the cause of Julian. That assembly, convoked by the consul, unanimously acknowledged Severus as lawful emperor, decreed divine honours to Pertinax, and pronounced a sentence of deposition and death against his unfortunate successor. Julian was conducted into a private apartment of the baths of the palace, and beheaded as a common criminal, after having purchased, with an immense treasure, an anxious and precarious reign of only sixty-six days. The almost incredible expedition of Severus, who in so short a space of time conducted a numerous army from the banks of the Danube to those of the Tiber, proves at once the plenty of provisions, provided by agriculture and commerce, the goodness of the roads, the discipline of the legions, and the indolent, subdued temper of the provinces. The first cares of Severus were bestowed on two measures, the one dictated by policy, the other by decency, the revenge and the honours due to the memory of Pertinax. Before the new emperor entered Rome, he issued his commands to the Praetorian guards, directing them to wait his arrival on a large plain near the city, without arms, but in the habits of ceremony, in which they were accustomed to attend their sovereign. He was obeyed by those haughty troops, whose contrition was the effect of their just terrors. A chosen part of the Illyrian army encompassed them with levelled spears. Incapable of flight or resistance, they expected their fate in silent consternation. Severus mounted the tribunal, sternly reproached them with perfidy and cowardice, dismissed them with ignominy from the trust which they had betrayed, despoiled them of their splendid ornaments, and banished them on pain of death to the distance of a hundred miles from the capital. During the transaction, another detachment had been sent to seize their arms, occupy their camp, and prevent the hasty consequences of their despair. The funeral and consecration of Pertinax was next solemnized with every circumstance of sad magnificence. The senate, with a melancholy pleasure, performed the last rites to that excellent prince, whom they had loved and still regretted. The concern of his successor was probably less sincere. He esteemed the virtues of Pertinax, but those virtues would forever have confined his ambition to a private station. Severus pronounced his funeral oration with studied eloquence, inward satisfaction, and well-acted sorrow, and by this pious regard to his memory convinced the credulous multitude that he alone was worthy to supply his place. Sensible, however, that arms, not ceremonies, must assert his claim to the empire, he left Rome at the end of thirty days, and without suffering himself to be elated by this easy victory, prepared to encounter his more formidable rivals. The uncommon abilities and fortune of Severus have induced an elegant historian to compare him with the first and greatest of the Caesars. The parallel is at least imperfect. Where shall we find in the character of Severus the commanding superiority of soul, the generous clemency, and the various genius, which could reconcile and unite the love of pleasure, the thirst of knowledge, and the fire of ambition. In one instance only they may be compared, with some degree of propriety, in the celerity of their motions and their civil victories. In less than four years Severus subdued the riches of the East and the valour of the West. He vanquished two competitors of reputation and ability, and defeated numerous armies, provided with weapons and discipline equal to his own. In that age, the art of fortification and the principles of tactics were well understood by all the Roman generals, and the constant superiority of Severus was that of an artist, who uses the same instruments with more skill and industry than his rivals. 
I shall not, however, enter into a minute narrative of these military operations. But as the two civil wars, against Niger and against Albinus, were almost the same in their conduct, event, and consequences, I shall collect into one point of view the most striking circumstances tending to develop the character of the conqueror and the state of the empire. Falsehood and insincerity, unsuitable as they seem to the dignity of public transactions, offenders with a less degrading idea of meanness than when they are found in the intercourse of private life. In the latter they discover a want of courage, in the other only a defect of power, and as it is impossible for the most able statesmen to subdue millions of followers and enemies by their own personal strength, the world under the name of policy seems to have granted them a very liberal indulgence of craft and dissimulation. Yet the arts of Severus cannot be justified by the most ample privileges of state reason. He promised only to betray, he flattered only to ruin, and however he might occasionally bind himself by oaths and treaties, his conscience, obsequious to his interest, always released him from the inconvenient obligation. If his two competitors, reconciled by their common danger, had advanced upon him without delay, perhaps Severus would have sunk under their united efforts. Had they even attacked him at the same time, with separate views and separate armies, the contest might have been long and doubtful. But they fell, singly and successively, an easy prey to the arts as well as arms of their subtle enemy, lulled into security by the moderation of his professions, and overwhelmed by the rapidity of his action. He first marched against Niger, whose reputation and power he the most dreaded, but he declined any hostile declarations, suppressed the name of his antagonist, and only signified to the senate and people his intention of regulating the eastern provinces. In private he spoke of Niger, his old friend and intended successor, with the most affectionate regard, and highly applauded his generous design of revenging the murder of Pertinax to punish the vile usurper of the throne, was the duty of every Roman general. To persevere in arms, and to resist a lawful emperor acknowledged by the senate, would alone render him criminal. The sons of Niger had fallen into his hands among the children of the provincial governors, detained at Rome as pledges for the loyalty of their parents. As long as the power of Niger inspired terror, or even respect, they were educated with the most tender care, were the children of Severus himself. But they were soon involved in their father's ruin, and removed first by exile, and afterwards by death, from the eye of public compassion. While Severus was engaged in his eastern war, he had reason to apprehend that the governor of Britain might pass the sea and the Alps, occupy the vacant seat of empire, and oppose his return with the authority of the Senate and the forces of the West. The ambiguous conduct of Albinus, in not assuming the imperial title, left room for negotiation. Forgetting at once his professions of patriotism and the jealousy of sovereign power, he accepted the precarious rank of Caesar as a reward for his fatal neutrality. Till the first contest was decided, Severus treated the man whom he had doomed to destruction, with every mark of esteem and regard. Even in the letter in which he announced his victory over Niger, he styles Albinus the brother of his soul and empire, sends him the affectionate salutations of his wife Julia and his young family, and entreats him to preserve the armies and the republic faithful to their common interest. The messengers charged with this letter were instructed to accost the Caesar with respect, to desire a private audience, and to plunge their daggers into his heart. The conspiracy was discovered, and the two credulous Albinus at length passed over to the continent, and prepared for an unequal contest with his rival, who rushed upon him at the head of a veteran and victorious army. The military labours 
of Cerberus seem inadequate to the importance of his conquests. Two engagements, the one near the Hellespont, the other in the narrow defiles of Cilicia, decided the fate of his Syrian competitor, and the troops of Europe asserted their usual ascendant of the effeminate natives of Asia. The Battle of Lyon, where one hundred and fifty thousand Romans were engaged, was equally fatal to Albinus. The valour of the British army maintained, indeed, a sharp and doubtful contest, with the hardy discipline of the Illyrian legions. The fame and person of Severus appeared during a few moments irrecoverably lost, till that warlike prince rallied his fainting troops and led them on to a decisive victory. The war was finished by that memorable day. The civil wars of modern Europe have been distinguished not only by the fierce animosity, but likewise by the obstinate perseverance of the contending factions. They have generally been justified by some principle, or at least coloured by some pretext of religion, freedom, or loyalty. The leaders were nobles of independent property and hereditary influence. The troops fought like men interested in the decision of the quarrel, and as military spirit and party zeal were strongly diffused throughout the whole community, a vanquished chief was immediately supplied with new adherents, eager to shed their blood in the same cause. But the Romans, after the fall of the Republic, combated only for the choice of masters. Under the standard of a popular candidate for empire, a few enlisted from affection, some from fear, many from interest, none from principle. The legions, uninflamed by party zeal, were allured into civil war by liberal donatives, and still more liberal promises. A defeat, by disabling the chief from the performance of his engagements, dissolved the mercenary allegiance of his followers, and left them to consult their own safety by a timely desertion of an unsuccessful cause. It was of little moment to the provinces, under whose name they were oppressed or governed. They were driven by the impulsion of the present power, and as soon as that power yielded to a superior force, they hastened to implore the clemency of the conqueror, who, as he had an immense debt to discharge, was obliged to sacrifice the most guilty countries to the avarice of his soldiers. In the vast extent of the Roman Empire, there were few fortified cities capable of protecting a rooted army, nor was there any person or family or order of men whose natural interest, unsupported by the powers of government, was capable of restoring the cause of a sinking party. Yet in the contest between Niger and Severus, a single city deserves an honourable exception, as Byzantium was one of the greatest passages from Europe into Asia. It had been provided with a strong garrison, and a fleet of five hundred vessels was anchored in the harbour. The impetuosity of Severus disappointed this prudent scheme of defence. He left to his generals the siege of Byzantium, forced the less guarded passage of the Hellespont, and impatient of a meaner enemy, pressed forward to encounter his rival. Byzantium, attacked by a numerous and increasing army, and afterwards by the whole naval power of the empire, sustained a siege of three years, and remained faithful to the name and memory of Niger. The citizens and soldiers, we know not from what cause, were animated with equal fury. Several of the principal officers of Niger, who despaired of, or who disdained, a pardon, had thrown themselves into this last refuge. The fortifications were esteemed impregnable, and in the defence of the place, a celebrated engineer displayed all the mechanic powers known to the ancients. Byzantium at length surrendered to famine. The magistrates and soldiers were put to the sword, the walls demolished, the privileges suppressed, and the destined capital of the East subsisted only as an open village, subject to the insulting jurisdiction of Perinthus. The historian Dion, who had admired the flourishing and lamented the desolate state of Byzantium, accused the revenge of Severus for depriving the Roman people of the strongest bulwark against the barbarians of Pontus and Asia. The truth of this observation was but too well justified in the succeeding age, when the Gothic fleets covered the Euxine, and passed through the undefined Bosphorus to the centre of the Mediterranean.
both Niger and Albinus were discovered and put to death in their flight from the field of battle. Their fate excited neither surprise nor compassion. They had staked their lives against the chance of empire, and suffered what they would have inflicted. Nor did Severus claim the arrogant superiority of suffering his rivals to live in a private station. But his unforgiving temper, stimulated by avarice, indulged a spirit of revenge, where there was no room for apprehension. The most considerable of the provincials, who, without any dislike to the fortunate candidate, had obeyed the governor under whose authority they were accidentally placed, were punished by death, exile, and especially by the confiscation of their estates. Many cities of the east were stripped of their ancient honours, and obliged to pay into the treasury of Severus four times the amount of the sums contributed by them for the service of Niger. Till the final decision of the war the cruelty of Severus was in some measure restrained by the uncertainty of the event, and his pretended reverence for the senate. The head of Albinus, accompanied with a menacing letter, announced to the Romans that he was resolved to spare none of the adherents of his unfortunate competitors. He was irritated by the just suspicion that he had never possessed the affections of the Senate, and he concealed his old malevolence under the recent discovery of some treasonable correspondences. Thirty-five senators, however, accused of having favoured the party of Albinus, he freely pardoned, and by his subsequent behaviour endeavoured to convince him that he had forgotten, as well as forgiven, their supposed offences. But at the same time he condemned forty-one other senators, whose names history has recorded, their wives, children, and clients, attended them in death. And the noblest provincials of Spain and Gaul were involved in the same ruin. Such rigid justice, for so he termed it, was, in the opinion of Severus, the only conduct capable of ensuring peace to the people, or stability to the prince, and he condescended slightly to lament that to be mild it was necessary that he should first be cruel. The true interest of an absolute monarch generally coincides with that of his people. Their numbers, their wealth, their order, and their security are the best and only foundations of his real greatness. And were he totally devoid of virtue, prudence might supply its place, and would dictate the same rule of conduct. Severus considered the Roman Empire as his property, and had no sooner secured the possession than he bestowed his care on the cultivation and improvement of so valuable an acquisition. Salutary laws executed with inflexible firmness soon corrected most of the abuses with which, since the death of Marcus, every part of the government had been infected. In the administration of justice, the judgments of the emperor were characterized by attention, discernment, and impartiality. And whenever he deviated from the strict line of equity, it was generally in favor of the poor and oppressed. Not so much indeed from any sense of humanity, as from the natural propensity of a despot to humble the pride of greatness, and to sink all his subjects to the same common level of absolute dependence. His expensive taste for building magnificent shows, and above all a constant and liberal distribution of corn and provisions, were the surest means of captivating the affection of the Roman people. The misfortunes of civil discord were obliterated. The clam of peace and prosperity was once more experienced in the provinces, and many cities, restored by the munificence of Severus, assumed the title of his colonies, and attested by public monuments their gratitude and felicity. The fame of the Roman arms was revived by that warlike and successful emperor, and he boasted with a just pride that having received the empire oppressed with foreign and domestic wars, he left it established in profound, universal, and honourable peace. Although the wounds of civil war appeared completely healed, its mortal poison still lurked in the vitals of the constitution. Severus possessed a considerable share of vigour and ability, 
but the daring soul of the first Caesar, or the deep policy of Augustus, was scarcely equal to the task of curbing the insolence of the victorious legions. By gratitude, by misguided policy, by seeming necessity, Severus was reduced to relax the nerves of discipline. The vanity of his soldiers was flattered with the honour of wearing gold rings. Their ease was indulged in the permission of living with their wives, in the idleness of quarters. He increased their pay beyond the example of former times, and taught them to expect, and soon to claim, extraordinary donatives on every public occasion of danger or festivity. Elated by success, enervated by luxury, and raised above the level of subjects by their dangerous privileges, they soon became incapable of military fatigue, oppressive to the country, and impatient of a just subordination. Their officers asserted the superiority of rank by a more profuse and elegant luxury. There is still extant a letter of Severus lamenting the licentious stage of the army, and exhorting one of his generals to begin the necessary reformations from the tribunes themselves, since, as he justly observes, the officer who has forfeited the esteem will never command the obedience of his soldiers. Had the emperor pursued the train of reflection, he would have discovered that the primary cause of this general corruption might be ascribed not indeed to the example, but to the pernicious indulgence, however, of the commander-in-chief. The Praetorians, who murdered their emperor and sold the empire, had received the just punishment of their treason, but the necessary, though dangerous, institution of guards was soon restored on a new model by Severus, and increased to four times the ancient number. Formerly these troops had been recruited in Italy, and as the adjacent provinces gradually imbibed the softer manners of Rome, the levies were extended to Macedonia, Noricum, and Spain. In the room of these elegant troops, better adapted to the pomp of courts than to the uses of war, it was established by Severus that from all the legions of the frontiers, the soldiers most distinguished for strength, valour, and fidelity, should be occasionally drafted and promoted as an honour and reward into the more eligible service of the guards. By this new institution, the Italian youth were diverted from the exercise of arms, and the capital was terrified by the strange aspect and manners of a multitude of barbarians. But Severus flattered himself that the legions would consider these chosen praetorians as the representatives of the whole military order, and that the present aid of fifty thousand men, superior in arms and appointments to any force that could be brought into the field against them, would forever crush the hopes of rebellion, and secure the empire to himself and his posterity. The command of these favoured and formidable troops soon became the first office of the empire. As the government degenerated into military despotism, the Praetorian prefect, who in his origin had been a simple captain of the guards, was placed not only at the head of the army, but of the finances, and even of the law. In every department of administration he represented the person, and exercised the authority of the emperor. The first prefect, who enjoyed and abused this immense power, was Plotianus, the favourite minister of Severus. His reign lasted above ten years, till the marriage of his daughter, with the eldest son of the emperor, which seemed to assure his fortune, proved the occasion of his ruin. The animosities of the palace, by irritating the ambition, and alarming the fears of Plotianus, threatened to produce a revolution, and obliged the emperor, who still loved him, to consent with reluctance to his death. After the fall of Plotianus, an eminent lawyer, the celebrated Papinian, was appointed to execute the motley office of Praetorian prefect. Till the reign of Severus, the virtue, and even the good sense of the emperors, had been distinguished by the zeal or affected reverence for the senate, and by a tender regard to the nice frame of civil policy instituted by Augustus. But the youth of Severus had been trained in the implicit obedience of camps, 
and his riper years spent in the despotism of military command. His haughty and inflexible spirit could not discover, or would not acknowledge, the advantage of preserving an intermediate power, however imaginary, between the emperor and the army. He disdained to profess himself the servant of an assembly that detested his person, and trembled at his frown. He issued his commands, where his requests would have proved as effectual, assumed the conduct and style of a sovereign and a conqueror, and exercised without disguise the whole legislative as well as the executive power. The victory over the Senate was easy and inglorious. Every eye and every passion were directed to the supreme magistrate, who possessed the arms and treasure of the state, whilst the Senate, neither elected by the people, nor guided by military force, nor animated by public spirit, rested its declining authority on the frail and crumbling basis of ancient opinion. The fine theory of a republic insensibly vanished, and made way for the more natural and substantial feelings of monarchy. As the freedom and honours of Rome were successively communicated to the provinces, in which the old government had been either unknown or was remembered with abhorrence, the tradition of republican maxims was gradually obliterated. The Greek historians of the age of the Antonines observe, with a malicious pleasure, that although the sovereign of Rome, in compliance with an obsolete prejudice, abstained from the name of king, he possessed the full measure of regal power. In the reign of Severus, the Senate was filled with polished and eloquent slaves from the eastern provinces, who justified personal flattery by speculative principles of servitude. These new advocates of prerogative were heard with pleasure by the court, and with patience by the people, when they inculcated the duty of passive obedience, and descanted on the inevitable mischiefs of freedom. The lawyers and historians concurred in teaching that the imperial authority was held not by the delegated commission, but by the irrevocable resignation of the senate, that the emperor was freed from the restraint of civil laws, could command by his arbitrary will the lives and fortunes of his subjects, and might dispose of the empire as of his private patrimony. The most eminent of the civil lawyers, and particularly Papinian, Paulus, and Upian, flourished under the house of Severus, and the Roman jurisprudence, having closely united itself with the system of monarchy, was supposed to have attained its full majority and perfection. The contemporaries of Severus, in the enjoyment of the peace and glory of his reign, forgave the cruelties by which it had been introduced. Posterity, who experienced the fatal effects of his maxims and example, justly considered him as the principal author of the decline of the Roman Empire. End of chapter 5, part 2「Chapter six, part one of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death of Severus, Tyranny of Caracalla, Usurpation of Macrinus, Follies of Elagalibus, Virtues of Alexander Severus, Licentiousness of the Army. General State of the Roman Finances, Tax and Tribute. The ascent to greatness, however steep and dangerous, may entertain an active spirit with the consciousness and exercise of its own powers, but the possession of a throne can never afford a lasting satisfaction to an ambitious mind. This melancholy truth was felt and acknowledged by Severus. Fortune and merit had, from an humble station, elevated him to the first place among mankind. He had been all things, as he said himself, and all was of little value. Distracted with the care, not of acquiring, but of preserving an empire, oppressed with age and infirmities, careless of fame, insatiated with power, all his prospects of life were closed. The desire of perpetuating the greatness of his family was the only remaining wish of his ambition and paternal tenderness. 
Like most Africans, Severus was passionately addicted to the vain studies of magic and divination, deeply versed in the interpretations of dreams and omens, and perfectly acquainted with the science of judicial astrology, which, in almost every age, except the present, has maintained its dominion over the mind of man. He had lost his first wife while he was governor of the Leonese Gaul. In the choice of a second, he sought only to connect himself with some favorite of fortune, and, as soon as he had discovered that a young lady of Emesa in Syria had a royal nativity, he solicited and obtained her hand. Julia Domna, for that was her name, deserved all that the stars could promise her. She possessed, even in an advanced age, the attractions of beauty, and united to a lively imagination, a firmness of mind, a strength of judgment, seldom bestowed on her sex. Her amiable qualities never made any deep impression on the dark and jealous temper of her husband. But, in her son's reign, she administered the principal affairs of the empire with a prudence that supported his authority, and with a moderation that sometimes corrected his wild extravagances. Julia applied herself to letters and philosophy, with some success, and with the most splendid reputation. She was the patroness of every art, and the friend of every man of genius. The grateful flattery of the learned had celebrated her virtues, but, if we may credit the scandal of ancient history, chastity was very far from being the most conspicuous virtue of the empress Julia. Two sons, Caracula and Geta, was the fruit of her marriage, and the destined heirs of the empire. The fond hopes of the father, and of the Roman world, were soon disappointed by these vain youths, who displayed the indolent security of hereditary princes, and a presumption that fortune would supply the place of merit and application. Without any emulation of virtue or talents, they discovered, almost from their infancy, a fixed and implacable antipathy for each other. Their aversion, confirmed by years, and fermented by the arts of their interested favorites, broke out in childish and gradually in more serious competitions, and at length divided the theater, the circus, and the court into two factions, actuated by the hopes and fears of their respected leaders. The prudent emperor endeavored, by every expedient of advice and authority, to allay this growing animosity. The unhappy discord of his sons clouded all his prospects, and threatened to overturn a throne raised by so much labor, cemented with so much blood, and guarded with every defense of arms and treasure. With an impartial hand he maintained between them an exact balance of favor, conferred on both the rank of Augustus, and the revered name of Antoninus. And for the first time the Roman world beheld three emperors. Yet even this equal conduct served only to inflame the contest, whilst the fierce Caracula asserted the right of primogenitor, the milder Geta courted the affections of the people and the soldiers. In the anguish of a disappointed father, Severus foretold that the weaker of his sons would fall sac a sacrifice to the stronger, who in his turn would be ruined by his own vices. In these circumstances, the intelligence of a war in Britain, and of an invasion of the provinces by the barbarians of the north, was received with pleasure by Severus. Though the vigilance of his lieutenants might have been sufficient to repel the distant enemy, he resolved to embrace the honorable pretext of withdrawing his sons from the luxury of Rome, which enervated their minds and irritated their passions, and of ignoring their youth to the toils of war and government. Notwithstanding his advanced age, for he was about threescore, and his gout, which obliged him to be carried in a litter, he transported himself in person into that remote island, attended by his two sons, his whole court, and a formidable army. He immediately passed the walls of Hadrian and Antonidas, and entered the enemy's country, with the design of completing the long-attempted conquest of Britain. He penetrated to the northern extremity of the island without meeting an enemy, but the concealed ambuscades of the Caledonians, who hung unseen on the rear and flanks of his army, the coldness of the climate, and the severity of a winter march across the hills and morasses of Scotland, are reported to have cost the Romans above fifty thousand men. The Caledonians at length yielded to the powerful and obstinate attack, sued for peace, surrendered a part of their arms, and a large tract of territory. But their apparent submission lasted no longer than the present terror. As soon as the Roman legions had retired, they resumed their hostile independence. The restless spirit provoked Severus to send a new army into Caledonia, with the most bloody orders, not to subdue, but to extirpate the natives. They were saved by the death of their haughty enemy. 
This Caledonian war, neither marked by decisive events, nor attended with any important consequences, would ill deserve our attention, but it is supposed, not without a considerable degree of probability, that the invasion of Severus is connected with the most shining period of the British history, or fable. Fingal, whose fame, with that of his heroes and bards, has been revived in our language by a recent publication, is said to have commanded the Caledonians in that memorable junction, to have eluded the power of Severus, and to have obtained a signal victory on the banks of the Karan, in which the son of the king of the world, Caracol, fled from his arms across the fields of his pride. Something of a doubtful myth still hangs over these highland traditions, nor can it be entirely dispelled by the most ingenious researches of modern criticism. But if we could, with safety, indulge the pleasing supposition that Fingal lived and that Ossian sung, the striking contrast of the situation and manners of the contending nations might amuse a philosophic mind. The parallel would be of little advantage to the more civilized people if we compare the unrelenting revenge of Severus with the generous clemency of Fingal, the timid and brutal cruelty of Caracalla, with the bravery, the tenderness, the elegant genius of Ossian, the mercenary chiefs who, for motives of fear or interest, served under the imperial standard, with the free-born warriors who started to arms at the voice of the king of the Morvan. If, in a word, we contemplated the untutored Caledonians, glowing with the warm virtues of nature, and the degenerate Romans, polluted 